Section 66 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. On the Transit of Great Britain and the Metropolis, Part 2. The Railways. The next branch of the transit by land appertains to the conveyance of persons and goods per rail. The railways of the United Kingdom open, in course of construction, or authorised to be constructed, extend over upwards of 12,000 miles, or four times the distance across the Atlantic. The following is the latest return on the subject in a report printed by order of the House of Commons, the 22nd of March last. Total length of railway open on June 30th, 1849, and persons employed thereon. 5,447 miles, 10 and 3 quarter chains. Persons employed, 55,968. Total length of railway in course of construction on June 30th, 1849, and persons employed thereon. 1,504 miles, 20 and a half chains. Total length of railway neither open nor in course of construction on June 30th, 1849, 5,132 miles, 38 and three quarter chains. Persons employed for the latter two categories, 103,846. Total length of railway authorised to be used for the conveyance of passengers on June 30th, 1849, and the total number of persons employed thereon, 12,083 miles and 70 chains. Total number of persons employed, 159,784. There are now upwards of 6,000 miles of railroad open for traffic in the three kingdoms, 549 miles having been opened in the course of the half-year following the date of the above return. At that date, 111 miles of railroad were open for traffic, irrespective of their several branches. 266 railways, including branches, were authorised to be constructed, but had not been commenced. The growth of railways was slow and not gradual. They were unknown as modes of public conveyance before the present century, but roads, on a similar principle, irrespective of steam, were in use in the Northumberland and Durham collieries, somewhere about the year 1700. The rails were not made of iron, but of wood, and with a facility previously unknown, a small cart, or a series of small carts, was dragged along them by a pony or a horse, to any given point where the coal had to be deposited, in the lead mines of the North Riding of Yorkshire, the same system was adopted, the more rapidly and with the less fatigue, to convey the ore to the mouth of the mine. Some of these tramways, as they are called, were and are a mile and more in length, and visitors who penetrate into the very bowels of the mine are conveyed along those tramways in carts drawn generally by a pony, and driven by a boy, who has to duck his head every here and there to avoid collision, into the galleries and open spaces where the miners are at work. In the year 1801, the first Act of Parliament authorising the construction of a railway was passed. This was the Surrey, between Wandsworth and Croydon, nine miles in length, and constructed at a cost in round numbers of £60,000. In the following 20 years, 16 such acts were passed, authorising the construction of 124 and three quarter miles of railway, the cost of which was £971,232, or upwards of £7,500 a mile. In 1822, no such act was passed. In 1823, Parliament authorised the construction of the Stockton and Darlington, and on that short railway originated and completed in a great measure through the exertions of the wealthy Quakers of the neighbourhood, 
and opened on the 27th of December 1825, steam power was first used as a means of propulsion and locomotion on a railway. It was some little time before this that grave senators and learned journalists laughed to scorn Mr. Stevenson's assertion that steam could be made to do 20 miles an hour on a railway. In the following 10 years, 30 railway bills were passed by the legislature, and among these, in 1826, was the Liverpool and Manchester, which was opened on the 16th of September, 1830, an opening rendered as lamentable as it is memorable by the death of Mr. Huskisson. In 1834, seven railway bills were passed, 10 in 1835, 26 in 1836, 11 in 1837, 1 in 1838, 3 in 1839, none again till 1843, and then only one, the Northampton and Peterborough, which extends along 44 and a half miles, and which cost £429,409. The mass of the other railways have been constructed or authorised, and the Acts of Parliament authorising their construction shelved since the close of 1843. I find no official returns of the dates of the several enactments. The following statement, in averages of four years, shows the amount of the sums which Parliament authorised the various companies to raise from 1822 to 1845. Upwards of one half of the amount of the aggregate sum expended in 1822 to 1826 was spent on the Manchester and Liverpool Railway, £1,832,375. The cost of the Stockton and Darlington, £450,000, is also included. From 1822 to 1825 inclusive, four hundred and fifty one thousand four hundred and sixty five pounds from eighteen twenty six to eighteen twenty nine inclusive eight hundred and sixteen thousand eight hundred and forty six pounds from eighteen thirty to eighteen thirty three inclusive two million one hundred and fifty seven thousand one hundred and thirty six pounds from eighteen thirty four to eighteen thirty seven inclusive ten million eight hundred and eighty thousand four hundred and thirty one pounds from eighteen thirty eight to eighteen forty one inclusive three million six hundred and fourteen thousand four hundred and twenty eight pounds from eighteen forty two to eighteen forty five inclusive twenty million eight hundred and ninety five thousand one hundred and twenty eight pounds of these years 1845 presents the era when the rage for railway speculation was most strongly manifested, as in that year the legislature sanctioned the raising by new railway companies of no less than £59,613,536, more than the imperial taxes levied in the United Kingdom, while in 1844 the amount so sanctioned was fourteen million seven hundred and ninety three thousand nine hundred and ninety four pounds the total sum to be raised for railway purposes for the last twenty years of the above dates was one hundred and fifty three million four hundred and fifty five thousand eight hundred and thirty seven pounds with a yearly average of seven million six hundred and seventy two thousand seven hundred and ninety two pounds for the four years preceding the yearly average was but £112,866. The parliamentary expenses attending the incorporation of 16 of the principal railway companies were £683,498, or an average per railway of £42,718. It will be seen from the following table that the greatest amount thus expended was on the incorporation of the Great Western. On that undertaking, an outlay not much short of £90,000 was incurred, before a foot of sod could be raised by the spade of the Navi. Birmingham and Gloucester, £22,618. 
Bristol and Gloucester, £25,589. Bristol and Exeter, £18,592. Eastern Counties, £39,171. Great Western, £89,197. Great North of England, £20,526. Grand Junction, £22,757. Glasgow, Paisley and Greenock, £23,481. London and Birmingham, £72,868. London and South Western, £41,467. Manchester and Leeds, £49,166. Midland Counties, £28,776. North Midland, £41,349. Northern and Eastern, £74,166. Sheffield, Ashton and Manchester, £31,473. South Eastern, £82,292. It must be borne in mind that these large sums were all for parliamentary expenses alone and were merely the disbursements of the railway proprietors whose applications to Parliament were successful. Probably as large an amount was expended in opposition to the several bills and in the fruitless advocacy of rival companies. Thus above a million and a quarter of pound sterling was spent as a preliminary outlay. Of the railway lines, the construction of the Great Western, 117.5 miles in length, was the most costly, entailing an expenditure of nearly eight millions. The London and Birmingham, 112.5 miles, cost £6,073,114. The South Eastern, 66 miles, £4,306,478. The Manchester and Leeds, 53 miles, £3,372,240. The Eastern Counties, 51 miles, £2,821,790. The Glasgow, Paisley, Kilmarnock and Ayr, 57 and a half miles, £1,071,263, an amount which was exceeded by the outlay on only the three and a half miles of the London and Blackwall first opened, which cost £1,078,851. I ought to mention that the lengths in miles are those of the portions first open to the public in the respective lines and first authorised by parliamentary enactments. Junctions, continuations and the blending of companies have been subsequent measures, entailing of course proportionate outlay. The length of line of the Great Western, for instance, with its immediate branches, opened on the 30th of June, 1849, was 225 miles, that of the southeastern, 144 miles, and that of the eastern counties, 309 miles. It is stated in Mr. Knight's British Almanac for the current year that the London and Northwestern is almost the only company which has maintained, in 1849, the same dividend even as in the preceding year, namely 7%. The Great Western, the Midland, the Lancashire and Yorkshire, the York and Newcastle, the York and North Midland, the Eastern Counties, the South Eastern, the South Western, Brighton, the Manchester and Lincolnshire, all have suffered a decided diminution of dividend. These ten great companies, whose works up to the present time have cost over 100 millions sterling, have on an average declared for the half year ending in the summer of 1849 a dividend on the regular non-guaranteed shares of between 3 and 4 per cent per annum. The remaining companies, about 60 in number, can hardly have reached an average of 2 per cent per annum in the same half year.
End quote. The following table gives the latest returns of railway traffic from 1845. Previous to that date, no such returns were published in parliamentary papers. Comparative statement of the traffic on all the railways in the United Kingdom for the five years ending June 30th, 1845, 1846, 1847, 1848, 1849, together with the length of railway open on December 31st and June 30th in each year. Year ending June 30th, 1845. Length open on June 30th, 2,343 miles. Total number of passengers, 33,791,253. Total receipts from passengers, £3,976,341. Receipts from goods, cattle, parcels, mails and so on, £2,233,373. Total receipts, £6,209,714. Year ending June 30th, 1846. Length open on June 30th, 2,765 miles. Total number of passengers, 43,790,983. Total receipts from passengers, £4,725,215, 11 shillings and 8 pence halfpenny. Receipts from goods, cattle, parcels, mails and so on. £2,840,353, 16 shillings and 6 pence farthing. Total receipts, £7,565,569, 8 shillings and 2 pence, 3 farthings. Year ending June 30th, 1847. Length open on June 30th, 3,603 miles. Total number of passengers, 51,352,163. Total receipts from passengers, 5,148,002 pounds, five shillings and a halfpenny. Receipts from goods, cattle, parcels, mails and so on. Three million three hundred and sixty two thousand eight hundred and eighty three pounds nineteen shillings and sixpence three farthings. Total receipts one million five hundred and ten thousand eight hundred and eighty six pounds four shillings and sevenpence farthing. Year ending june thirtieth, eighteen forty eight. Length open on june thirtieth, four thousand four hundred and seventy eight miles. Total number of passengers. 57,965,070. Total receipts from passengers, 5,720,382 pounds, nine shillings and a penny, three farthings. Receipts from goods, cattle, parcels, mails and so on, 4,213,169 pounds, 14 shillings and five pence halfpenny. Total receipts, Nine million nine hundred and thirty three thousand five hundred and fifty two pounds three shillings and seven pence farthing. Year ending june thirtieth, eighteen forty nine. Length open on june thirtieth, five thousand four hundred and forty seven miles. Total number of passengers sixty million three hundred and ninety eight thousand one hundred and fifty nine. Total receipts from passengers. Six million one hundred and five thousand nine hundred and seventy five pounds seven shillings and seven pence three farthings. Receipts from goods, cattle, parcels, mails and so on five million ninety four thousand and twenty five pounds eighteen shillings and eleven pence. Total receipts eleven million two hundred thousand nine hundred and one pounds six shillings and six pence three farthings. This official table shows a conveyance for the year ending June 1849 of 60,398,159 passengers. It may be as well to mention that every distinct trip is reckoned. Thus, a gentleman travelling from and returning to Greenwich daily figures in the return as 730 passengers. Of the number of individuals who travel in the United Kingdom, I have no information. Thousands of the labouring classes travel very rarely, 
perhaps not more than once, on some holiday trip in the course of a twelvemonth. But assuming every one to travel, and the population to be thirty millions, then we have two railway trips made by every man, woman and child in the kingdom every year. There are no data from which to deduce a precisely accurate calculation of the number of miles travelled by the 60,398,159 passengers who availed themselves of railway facilities in the year cited. Official lists show that 78 railways comprise the extent of mileage given, but these railways vary in extent. The shortest of them open for the conveyance of passengers is the Belfast and County Down, which is only 4 miles 35 chains in length, and the number of passengers travelling on it, 81,441. The Midland and the London and North Western, on the other hand, are respectively 465 and 477 miles in length, and their complement of passengers is respectively 2,252,984 and 2,750,541 and a half. The average length of the 78 railways is 70 miles, but as the stream of travel flows more from intermediate station to station along the course of the line than from one extremity to the other, it may be reasonable to compute that each individual passenger has travelled one-fourth of the entire distance, or seventeen and a half miles, a calculation confirmed by the amount paid by each individual, which is something short of two shillings, or rather more than a penny farthing per mile. Thus we may conclude that each passenger has journeyed seventeen and a half miles, and that the grand aggregate of travel by all the railway passengers of the kingdom will be 1,052,327,632.5 miles, or nearly 11 times the distance between the earth and the sun every year. The government returns present some curious results. The passengers by the second-class carriages have been more numerous every year than those by any other class, and for the year last returned were more than three times the number of those who indulged in the comforts of first-class vehicles. Notwithstanding nearly 1,000 new miles of railway were opened for the public transit and traffic between June 1848 to 1849, still the number of first-class passengers decreased no fewer than 112,000 and odd while those who resorted to the humbler accommodation of the second class increased upwards of 170,000. The numerical majority of the second class passengers over the first was, year ending June 1845, 8,851,662, year ending June 1846, 10,770,712. Year ending June 1847, 12,126,574. Year ending June 1848, 14,499,730. Year ending June 1849, 16,313,760. These figures afford some criterion as to the class or character of the travelling millions who are the supporters of the railways. The official table presents another curious characteristic. The originators of railways, prior to the era of the opening of the Manchester and Liverpool, depended for their dividends far more upon the profits they might receive in the capacity of common carriers upon the conveyance of manufactured goods, minerals or merchandise, than upon the transit of passengers. It was the property in canals and in heavy carriage that would be depreciated, it was believed, rather than that in the stagecoaches. Even on the Manchester and Liverpool, the projectors did not expect to realise more than £20,000 a year by the conveyance of passengers. 
The result shows the fallacy of these computations, as the receipts for passengers for the year ending June 1849 exceeded the receipts from cattle, goods, parcels and mails by £1,011,050. In districts, however, which are at once agricultural and mineral, the amount realised from passengers falls short of that derived from other sources. Two instances will suffice to show this. The Stockton and Darlington is in immediate connection with the district where the famous Shorthorn cattle were first bred by Mr Collins, and where they are still bred in high perfection by eminent agriculturalists. It is in connection, moreover, with the coal and lead mining districts of South Durham and North Yorkshire, the produce being conveyed to Stockton to be shipped. For the last year, the receipts from passengers were £8,000 and odd, while for the conveyance of cattle, coal and so on, no less than £62,000 was paid. From their passengers, the Taff Vale, including the Aberdale Railway Company, derived for the same period, in round numbers, an increase of £6,500, and from their goods conveyance, £45,941. In neither instance did the passengers pay one-seventh as much as the goods. End of section 66 Section 67 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. On the Transit of Great Britain and the Metropolis, Part 3. I now present the reader with two summaries from Returns Made to Parliament. The first relates to the number and description of persons employed on railways in the United Kingdom, and the second to the number and character of railway accidents. Concerning the individuals employed upon the railways, the table on the opposite page contains the latest official information. Reader's note. This table commences at 3 minutes 55. End reader's note. Of the railways in full operation, the London and North Western employs the greatest number of persons in its long and branching extent of 477 miles 35 and a quarter chains, with 153 stations. The total number employed is 6,194, and they are thus classified. Secretaries or managers, 8. Engineers, 5. Superintendents, 40. Storekeepers, 8. Accountants or cashiers, 4. Inspectors or timekeepers, 83. Draftsmen, 11. Clerks, 775. Foremen, 130. Engine drivers, 334. Assistant drivers or firemen, 318. Guards or brakesmen, 207. Artificers, 1,891. Switchmen, 363. Gatekeepers, 76. Policemen or watchmen, 241. Porters or messengers, 1,456. Plate layers, 14. Labourers, 30. On the Midland, there were employed 4,898 persons. On the Lancashire and Yorkshire, 3,971. Great Western, 2,997. Eastern Counties, 2,939. Caledonian, 2,409 York, Newcastle and Berwick 2,731 London and South Western 2,118 London, Brighton and South Coast 2,053 York and North Midland 1,614 North British 1,535 and South Eastern 1,527 Thus, the twelve leading companies retain permanently in their service 35,735 men, 
supplying the means of maintenance, reckoning that a family of three is supported by each man employed, to 122,940 individuals. Pursuing the same calculation, as 159,784 men were employed on all the railways, open and unopen, we may conclude that 739,136 individuals were dependent, more or less, upon railway traffic for their subsistence. Total number and description of persons employed on railways. Reader's Note there follows a table with the headings Total number of persons employed upon railways open for traffic on the 30th of June 1849 Total number of persons employed upon railways not open for traffic on the 30th of June 1849 and Total number and description of persons employed on all railways open and unopen authorised to be used for the conveyance of passengers End reader's note. Secretaries and managers. Upon railways open for traffic, 156. Upon railways not open for traffic, 142. Total, 298. Treasurers. Upon railways open for traffic, 32. Upon railways not open for traffic, 7. Total, 39. Engineers. Upon railways open for traffic, 107. Upon railways not open for traffic, 269. Total, 376. Superintendents. Upon railways open for traffic, 314. Upon railways not open for traffic, 419. Total, 733. Storekeepers. Upon railways open for traffic, 120. Upon railways not open for traffic, 182. Total, 302. Accountants and cashiers. Upon railways open for traffic, 138. Upon railways not open for traffic, 144. Total, 282. Inspectors and timekeepers. Upon railways open for traffic, 490. Upon railways not open for traffic, 821. Total, 1,311. Station Masters. Upon railways open for traffic, 1,300. Upon railways not open for traffic, none. Total, 1,300. Draftsmen. Upon railways open for traffic, 103. Upon railways not open for traffic, 153. Total, 256. Clerks, upon railways open for traffic, 4,021. Upon railways not open for traffic, 421. Total, 4,442. Foreman, upon railways open for traffic, 709. Upon railways not open for traffic, 1,421. Total, 2,130. Engine drivers, upon railways open for traffic, 1,839. Upon railways not open for traffic, none. Total, 1,839. Assistant engine drivers and firemen, upon railways open for traffic, 1,871. Upon railways not open for traffic, none. Total, 1,871. Guardsmen and brakesmen. Upon railways open for traffic, 1,631. Upon railways not open for traffic, none. Total, 1,631. Switchmen. Upon railways open for traffic, 1,540. Upon railways not open for traffic, none. Total, 1,540. Gatekeepers. Upon railways open for traffic, 1,361. Upon railways not open for traffic, none. Total, 1,361. Policemen or watchmen. Upon railways open for traffic, 1,508. Upon railways not open for traffic, 481. Total, 1,989. 
Porters and messengers upon railways open for traffic, 8,238. Upon railways not open for traffic, 118. Total, 8,356. Plate layers upon railways open for traffic, 5,508. Upon railways not open for traffic, none. Total, 5,508. Artificers upon railways open for traffic, 10,809. Upon railways not open for traffic, 16,144. Total, 26,953. Labourers, upon railways open for traffic, 14,829. Upon railways not open for traffic, 83,052. Total, 97,081. Miscellaneous employment, upon railways open for traffic, 144. Upon railways not open for traffic, 42. Total, 186. Total number of persons employed upon railways open for traffic on the 30th of June 1849, 55,968. Total number of persons employed upon railways not open for traffic on the 30th of June 1849, 103,816. Grand total, 159,784. The other summary to which I have alluded is one derived from a return which the House of Commons ordered to be printed on the 8th of April last. It is relative to the railway accidents that occurred in the United Kingdom during the half-year ending the 31st of December 1849 and supplies the following analysis. Quote, 54 passengers injured from causes beyond their own control. 11 passengers killed and 10 injured owing to their own misconduct or want of caution. Two servants of companies or of contractors killed and three injured from causes beyond their own control. 62 servants of companies or of contractors killed and 37 injured owing to their own misconduct or want of caution. 28 trespassers and other persons, neither passengers nor servants of the company, killed and seven injured by improperly crossing or standing on the railway. One child killed and one injured by an engine running off the rails and entering a house. Two suicide. Total 106 killed and 112 injured. The total number of passengers conveyed during the half year amounted to 34,924,469. End quote. The greatest number of accidents was on the Lancashire and Yorkshire. 2,793,764 passengers were conveyed in the term specified, and 17 individuals were killed and 24 injured. On the York, Newcastle and Berwick, 15 were killed and injured, 1,613,123 passengers having been conveyed. On the Midland, 2,658,903 having been the number of passengers, 9 persons were killed and 7 injured. On the Great Western, conveying 1,220,507.5 passengers. Two individuals were killed and one injured. On the London and Blackwall, with 1,200,514 passengers, there was one man killed and 16 injured. The London and Greenwich supplied the means of locomotion to 1,126,237 persons, and none were killed, and none were injured. These deaths on the railway, for the half-year cited above, are in the proportion of 106 to 34,924,469, or one person killed to every 329,476, and the 106 killed 
include two suicides and the deaths of 28 trespassers and others. The total number of persons who suffered from accidents was 218, which is in the proportion of one accident to every 160,203 persons travelling. And when the injuries arising from this mode of conveyance are contrasted with the loss of life by shipwreck, which, as before stated, amounts to one in every 203 individuals, the comparative safety of railway over marine travelling must appear most extraordinary. Mr. Porter's calculation as to the number of stagecoach travellers, which I cite under that head, shows that my estimates are far from extravagant. Inland Navigation The next part of my subject is the water carriage, carried on by means of canals and rivers. The means of inland navigation in England and Wales are computed to comprise more than 4,000 miles, of which 2,200 miles are in navigable canals and 1,800 in navigable rivers. In Ireland, such modes of communication extend about 500 miles, and in Scotland, about 350. As railways have been the growth of the present half-century, so did canals owe their increase, if not their establishment, in England to the half-century preceding, from 1750 to 1800, three-fourths of those now in existence having been established during that period. Previously to the works perfected by the Duke of Bridgewater and his famous and self-taught engineer James Brindley, the efforts made to improve our means of water transit were mainly confined to attempts to improve the navigation of rivers. These attempts were not attended with any great success. The current of the river was often too impetuous to be restrained in the artificial channels prepared for the desired improvements, and the forms and depths of the channels were gradually changed by the current, so that labour and expense were very heavily and continuously entailed. Quote, Difficulties in the way of river navigation, says Mr. McCulloch, seem to have suggested the expediency of abandoning the channels of most rivers and of digging parallel to them artificial channels in which the water may be kept at the proper level by means of locks. The Act passed by the Legislature in 1755 for improving the navigation of Sankey Brook on the Mersey gave rise to a lateral canal of this description about eleven and a quarter miles in length, which deserves to be mentioned as the earliest effort of the sort in England. But before this canal had been completed, the Duke of Bridgewater and James Brindley had conceived a plan of canalisation independent altogether of natural channels, and intended to afford the greatest facilities to commerce by carrying canals across rivers and through mountains, wherever it was practicable to construct them. End quote. The difficulties which Brindley overcame were considered insurmountable until he did overcome them. In the construction of a canal from Worsley to Manchester, it was necessary to cross the river Irwell, where it is navigable, at Barton. Brindley proposed to accomplish this by carrying an aqueduct 39 feet above the surface of the Irwell. This was considered so extravagant a proposition that there was a pause, and a gentleman eminent for engineering knowledge was consulted. He treated Brindley's scheme as the scheme of a visionary, declaring that he had often heard of castles in the air, but never before heard where one was to be erected. The Duke, however, had confidence in his engineer, and a successful, serviceable and profitable aqueduct, instead of a castle in the air, was a speedy and successful result. The success of Brindley's plans and the spirited munificence of the Duke of Bridgewater, who, that he might have ample means to complete his projects, 
at one time confined his mere personal expenses to four hundred pounds a year laid the foundations of the large fortunes enjoyed by the duke of sutherland and his brother the late earl of ellesmere the canals which have been commenced and completed in the united kingdom since the year eighteen hundred are thirty in number and extend five hundred and eighty two and three quarter miles in length mr mcculloch gives a list of british canals with the number of shareholders in the proprietary of each the amount and cost of shares and the price on the twenty seventh of june eighteen forty three the Erewash, with 231 shares, each £100, returned a dividend of £40, each share being then worth £675. The Loughborough, with only 70 £100 shares, the average cost of each share having been £142.17, had a dividend of £80 and a selling price per share of one thousand four hundred pounds the stroudwater with two hundred shares of one hundred and fifty pounds returned a dividend of twenty four pounds with a price in the market of four hundred and ninety pounds on the other hand the fifty pound shares of the crinan were then selling at two pounds the fifty pound shares of the north walsham and dillon were of the same almost nominal value in the market and the shares of the thames and medway with an average cost of thirty pounds four shillings and threepence were worth but one pound of the cost expended in construction of the canals of england i have no means of giving a precise account but the following calculation seems sufficiently accurate for my present purpose i find that if in round numbers the 250,000 shares of the 40 principal canals averaged an expenditure of £100 per share. The result would be £25 million. And perhaps we may estimate the canals of the United Kingdom to have cost £35 million, or one-tenth as much as the railways. The foregoing inquiries present the following gigantic results. There are employed in the yearly transit of Great Britain, abroad and along her own shores, 33,672 sailing vessels and 1,110 steam vessels, employing 236,000 seamen. Calculating the value of each ship and cargo, as the value has been estimated before Parliament, at £5,000. We have an aggregate value, sailing vessels, steamers, and their cargoes included, of £173,910,000. Further, supposing the yearly wages of the seamen, including officers, to be £20 per head, the amount paid in wages would be £4,720,000. The railways now in operation in the United Kingdom extend 6,000 miles, the cost of their construction, paid and to be paid, having been estimated at upwards of £350 million. Last year they supplied the means of rapid travel to above 63 million of passengers, who traversed above a billion of miles. Their receipts for the year approached £11,250,000 of money, and nearly three quarters of a million of persons are dependent upon them for subsistence. The Turnpike and other roads of Great Britain alone, independently of Ireland, present a surface of 120,000 miles in length for the various purposes of interchange, commerce, and recreation. They are maintained by the yearly expenditure of a million and a half. For similar purposes, the navigable canals and rivers of Great Britain and Ireland furnish an extent of 4,850 miles, formed at a cost of probably £35 million. Adding all these together, 
we have of turnpike roads, railways, and canals no less than 130,000 and odd miles, formed at an aggregate cost of upwards of £386 million. If we add to this the £54,250,000 capital expended in the mercantile marine, we have the gross total of more than 440 million of money sunk in the transit of the country. If the number of miles traversed by the natives of this country in the course of the year by sea, road, rail, river and canal were summed up, it would reach to a distance greater than to the remotest planet yet discovered. End of section 67 Section 68 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. London Watermen, Lightermen and Steamboatmen, Part 1. Of all the great capitals, London has least the appearance of antiquity, and the Thames has a peculiarly modern aspect. It is no longer the silent highway, for its silence is continually broken by the clatter of steamboats. This change has materially affected the position and diminished the number of the London watermen into whose condition and earnings I am now about to examine. The character of the transit on the river has, moreover, undergone a great change apart from the alteration produced by the use of steam power. Until the more general use of coaches in the reign of Charles II, the Thames supplied the only mode of conveyance, except horseback, by which men could avoid the fatigue of walking, and that it was made largely available, all our older London chroniclers show. From the termination of the Wars of the Roses until the end of the 17th century, for about 200 years, all the magnates of the metropolis, the king, the members of the royal family, the great officers of state, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the noblemen whose mansions had sprung up amidst trees and gardens on the north bank of the Thames, the Lord Mayor, the city authorities, the city companies, and the inns of court, all kept their own or their state barges, rowed by their own servants, attired in their respective liveries. In addition to the river conveyances of these functionaries, private boats or barges were maintained by all whose wealth permitted or whose convenience required their use, in the same way as carriages and horses are kept by them in our day. The Thames, too, was then the principal arena for the display of pageants. These pageants, however, are now reduced to one, the Lord Mayor's Show. The remaining state barges are but a few, namely the Queen's, the Lord Mayor's, and such as are maintained by the city companies, and even some of these are rotting to decay. Mr. Charles Knight says in his London, quote, In the time of Elizabeth and the first James, and onward to very recent days, the north bank of the Thames was studied with the palaces of the nobles, and each palace had its landing place, and its private retinue of barges and wherries, and many a freight of the brave and beautiful has been borne amidst song and merriment from house to house to join the mask and the dance, and many a wily statesman, muffled in his cloak, has glided along unseen in his boat to some dark conference with his ambitious neighbour. Upon the river itself, busy as it was, fleets of swans were ever sailing, and they ventured unmolested into that channel which is now narrowed by vessels from every region. Paulus Jovius, who died in 1552, describing the Thames, says, This river abounds in swans swimming in flocks, the sight of whom, and their noise, are vastly agreeable to the fleets that meet them in their course. The only relics of the palatial landing places above alluded to, which is now to be seen, is the fine arch or water gate, 
the work of Inigo Jones, at the foot of Buckingham Street. This was an adornment of the landing place from York House, once the town abode of the archbishops of that see, but afterwards the property of George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham. In front of this gate, or nearly so, the Hungerford steamboat piers are now stationed, and in place of stately barges, directed by half a dozen robust oarsmen in gorgeous liveries, approaching the palace or lying silently in wait there, we have Hapney, Penny, Tupney, and other steamboats, hissing, spluttering, panting, and smoking. End quote. Moreover, in addition to the state and private barges of the olden times, there were multitudes of boats and watermen always on hire. Stowe, who was born in 1525 and died at 80 years of age, says that in his time 40,000 watermen were employed on the Thames. This, however, is a manifest exaggeration when we consider the population of London at that time. Still, it is an overestimate common to old chroniclers by whom precise statistical knowledge was unattainable. That Stowe represents the number of these men at 40,000 shows plainly that they were very numerous, and one proof of their great number down to the middle of the last century is that until 100 years ago, the cities of London and Westminster had but one bridge, the old London Bridge, which was commenced in 1176, completed in 31 years, and after standing 625 years, was pulled down in 1832. The want of bridges to keep pace with the increase of the population caused the establishment of numerous ferries. It has been computed that in 1760, the ferries across the Thames, taking in its course from Richmond to Greenwich, were 25 times as numerous as they are at present. Westminster Bridge was not finished until 1750. Blackfriars was built in 1769, Battersea in 1771, Vauxhall in 1816, Waterloo in 1817, Southwark in 1819, the present London Bridge in 1831, and Hungerford in 1844. The Thames Waterman The character of the Thames Waterman in the last century was what might have been expected from slightly informed or uninformed and not unprosperous men. They were hospitable and hearty one to another and to their neighbours on shore, civil to such fares as were civil to them, especially if they hoped for an extra sixpence, but often saucy, abusive and even sarcastic. Their interchange of abuse with one another as they rode on the Thames down to the commencement of the present century, if not later, was remarkable for its slang. In this sort of contest, their fares not unfrequently joined, and even Dr. Johnson, when on the river, exercised his powers of objurgation to overwhelm some astonished Londoner in a passing boat. During the greater part of the last century, the Thames watermen were employed in a service now unknown to them. They were the carriers, when the tide and the weather availed, of the garden stuff and the fruit grown in the neighbourhood of the river from Woolwich and Hampton to the London markets. The green and firmly packed pyramids of cabbages that now load the wagons were then piled in boats, and it was the same with fruit. One of the most picturesque sights Sir Richard Steele ever enjoyed was when he encountered, at the early dawn of a summer's day, quote, a fleet of Richmond gardeners, end quote, of which, quote, ten sail of apricot boats, end quote, formed a prominent and fragrant part. Turnpike roads and railways have superseded this means of conveyance, which could only be made available when the tide served. The observances on the Thames customary in the olden time still continue, though on a very reduced scale. The Queen has her watermen, but they have only been employed as the rowers of her barge twice since her accession to the throne. 
once when Her Majesty and Prince Albert visited the Thames Tunnel, and again when Prince Albert took water at Whitehall and was rowed to the city to open the coal exchange. Besides the Queen's watermen, there are still extant the Duke's and Lord's watermen, the Lord Mayor's and the city companies, as well as those belonging to the Admiralty. The above constitute what are called the privileged watermen, having certain rights and emoluments appertaining to them which do not fall to the lot of the class generally. The Queen's watermen are now only 18 in number. They have no payment except when actually employed, and then they have 10 shillings for such employment. They have, however, a suit of clothes, a red jacket with the royal arms on the buttons, and dark trousers, presented to them once every two years. They have also the privileges of the servants of the household, such as exemption from taxes and so on. Most of them are proprietors of lighters and are prosperous men. The privileges of the retainers of the nobles in the Stuart days linger still among the lords and dukes watermen, but only as a mere shadow of a fading substance. There are five or six men now who wear a kind of livery. I heard of no particular fashion in this livery being observed, either now or within the memory of the watermen. Their only privilege is that they are free from impressment. In the wartime, these men were more than 25 times as numerous as they are at present. In fact, they are dying out. And the last dukes and the last lords, privileged watermen, are now, as I was told, on their last legs. The Lord Mayor's watermen are still undiminished in number, the complement being 36. Of these, eight are water bailiffs, who, in any procession, row in a boat before the Lord Mayor's state barge. The other 28 are the rowers of the Chief Magistrate's barge on his aquatic excursions. They are all free from impressment and are supplied with a red jacket and dark trousers every two years, the city arms being on the buttons. One of these men told me that he had been a Lord Mayor's man for some years, and made about eight journeys a year, swan hopping and such like, the show being, as he said, a regular thing, ten shillings a voyage was paid each man. It was jolly work, my informant stated, sometimes was swan hopping, though it depended on the Lord Mayor for the time being, whether it was jolly or not. He had heard say that in the old times, the Lord Mayor's bargemen had spiced wine regularly when out, but now they had no wine of any sort, but sometimes, when a Lord Mayor pleased, and he did not always please. My informant was a lighterman as well as a Lord Mayor's waterman, and was doing well. Among other privileged classes are the hog grubbers, as they are called by the other watermen, but their number is now only four. These hog grubbers ply only at the pelican stairs. They have been old sailors in the navy and are licensed by the Trinity House. No apprenticeship or freedom of the waterman's company in that case being necessary. There was from forty to fifty of them, sir, said a waterman to me, when I was a lad, and I am not fifty-three. And fine old fellows they were, but they're all going to nothing now. The Admiralty watermen are another privileged class. They have a suit of clothes once every two years, a dark blue jacket and trousers, with an anchor on the buttons. They also wear badges and are exempt from impressment. Their business is to row the officials of the Admiralty when they visit Deptford on Trinity Monday and on all occasions of business or recreation. They are now about 18 in number. They receive no salary, but are paid per voyage at the same rate as the Lord Mayor's watermen. There was also a class known as the Navy watermen, who enjoyed the same privileges as the others, but they are now extinct. Such of the city companies as retain their barges 
have also their own watermen, whose services are rarely put into requisition above twice a year. The stationers' company have lately relinquished keeping their barge. The present number of Thames watermen, privileged and unprivileged, is, I am informed by an officer of the watermen's hall, about 1,600. The occupation abstract of 1841 gives the number of London boat, barge and watermen as 1,654. The men themselves have very loose notions as to their number. One man computed it to me at 12,000, another at 14,000. This is evidently a traditional computation handed down from the days when watermen were in greater requisition. To entitle anyone to ply for hire on the river or to work about for payment, it is provided by the laws of the city that he shall have duly and truly served a seven years apprenticeship to a licensed waterman and shall have taken up his freedom at Waterman's Hall. I heard many complaints of this regulation being infringed. There were now, I was told, about 120 men employed by the Custom House and in the Thames Police, who were not free watermen. There's a good many from Rochester way, sir, one waterman said, and down that way. They've got in through the interest of members of Parliament and such like, while there's many free watermen that's gone to the expense of taking up their freedom, just starving. But we are going to see about it, and it's high time. Either give us back the money we've paid for our rights, or let us have our proper rights. That's what I say. Why, only yesterday there was two accidents on the river, though no lives were lost. Both was owing to unlicensed men. It's neither this nor that, said an old waterman to me, alluding to the decrease in their number and their earnings. People may talk as they like about what's been the ruin of us. It's nothing but New London Bridge. When my old father heard that the old bridge was to come down, Bill, says he, it'll be up with the watermen in no time. If the old bridge had stood, how would all these steamers have shot her? Some of them could never have got through at all. At some tides, it was so hard to shoot London Bridge, note, to go clear through the arches, end note, that people wouldn't trust themselves to any but watermen. Now, any fool might manage. London Bridge, sir, depend on it, has ruined us. The places where the watermen now ply are, on the Middlesex shore beginning from London Bridge, down the river, Summers Quay, Upper Custom House Quay, Lower Custom House Quay, Tower Stairs, Iron Gate Stairs, St Catharines, Alderman Stairs, Hermitage Stairs, Union Stairs, Wapping Old Stairs, Wapping New Stairs, Execution Dock, Wapping Dock, New Crane Stairs, Shadwell Dock Stairs, King James's Stairs, Cold Stairs, Stone Stairs, Hanover Stairs, Duke's Shore, Limehouse Hole, Chalk Stones, Mast House, and Horse Ferry. On the Surrey side, beginning from Greenwich, are Greenwich, Lower Watergate, Upper Watergate, George's Stairs, Deptford Stairs, Dog and Duck Stairs, Cuckold Point, Horse Ferry Road, Globe Stairs, King and Queen Stairs, Surrey Canal Stairs, Hanover Row, Church Stairs, Rotherhithe Stairs, Prince's Stairs, Cherry Garden, Fountain High Stairs, East Lane, Mill Stairs, Horse and Groom New Stairs, George's Stairs, Horse and Groom Old Stairs, Pickle Herring Stairs, Battle Bridge Stairs, and London Bridge Stairs. Above London Bridge, the Waterman Stairs or stations on the Middlesex shore are London Bridge, All Hallows, Southwark Bridge, Paul's Wharf, Blackfriars, Fox Under the Hill, Adelphi, Hungerford, Whitehall Stairs, Westminster Bridge, Horse Ferry, Vauxhall and Hammersmith. On the opposite shore are London Bridge, 
Horseshoe Alley, Bankside, Southwark Bridge, Blackfriars Hodges, Waterloo Bridge, Westminster Bridge, Stangate Stairs, Lambeth Stairs, Foxhall Bridge, Nine Elms, and the Red House Battersea. Beyond, at Putney, and on both sides of the river up to Richmond, boats are to be had on hire, but the watermen who work them are known to their London brethren as up-country watermen, men who do not regularly ply for hire, and who are not in regular attendance at the riverside, though duly licensed. They convey passengers or luggage, or packages of any kind adapted to the burden of a boat of a light draught of water. When they are not employed, their boats are kept chained to piles driven into the water's edge. These men occasionally work in the market gardens or undertake any job within their power. But though they are civil and honest, they are only partially employed either on or off the river and are very poor. Sometimes, when no better employment is in prospect, they stand at the toll bridges of Putney, Hammersmith or Kew and offer to carry passengers across for the price of the toll. Since the prevalence of steam packets as a means of locomotion along the Thames, the stairs, if so they may be called, above bridge, are for the most part almost nominal stations for the watermen. At London Bridge Stairs, Middlesex side, there now lie but three boats, while before the steam era, or rather before the removal of the old London Bridge, ten times that number of boats were to be hailed there. At Waterloo and Southwark bridges, a man stands near the toll gate offering a water conveyance no dearer than the toll, but it is hopeless to make this proposition when the tide is low, and these men, I am assured, hardly make eightpence a day when offering this futile opposition. The stairs above bridge most frequented by the watermen are at the Red House Battersea, where there are many visitors to witness or take part in shooting matches, or for dinner or picnic parties. Down the river, the Greenwich stairs are the most numerously stocked with boats. Ordinarily, about 30 boats are to be engaged there, but the business of the watermen is not one twentieth so much to convey passengers as to board any sailing vessels beating up for London and to inquire with an offer of their services, many of them being pilots, if they can be of any use, either aboard or ashore. The number of stairs, which may be considered as the recognised stations of watermen plying for hire, are, as I have shown by the foregoing enumeration, 75. The watermen plying at these places, I am told by the best informed men, average 70 a uh, stairs. This gives 525 men and boats. But that, however, as we shall presently see, presents no criterion of the actual number of persons authorised to act as watermen. Near the stairs below bridge, the watermen stand looking out for customers, or they sit on an adjacent form protected from the weather, some smoking and some dozing. They are weather-beaten, strong-looking men, and most of them are off or above the middle age. Those who are not privileged work in the same way as the privileged, wearing all kinds of dresses, but generally something in the nature of a sailor's garb, such as a strong pilot jacket and thin canvas trousers. The present race of watermen have, I am assured, lost the sauciness with occasional smartness, that distinguished their predecessors. They are mostly patient, plodding men, enduring poverty heroically, and shrinking far more than many other classes from any application for parish relief. There is not a more independent lot that way in London, said a waterman to me, and God knows it isn't for want of all the claims which being poor can give us, that we don't apply to the workhouse. Some, however, are obliged to spend their old age when incapable of labour in the union. Half or more than one half of the Thames watermen, I am credibly informed, 
can read and write. They used to drink quantities of beer, but now, from the stress of altered circumstances, they are generally temperate men. The watermen are nearly all married and have families. Some of their wives work for the slop tailors. They all reside in the small streets near the river, usually in single rooms, rented at from one shilling and sixpence to two shillings a week. At least three-fourths of the watermen have apprentices, and they nearly all are sons or relatives of the watermen. For this I heard two reasons assigned. One was that lads whose childhood was passed among boats and on the water contracted a taste for a waterman's life, and were unwilling to be apprenticed to any other calling. The other reason was that the poverty of the watermen compelled them to bring up their sons in this manner, as the readiest mode of giving them a trade. And many thus apprenticed become seamen in the merchant service, and occasionally in the Royal Navy, or get employment as working lightermen, or on board the river steamers. At each stairs there is what is called a turnway and causeway club, to which the men contribute each two shillings per quarter. One of the regulations of these clubs is that the oldest men have the first turn on Monday, and the next oldest on Tuesday, and so on, through the several days of the week, until Saturday, which is the apprentices' day. The fund raised by the two shillings subscription is for keeping the causeway clean and in repair. There is also a society in connection with the whole body of watermen called the Protection Society to proceed against any parties who infringe upon their privileges. To this society they pay a penny per week each. The Greenwich watermen are engaged generally as pilots to colliers and other small crafts. From one of the watermen plying near the tower, I had the following statement. I have been a waterman eight and twenty years. I served my seven years duly and truly to my father. I had nothing but my keep and clothes, and that's the regular custom. We must serve seven years to be free of the river. It's the same now in our apprenticeship. No pay and some masters will neither wash nor clothe nor mend a boy, and all that ought to be done by the master by rights. Times and masters is harder than ever. After my time was out, I went to sea, and was pretty lucky in my voyages. I was at sea in the merchant service five years. When I came back, I bought a boat. My father helped me to start as a waterman on the Thames. The boat cost me 20 guineas. It would carry eight fares. It cost two pounds 15 shillings to be made an apprentice and about four pounds to have a license to start for myself. In my father's time, from what I know when I was his apprentice and what I've heard him say, a waterman's was a jolly life. He earned 15 shillings to 18 shillings a day and spent it accordingly. When I first started for myself, 28 years ago, I made 12 shillings to 14 shillings a day, more than I make in a week now, but that was before steamers. Many of us watermen saved money then, but now we're starving. These good times lasted for me nine or ten years, and in the middle of the good times I got married. I was justified, my earnings was good. But steamers came in, and we were wrecked. My father was in the River Fencibles, which was a body of men that agreed to volunteer to serve on board ships that went on convoys in the war times. The waterman was bound to supply so many men for that and for the fleet. I can't call to mind the year, but the full number wasn't supplied, and there was a press. Some of my neighbours, watermen now, was of the press gang. When the press was on, there was a terrible to-do, and all sorts of shifts among the watermen. The young ones ran away to their mothers, and kept in hiding. I was too young then, I was an apprentice too, to be pressed. But a lieutenant once put his hand on my paw, and said, My fine, red-headed fellow, you'll be the very man for me when you're old enough. Mine's a very bad trade. I make from ten shillings to twelve shillings a week, 
and that's all my wife and me has to live on. I've no children, thank the Lord for it, but I see that several of the watermen's children run about without shoes or stockings. On Monday, I earned one shilling and ninepence. On Tuesday, one shilling and sevenpence. On Wednesday, which was a very wet day, one shilling. And yesterday, Thursday, one shilling and sixpence. And up to this day, Friday noon, I've earned nothing as yet. We work Sundays and all. My expenses when I'm out isn't much. My wife puts me up a bit of meat or bacon and bread, if we have any in the house. And if I've earned anything, I eat it with half a pint of beer or a pint at times. Ours is hard work and we require support if we can only get it. If I bring no meat with me to the stairs, I bring some bread and get half a pint of coffee with it, which is a penny. We have to slave hard in some weathers when we're at work, and indeed we're always either slaving or sitting quite idle. Our principal customers are people that want to go across in a hurry. At night, and we take night work two and two about, two dozen of us in turn, we have double fares. There's very few country visitors take boats now to see sights upon the river. The swell of the steamers frightens them. Last Friday, a lady and gentleman engaged me for two shillings to go to the Thames Tunnel. But a steamer passed, and the lady said, Oh, look, what a surf! I don't like to venture. And so she wouldn't. And I sat five hours after that before I'd earned a farthing. I remember the first steamer on the river. It was from Gravesend, I think. It was good for us men at first, as the passengers came ashore in boats. There was no steam piers then, but now the big foreign steamers can come alongside, and ladies and cattle and all can step ashore on platforms. The good times is over, and we are ready now to snap at one another for threepence, when once we didn't care about a shilling. We are beaten by engines and steamings that nobody can well understand, and wheels. Rare John Taylor, the water poet in the days of James I and Charles I, with whose name I found most of the watermen familiar, at least they had heard of him, complained of the decay of his trade as a waterman inasmuch as in his latter days, quote, every guild turntripe Mistress Tumkins, Madam Polecat, My Lady Trash, Froth the Tapster, Bill the Tailor, Lavender the Broker, Whiff the Tobacco Seller, with their companion trulls, must be coached. End quote. He complained that wheeled conveyances ashore, although they made the casements shatter, totter, and clatter, were preferred to boats and were the ruin of the watermen. And it is somewhat remarkable that the watermen of our day complain of the same detriment from wheeled conveyances on the water. End of section 68section 69 The Lightermen and Bargemen These are also licensed watermen. The London watermen rarely apply the term bargemen to any persons working on the river. They confine the appellation to those who work in the barges in the canals, and who need not be free of the river, though some of them are so, many of them being also seamen or old men of war's men. The river lightermen, as the watermen style them all, no matter what the craft, are, however, so far a distinct class that they convey goods only and not passengers, while the watermen convey only passengers or such light goods as passengers may take with them in the way of luggage. The lighters are the large boats used to carry the goods which form the cargo to the vessels in the river or the docks, or from the vessels to the shore. The barge is a kind of larger lighter, built deeper and stronger, and is confined principally to the conveyance of coal. Two men are generally employed in the management of a barge. 
The lighters are adapted for the conveyance of corn, timber, stone, groceries, and general merchandise. And the several vessels are usually confined to such purposes. A corn lighter being seldom used, for instance, to carry sugar. The lighters and barges in present use are built to carry from six to one hundred and twenty tons, the greater weight being that of the huge coal barges. A lighter carrying fourteen tons of merchandise costs, when new, one hundred and twenty pounds, and this is an average size and price. Some of these lighters are the property of the men who drive them, and who are a prosperous class compared with the poor watermen. The lightermen cannot be said to apply for hire in the way of the watermen, but they are always what they call on the lookout. If a vessel arrives, some of them go on board and offer their services to the captain in case he be concerned in having his cargo transported ashore, or they ascertain to what merchant or grocer goods may be consigned, and apply to them for employment in lighterage unless they know that some particular lighterman is regularly employed by the consignee. There are no settled charges. Each tradesman has his regular scale, or drives his own bargains for lighterage, as he does for the supply of any other commodity. I heard no complaints of underselling among the lightermen, but the men who drive their own boats themselves sometimes submit to very hard bargains. Laden lighters, I was told on all hands, ought not, in anything like weather, to be worked by fewer than two men. But the hard bargains I have spoken of induce some working lightermen to attempt feats beyond their strength in driving a laden lighter unassisted. Sometimes the watermen have to put off to render assistance when they see a lighter unmanageable. Lighters can only proceed with the tide, and are often moored in the middle of the river, waiting the turn of the tide, more especially when their load consists of heavy articles. The lighters, when not employed, are moored along shore, often close to the watermen's stairs. Most master lightermen have offices by the waterside, and all have places where they may always be heard of. Many lightermen are capitalists and employ a number of hands. The London Post Office Directory gives the names of 175 master lightermen. If a ship has to be laden or unladen in a hurry, one of them is usually employed, and he sets a series of lighters on the job, so that there is no cessation in the work. Most lightermen are occasionally employers, sometimes engaging watermen to assist them, sometimes hiring a lighter, in addition to their own, from some lighterman. A man employed occasionally by one of the greater masters made the following statement. I work for Mr. Blank and drive a lighter that cost above £100, mostly at merchandise. I have 28 shillings a week and two shillings extra every night when there's night work. I should be right well off if that lasted all the year through, but it don't. On a Saturday night, when we've waited for our money till ten or eleven, perhaps, Master will say, I have nothing for you on Monday, but you can look in. He'll say that to a dozen of us, and we may not have a job till the week's half over, or not one at all. That's the mischief of our trade. I haven't means to get a lighter of my own though I can't say I'm badly off, and I'm a single man, and if I had a lighter, I've no connection. There's very few of the great lightermen that one has a regular berth under. I suppose I make 14 shillings or 15 shillings the year through, lumping it all like. The lightermen who are employed in the conveyance of goods chargeable with duty are licensed by the excise office as a check against the conveyance of contraband articles. Both the proprietors of the lighter and the persons he employs must be licensed for this conveyance, the cost being five shillings yearly. A licensed man thus employed casually by the master lighterman is known as a jobber 
and has six shillings a day. The average payment of the regular labourers of the lightermen is 25 shillings a week. But some employers, whom I heard warmly extolled as the old masters, give 30 shillings a week. In addition to this 25 shillings or 30 shillings, as the case may be, night work ensures two shillings or two shillings and sixpence extra. Thus, the permanent labourers under the lightermen appear to be fairly paid. The master lightermen, as I said before, are, according to the post office directory, 175 in number. I am told that the number may be taken, as the directory gives only those that have offices, at 200 at the least, and that of this number one half employ on an average one man each. The proprietors of the lighters who average ten hands in their employ cannot be reckoned among men working on the river, except perhaps one-fourth of their number, but of the other class all work themselves. The annual number of actual labourers in this department of metropolitan industry will thus be 125 proprietors to 1,100 non-proprietors, or 1,225 in all, driving 1,100 lighters at the least. The bargemen, who are also employed, when convenience requires, as lightermen, are 400 or 500, driving more than half that number of barges, but in these are not included many coal barges, which are the property of the coal merchants having wharfs. The number of London boat bargemen and lightermen given in the occupation abstract of 1841 was 1,503, which, allowing for the increase of population, will be found to differ but slightly from the numbers above given. The lightermen differ little in character from the watermen, but, as far as their better circumstances have permitted them, they have more comfortable homes. I speak of the working lightermen, who are also proprietors, and they can all, with very few exceptions, read and write. They all reside near the river, and generally near the docks. The great majority of them live on the Middlesex side. They are a sober class of men, both the working masters and the men they employ. A drunken lighterman, I was told, would hardly be trusted twice. The watermen and lightermen are licensed by the bylaws of the city, passed for the regulation of the freemen of the company of master, wardens, and commonalty of watermen and lightermen of the River Thames. Their widows and apprentices, to row or work boats, vessels, and other craft in all parts of the river, from New Windsor, Barks, to Yantlet Creek, below Gravesend, Kent, and in all docks, canals, creeks, and harbours, off or out of the said river, so far as the tide flows therein. A rule of the corporation in 1836 specifies the construction and dimensions of the boats to be built, after that date, for the use of the watermen. A wherry to carry eight persons was to be twenty and a half feet in length of keel, four and a half feet breadth in the midships, and of the burden of twenty-one hundredweight. A skiff to carry four persons was to be fourteen feet length of keel, five feet breadth in the midships, and one ton burden. The necessity of improved construction in the watermen's boats, since the introduction of steamers caused swells on the river, was strongly insisted on by several of the witnesses before Parliament, who produced plans for improved craft. But the poverty of the watermen has made the regulations of the authorities all but a dead letter. These river labourers are unable to procure new boats, and they patch up the old craft. The census of 1841 gives the following result as to the number of those employed in boat work in the metropolis. Boat and bargemen and women, 2,516. Lightermen, 1,503. Watermen, 1,654. Total, 5,673. The boat and bargemen and women, thus enumerated, 
are, I presume, those employed on the canals which centre in the metropolis, so that, deducting these from the 5,673 labourers above given, we have 3,157, the total number of boat, bargemen, lightermen and watermen, belong to the Thames. Steam Navigation I have now to speak of the last great change in river transit, the introduction of steam navigation on the River Thames. The first steamboat used in river navigation, or indeed in any navigation, was one built and launched by Fulton on the River Hudson, New York, in 1807. It was not until 11 years later, or in 1818, that the first English river steamboat challenged the notice of the citizens as she commenced her voyage on the Thames, running daily from the Dundee Arms, Wapping, to Gravesend and back. She was called Marjorie, and was the property of a company who started her as an experiment. She was about the burden of the present Gravesend steamers, but she did not possess covered paddle wheels, being propelled by uncovered wheels, which were at the time compared to ducks' feet, projecting from the extremity of the stern. The splashing made by the strokes of the wheels was extreme, and afforded a subject for all the ridicule and wit the watermen were masters of. Occasionally, too, the steamer came into contact with a barge, and broke one or more of her duck feet, which might cause a delay of an hour or so, as it was worded to me, before a jury duck foot could be fitted, and perhaps before another mile was done, there was another break and another stoppage. These delays, which would now be intolerable, were less regarded at that period, when the average duration of a voyage from Wapping to Gravesend by the Marjorie was about five and a half hours, while at present, with favouring wind and tide, the distance from London Bridge to Gravesend, 31 miles by water, is done in less than one hour and a half. The fares by the first river steamer were three shillings for the best and two shillings and sixpence for the fore cabin. Sailing packets at that time ran from the Dundee Arms to Gravesend, the fare being one shilling and sixpence, and these vessels were sometimes a day and sometimes a day and a half in accomplishing the distance. The first river steamboat after running less than three months of the summer, was abandoned as a failure. A favourite nickname given by the watermen and the riverside idlers to the unfortunate Marjorie was the Yankee Torpedo. About that time there had been an explosion of an American steamer named the Torpedo with loss of life, and the epithet, doubtless, had an influence in deterring the timid from venturing on a voyage down the Thames in so dangerous a vessel. The construction of the Marjorie was, moreover, greatly inferior to the steamers of the present day, as when she shot off her steam, she frequently shot off boiling water along with it. One waterman told me that he had his right hand so scalded by the hot water, as he was near the Marjorie in his boat, that it was disabled for a week. In the following summer, another steamer was started by another company, the Old Thames. The Old Thames had paddle wheels, as in the present build. Her speed was better by about one mile in ten than that of her predecessor, and her success was greater. She ran the same route, at the same prices, until the Majestic, the third river steamer, was started in the same year by a rival company, and the fares were reduced to two shillings and sixpence and two shillings. The Majestic ran from the Tower to Gravesend. At this time, and twenty years afterwards, the watermen had to convey passengers in boats to and from the steamers, as one of the watermen has stated in the narrative I have given. This was an additional source of employment to them, and led to frequent quarrels among them as to their terms in conveying passengers and luggage, and these quarrels led to frequent complaints from the captains of the steamers owing to their passengers being subject to annoyances and occasional extortions from the watermen. In 1820, two smaller boats, the Favourite 
and the Sons of Commerce were started, and the distance was accomplished in half the time. It was not until 1830, however, that steam navigation became at all general above bridge. The increase of the river steamboats from 1820 is evinced by the following table. 1820. Number of river steamers, 4. Number of voyages, 227. 1830. Number of river steamers, 20. Number of voyages, 2,344. 1835. Number of river steamers, 43. Number of voyages, 8,843. Thus we have an increase in the 10 years from 1820 to 1830 of 16 steamers, and in the 5 years from 1830 to 1835 of 23 over the number employed in 1830, and of 39 over the number of 1820. During the next 30 years, that is, from 1820 to 1850, there was an increase of 65 steamers. The diminution in the time occupied by the river steamboats in executing their voyages is quite as remarkable as the increase in their numbers. In 1820, four boats performed 227 voyages, or presuming that they ran at that period 26 weeks in the year, 56 and three-quarter voyages each, or about two a week. In 1830, following the same calculation, 20 steamers accomplished 2,344 voyages, being 117 each, or between four and five voyages a week. In 1835, 43 steamers made 8,843 voyages, being 205 voyages each, or about eight a week. During this time, some of the steamers going the longer distances, such as to Richmond, Gravesend, and so on, ran only one, two, or three days in the week, which accounts for the paucity of voyages compared with the number of vessels. In 1820, only 227 voyages were accomplished during the season of 26 weeks. In 1850, half that number of voyages were accomplished daily during a similar term, and during the whole of that term, the river steamboats conveyed 27,955,200 passengers. The amount expended in this mode of transit exceeds a quarter of a million sterling, or upwards of half a crown a head, for the entire metropolitan population. The consequences of the increase of steam navigation commanded the attention of Parliament in the year 1831 when voluminous evidence was taken before a committee of the House of Commons, but no legislative enactments followed. The management of the steam traffic, as well as that of all other river traffic, being left in the hands of the Navigation Committee of the Corporation of London, of the composition of which body I have already spoken. Collisions have taken place, said Sir John Hall in 1836, Barges, boats, and craft have been swamped, and valuable property destroyed, from the crowded and narrow space of the passage through the pool, and human life has in some instances also fallen a sacrifice from such collisions, and in others from the effect of the undulations of the water produced by the action of the paddle wheels of the steamboats, circumstances which have been aggravated by the unnecessary velocity with which some of those vessels have been occasionally propelled. The returns laid before Parliament show three deaths in 1834, attributable to steam craft. In the year 1835, the number of deaths from the same causes was no less than ten. In all these cases, inquests were held. In 1834, the number of deaths from all causes, whether of accident or suicide on the river, as investigated by the coroner, was 54, the deaths caused by steamboats being one-eighteenth that number, while in 1835, the deaths from all causes were 41, the steamboats having occasioned loss of life to nearly one-fourth of that number.
to obviate the danger and risk to boats it was suggested to the committee that the steamers should not be propelled beyond a certain rate and that an indicator should be placed on board which by recording the number of revolutions of the paddle wheels should show the speed of the steam vessel while excessive speed when thus detected was to entail punishment it was shown however that the number of times the wheel revolves affords no criterion of the speed of the vessel as regards the space traversed in a given period her speed is affected by depth of water weight of cargo number of passengers by her superior or inferior construction and handling and most especially by her going with or against the tide while in all these circumstances of varying speed as regards rates of progress the revolutions of the paddle wheels might in every fifteen minutes vary little in number the tide moves ebb and flow on the average three miles an hour mr rowland the harbour master has said touching the proper speed of steam vessels on the river quote, four miles an hour through the water against the tide and seven with the tide would give ample speed for the steamboats an opportunity would thus be afforded of travelling over the ground against the tide at the rate of about four miles an hour and with the tide they would positively pass over the ground at the rate of about seven miles end quote. the rate at which the better class of river steamers progress when fairly in motion is now from eight to nine miles an hour although no legislative enactments for the better regulation of the river steam navigation took place after the report of the committee accidents from the cause referred to are now unfrequent in the present year i am informed there has been no loss of life on the thames occasioned by steamboats this is attributable to a better and clearer waterway being kept and to a greater efficiency on the part of the captains and helmsmen of the river steam fleet it is common for people proceeding from london bridge to gravesend to exclaim about the crowds of shipping the fact is however that notwithstanding the great increase in the commerce and traffic of the capital the thames is less crowded with shipping than it was at the beginning of the century mr banion clerk to the waterman's company in his evidence before a committee of the house of commons described himself as a practical man twenty-two years before eighteen eleven he says quote, there is a wonderful difference since my time i was on the river previous to any docks being made when all the trade of the country was laying out in the river the river was then so crowded that the tiers used to overlap one another and we used to be obliged to bring up so as to prevent getting a thwart hawse end quote. i mention this fact to show that without the relief afforded by the docks steam navigation would be utterly impracticable the average tonnage of a steam vessel of a build adapted to run between london and greenwich or woolwich is seventy or eighty tons one adapted to run to gravesend or beyond is about one hundred and eighty tons and those merely suitable for plying between london bridge and westminster forty or fifty tons what is the number of persons per ton which may safely be entrusted to the conveyance of steamboats authorities are not agreed upon mr w cunningham the captain of a woolwich steamer represented it to the committee as four or five to the ton though he admits that five to the ton inconvenienced the passengers by crowding them the tonnage of mr cunningham's vessel was seventy seven his average number of passengers on extreme freights was two hundred yet he once carried five hundred persons though by his own admission three hundred and eighty five would involve crowding the changes wrought in the appearance of the river and in the condition of the watermen by the introduction of steamers have been rapid and marked not only since the steam era have new boats and new companies gradually made their appearance but new piers have sprung up in the course of the thames from gravesend to richmond of these piers 
that at Hungerford is the most remarkable, as it is erected fairly in the river, and on a fine summer's day, when filled with well-dressed persons waiting for their boat, it has a very animated appearance. A long wooden framework, which rises into a kind of staircase at high water, and is a sloping platform at low water, connects the pier with Hungerford Bridge. At Southwark and Vauxhall Bridges, the piers are constructed on the abutments of an arch, and a staircase conducts the passenger to the bridge. On the north side of the river are three at London Bridge, one at Southwark Bridge, at Paul's Wharf, Blackfriars, Temple, Arundel Street, Waterloo Bridge, Fox Under the Hill, George Street, Adelphi, Hungerford, Pimlico, Cadogan Pier, Chelsea, Battersea Bridge, Hammersmith and Kew. On the other side are two at Richmond, one at Putney, Red House, Battersea, Nine Elms, Lambeth, Westminster Bridge and London Bridge. Below Bridge, on the Middlesex side, the piers are the Tunnel, Limehouse Hole, Brunswick, North Woolwich and Purfleet. On the Surrey side, there are two piers at Gravesend, one at Rosherville, Erith, Woolwich, East Greenwich, Greenwich and the commercial docks, Rotherhith. The pierman at the pier belonging to the Gravesend Diamond Company, the oldest company now flourishing as it was started in June 1828, and to others of similar character, are seven in number. At Hungerford, however, there are eleven piermen, and taking the steamboat piers altogether, it may be safely said there are four men to each on an average, or 168 men to 42 such piers. The piermen are of three classes, as regards the rates of remuneration. The piermaster, who is the general superintendent of the station, has 35 shillings a week. The others have 25 shillings and 21 shillings. These men are not confined to any one duty, as the man who takes the tickets from the passengers one day may assist merely in mooring or in touting the next, though a good touter is not often changed. The colour of the tickets is changed daily, unless a colour is run out, in which case another colour must be substituted until a supply can be obtained. The majority of the pyramid have been watermen or seamen, or in some way connected with river work. They are for the most part married men, supporting families in the best manner that their means will admit. From a gentleman connected with a steam packet company, I had the pleasure of hearing a very good character of these men, while by the men themselves I was informed that they were, as a body, fairly treated, never being dismissed without reasons assigned and due inquiry. The directors of such vessels, as are in the hands of companies, meet weekly, and among their general business, they then investigate any complaints by or against the men, who are sometimes suspended as a punishment, though such cases are unfrequent. All the men employed on board the river steamers are free watermen, excepting those working in the engine room. In the winter, some of them return to the avocation of watermen, hiring a boat by the month or week, if they do not possess, as many do, boats of their own. In the course of my inquiries among the merchant seamen, I heard not a few contemptuous opinions expressed of the men on board the river craft. There is no doubt, however, that the captain of a river steamer, who is also the pilot, must have a quick and correct eye to direct his vessel out of the crowd of others, about London Bridge, for instance, without collision. The helmsman is frequently the mate of the steamer, sometimes but rarely one of the crew, while sometimes the captain himself relieves the mate at the helm, and then the mate undertakes the piloting of the vessel. During the season, when the steamboat is made safe for the night, one of the crew usually sleeps on board to protect what property may be kept there and to guard against fire. The crew go on board about two hours before the vessel starts to clean her thoroughly. The engineer and his people must be in attendance about that time to get the steam up, 
and the captain about half an hour or an hour before the boat leaves her mooring to see that everything is in order the river steamers generally commence running on good friday or easter monday and continue until the first of october or a little later if the weather be fine each steamer carries a captain a mate and three men as crew with an engineer a stoker and a call boy or eight hands altogether on board the number daily at work on the river steamers is thus five hundred and fifty two so that including the piermen the clerks and the odd men between seven hundred and eight hundred persons are employed in the steam navigation of the thames calculating each voyage to average six miles the extent of steam navigation on the thames performed daily in the season is no less than eight thousand two hundred and eighty miles the captains receive from two pounds to three pounds per week the mates from thirty shillings to thirty five shillings the crew twenty five shillings each the call boy seven shillings the engineer from two pounds to three pounds and the stokers thirty shillings the class of persons travelling by these steamboats is mixed the wealthier not unfrequently use them for their excursions up or down the river but the great support of the boats is from the middle and working classes more especially such of the working class including the artisans as reside in the suburbs and proceed by this means of conveyance to their accustomed places of business in all or nearly all the large steamers a band of music adds to the enjoyment of the passengers but with this the directors of the vessel have nothing to do beyond giving their consent to gratuitous conveyance of the musicians who go upon speculation their remuneration being what they can collect from the passengers end of section sixty nine Section 70 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. London Omnibus Drivers and Conductors, Part 1. The subject of omnibus conveyance is one to the importance of which the aspect of every thoroughfare in London bears witness. Yet the dweller in the Strand, or even in a greater thoroughfare, Cheapside, can only form a partial notion of the magnitude of this mode of transit, for he has but a partial view of it. He sees, as it were, only one of its details. The routes of the several omnibuses are manifold. Widely apart, as are their starting points, it will be seen how their courses tend to common centres, and how generally what may be called the great trunk lines of the streets are resorted to. The principal routes lie north and south, east and west, through the central parts of London, to and from the extreme suburbs. The majority of them commence running at eight in the morning and continue till twelve at night, succeeding each other during the busy part of the day every five minutes. Most of them have two charges, threepence for part of the distance and sixpence for the whole distance. The omnibuses proceeding on the northern and southern routes are principally the following. The atlases run from the Air Arms, St. John's Wood, by way of Baker Street, Oxford Street, Regent Street, Charing Cross, Westminster Bridge and Road, and past the Elephant and Castle by the Walworth Road, to Camberwell Gate. Some turn off from the Elephant, as all the omnibus people call it, and go down the New Kent Road to the Dover Railway Station, while others run the same route, but to and from the Nightingale, Listen Grove, instead of the Air Arms. The Waterloos journey from the York and Albany Regent's Park, by way of Albany Street, Portland Road, Regent Street, and so over Waterloo Bridge by the Waterloo, London and Walworth Roads to Camberwell Gate. The Waterloo Association 
have also a branch to Holloway, via the Camden Villas. There are likewise others which run from the terminus of the South Western Railway in the Waterloo Road, via Stamford Street, to the railway termini on the Surrey side of London Bridge, and thence to that of the Eastern Counties in Shoreditch. The Hungerford Markets pursue the route from Camden Town, along Tottenham Court Road, and so on, to Hungerford, and many run from this spot to Paddington. The Kentish Town run from the Eastern County Station and from Whitechapel to Kentish Town, by way of Tottenham Court Road, and so on. The Hampsteads observe the like course to Camden Town, and then run straight on to Hampstead. The King's Crosses run from Kennington Gate by the Blackfriars Road and Bridge, Fleet Street, Chancery Lane, Gray's Inn Lane and the New Road to Euston Square, while some go on to Camden Town. The Great Northerns, the latest route started, travel from the railway terminus, Maiden Lane, King's Cross, to the bank and the railway stations, both in the city and across the Thames also to Paddington, and some to Kennington. The favourites route is from Westminster Abbey, along the Strand, Chancery Lane, Gray's Inn Lane, and Coalbath Fields, to the Angel Islington, and thence to Holloway, while some of them run down Fleet Street, and so past the General Post Office, and thence by the City Road, to the Angel, and to Holloway. The favourites also run from Holloway to the bank. The Islington and Kennington line is from Barnsbury Park by the post office and Blackfriars Bridge to Kennington Gate. The Camberwells go from Gracechurch Street over London Bridge to Camberwell, while a very few start from the west end of the town and some two or three from Fleet Street, the former crossing Westminster and the latter Blackfriars Bridge, while some Nelsons run from Oxford Street to Camberwell or to Brixton. The Brixtons and Clapham's go some from the Regent Circus, Oxford Street, by way of Regent Street over Westminster Bridge, and some from Gracechurch Street over London Bridge to Brixton or Clapham, as the case may be. The Paragons observe the same route, and some of these conveyances go over Blackfriars Bridge to Brixton. The Carshaltons follow the track of the Mitchams, Tootings and Claphams, and go over London Bridge to the bank. The Paddingtons go from the Royal Oak, Westburn Green, and from the Pineapple Gate, by way of Oxford Street and Holborn, to the bank, the London Bridge, Eastern Counties or Blackwall Railway Termini, while some reach the same destination by the route of the New Road, City Road and Finsbury. These routes are also pursued by the vehicles lettered New Road Conveyance Association and London Conveyance Company, while some of the vehicles belonging to the same proprietors run to Notting Hill and some have branches to St John's Wood and elsewhere. The Wellingtons and Marlboroughs pursue the same track as the Paddingtons, but some of them diverge to St John's Wood. The Kensal Greens go from the Regent Circus, Oxford Street, to the cemetery. The course of the Bayswaters is from Bayswater via Oxford Street, Regent Street and the Strand to the Bank. The Bayswaters and Kensingtons run from the bank via Finsbury and then by the City Road and New Road down Portland Road and by Oxford Street and Piccadilly to Bayswater and Kensington. The Hammersmith and Kensingtons convey their passengers from Hammersmith by way of Kensington, Knightsbridge, Piccadilly and so on to the bank. The Richmond and Hampton Courts from St Paul's Churchyard to the two places indicated. The Putneys and Bromptons run from Putney Bridge via Brompton and so on to the Bank and the London Bridge Railway Station. 
the chelseas proceed from the man in the moon to the bank mile end road and city railway stations the chelsea and islington's observe the same route from sloan square to the angel islington travelling along piccadilly regent street portland road and the new road the royal blues go from pimlico via grosvenor gate piccadilly the strand and so on to the blackwall railway station the direction of the pimlicos is through westminster whitehall strand and so on to whitechapel the marquis of westminster's follow the route from the vauxhall bridge via millbank westminster abbey the strand and so on to the bank the Deptfords go from Gracechurch Street and over London Bridge, and some from Charing Cross over Westminster Bridge to Deptford. The route of the Nelsons is from Charing Cross over Westminster Bridge and by the new and old Kent Roads to Deptford, Greenwich and Woolwich. Some go from Gracechurch Street over London Bridge. The shore ditches pursue the direction of Chelsea, Piccadilly, the Strand, and so on, to Shoreditch, their starting place being Battersea Bridge. The Hackneys and Claptons run from Oxford Street to Clapton Square. Barbers run from the bank, and some from Oxford Street to Clapton. The Blackwells run some from Sloan Street to the docks, and the Bow and Stratfords from different parts of the West End to their respective destinations. I have enumerated these several conveyances from the information of persons connected with the trade, using the terms they used, which better distinguish the respective routes than the names lettered on the carriages, which would but puzzle the reader, the principal appellation giving no intimation of the destination of the omnibus. The routes above specified are pursued by a series of vehicles belonging to one company or to one firm or one individual, the number of their vehicles varying from 12 to 50. One omnibus, however, continues to run from the bank to Finchley and one from the Angel to Hampton Court. The total number of omnibuses traversing the streets of London is about 3,000 paying duty, including mileage, averaging £9 per month each, or £324,000 per annum. The number of conductors and drivers is about 7,000, including a thousand odd men, a term that will be explained hereafter, paying annually five shillings each for their licences, or £1,750 collectively. The receipts of each vehicle vary from £2 to £4 per day, estimating the whole 3000 at £3. It follows that the entire sum expended annually in omnibus hire by the people of London amounts to no less than £3,285,000, which is more than 30 shillings a head for every man, woman and child in the metropolis. The average journey, as regards length, of each omnibus is six miles, and that distance is in some cases travelled twelve times a day by each omnibus, or, as it is called, six there and six back. Some perform the journey only ten times a day, note each omnibus, end note, and some, but a minority, a less number of times. Now, taking the average as between 45 and 50 miles a day travelled by each omnibus, and that, I am assured, on the best authority, is within the mark, while 60 miles a day might exceed it, and computing the omnibuses running daily at 3,000, we find a travel, as it was worded to me, upwards of 140,000 miles a day, or a yearly travel of more than 50 million of miles, an extent that almost defies a parallel among any distances popularly familiar, and that this estimate in no way exceeds the truth, 
is proved by the sum annually paid to the excise for mileage, which, as before stated, amounts on an average to nine pounds each bus per month, or collectively to three hundred and twenty four thousand pounds per annum, and this at a penny halfpenny per mile, the rate of duty charged gives fifty one million eight hundred and forty thousand miles as the distance travelled by the entire number of omnibuses every year on each of its journeys experienced persons have assured me an omnibus carries on the average fifteen persons nearly all are licensed to carry twenty two thirteen inside and nine out and that number perhaps is sometimes exceeded while fifteen is a fair computation, for, as every omnibus has now the two fares, threepence and sixpence, or, as the busmen call them, longens and shortens, there are two sets of passengers, and the number of fifteen through the whole distance on each journey of the omnibus is, as I have said, a fair computation, for sometimes the vehicle is almost empty, as a set-off to its being crammed at other times. This computation shows the daily travel, reckoning ten journeys a day, of 450,000 passengers. Thus we might be led to believe that about one-fourth the entire population of the metropolis and its suburbs, men, women and children, the inmates of hospitals, jails and workhouses, paupers, peers, and their families, all included, were daily travelling in omnibuses. But it must be borne in mind that, as most omnibus travellers use that convenient mode of conveyance at least twice a day, we may compute the number of individuals at 225,000, or allowing three journeys as an average daily travel at 150,000 calculating the payment of each passenger at fourpence halfpenny, and so allowing for the set-off of the shortens to the longens, we have a daily receipt for omnibus fares of £8,439, a weekly receipt of £58,073, and a yearly receipt of £2,903,650 which, it will be seen, is several thousands less than the former estimate, so that it may be safely assured that at least three millions of money is annually expended on omnibus fares in London. The extent of individual travel performed by some of the omnibus drivers is enormous. One man told me that he had driven his bus 72 miles, Note, 12 stages of 6 miles, end note, every day for 6 years, with the exception of 12 miles less every second Sunday, so that this man had driven, in 6 years, 179,568 miles. Origin of Omnibuses This vast extent of omnibus transit has been the growth of 20 years, as it was not until the 4th of July, 1829, that Mr. Shillibeer, now the proprietor of the patent mourning coaches, started the first omnibus. Some works of authority, as books of reference, have represented that Mr. Shillibeer's first omnibus ran from Charing Cross to Greenwich, and that the charge for outside and inside places was the same. Such was not the case. The first omnibus or rather, the first pair of those vehicles, for Mr. Shillibeer started two, ran from the bank to the Yorkshire Stingo. Neither could the charge out and in be the same, as there were no outside passengers. Mr. Shillibeer was a naval officer, and in his youth stepped from a midshipman's duties into the business of a coach builder, he learning that business from the late Mr. Hatchett of Longacre. Mr. Shillibeer then established himself in Paris as a builder of English carriages, a demand for which had sprung up after the peace, when the current of English travel was directed strongly to France. 
In this speculation, Mr. Shillabeer was eminently successful. He built carriages for Prince Polignac, and others of the most influential men under the dynasty of the elder branch of the Bourbons, and had a bazaar for the sale of his vehicles. He was thus occupied in Paris in 1819, when Monsieur Lafitte first started the omnibuses which are now so common and so well managed in the French capital. Lafitte was the banker, afterwards the minister, of Louis Philippe and the most active man in establishing the Messagerie Royale. Five or six years after the omnibuses had been successfully introduced into Paris, Mr. Chilibier was employed by Monsieur Lafitte to build two in a superior style. In executing this order, Mr. Chilibier thought that so comfortable and economical a mode of conveyance might be advantageously introduced in London. He accordingly disposed of his Parisian establishment and came to London, and started his omnibus, as I have narrated. In order that the introduction might have every chance of success, and have the full prestige of respectability, Mr. Chilibier brought over with him from Paris two youths, both the sons of British naval officers, and these young gentlemen were for a few weeks his conductors. They were smartly dressed in blue cloth and togs, to use the words of my informant, after the fashion of Lafitte's conductors, each dress costing five pounds. Their addressing any foreign passenger in French, and the French style of the affair, gave rise to an opinion that Mr. Chilibier was a Frenchman, and that the English were indebted to a foreigner for the improvement of their vehicular transit whereas Mr. Chilibier had served in the British Navy and was born in Tottenham Court Road. His speculation was particularly, and at once, successful. His two vehicles carried each 22, and were filled every journey. The form was that of the present omnibus, but larger and roomier, as the 22 were all accommodated inside, nobody being outside but the driver. Three horses yoked abreast were used to draw these carriages. There were for many days, until the novelty wore off, crowds assembled to see the omnibuses start, and many ladies and gentlemen took their places in them to the Yorkshire Stingo in order that they might have the pleasure of riding back again. The fare was one shilling for the whole and sixpence for half the distance and each omnibus made twelve journeys to and fro every day. Thus Mr. Chilibier established a diversity of fares regulated by distance, a regulation which was afterwards in a great measure abandoned by omnibus proprietors, and then re-established on our present threepenny and sixpenny payments, the long-uns and the short-uns. Mr. Chilibier's receipts were £100 a week, at first he provided a few books, chiefly magazines, for the perusal of his customers. But this peripatetic library was discontinued, for the customers, I give the words of my informant, boned the books. When the young gentlemen conductors retired from their posts, they were succeeded by persons hired by Mr. Chilibier and liberally paid, who were attired in a sort of velvet livery. Many weeks had not elapsed before Mr. Chilibier found a falling off in his receipts, although he ascertained that there was no falling off in the public support of his omnibuses. He obtained information, however, that the persons in his employ robbed him of at least £20 a week, retaining that sum out of the receipts of the two omnibuses, and that they had boasted of their cleverness and their lucrative situations at a champagne supper at the Yorkshire Stingo. This necessitated a change, which Mr. Chilibier effected in his men, but without prosecuting the offenders. And still it seemed that defalcations continued, that they continued was soon shown, and in a striking manner, as I was told. As an experiment, Mr. Chilibier expended £300 in the construction of a machine fitted to the steps of an omnibus 
which should record the number of passengers as they trod on a plate in entering and leaving the vehicle, arranged on a similar principle to the tell-tales in use on our toll bridges. The inventor, Mr. Blank, now of Woolwich, himself worked the omnibus containing it for a fortnight, and it supplied a correct index of the number of passengers. But at the fortnight's end, one evening after dark, the inventor was hustled aside while waiting at the Yorkshire Stingo, and in a minute or two the machine was smashed by some unknown men with sledgehammers. Mr. Shillybeer then had recourse to the use of such clocks as were used in the French omnibuses as a check. It was publicly notified that it was the business of the conductor to move the hand of the clock a given distance when a passenger entered the vehicle, but this plan did not succeed. It is common in France for a passenger to inform the proprietor of any neglect on the part of his servant, but Mr. Shillibeer never received any such intimation in London. In the meantime, Mr. Shillibeer's success continued, for he ensured punctuality and civility, and the cheapness, cleanliness and smartness of his omnibuses were in most advantageous contrast with the high charges, dirt, dinginess and rudeness of the drivers of many of the short stages. The short stage proprietors were loud in their railings against what they were pleased to describe as a French innovation. In the course of from six to nine months, Mr. Shillibeer had twelve omnibuses at work. The new omnibuses ran from the bank to Paddington, both by the route of Holborn and Oxford Street, as well as by Finsbury and the New Road. Mr. Shillibeer feels convinced that had he started 50 omnibuses instead of two in the first instance, a fortune might have been realised. In 1831 to 1832, his omnibuses became general in the Great Street thoroughfares, and as the short stages were run off the road, the proprietors started omnibuses in opposition to Mr. Shillibeer. The first omnibuses, however, started after Mr. Shillibeer's were not in opposition. They were the Caledonians, and were the property of Mr. Shillibeer's brother-in-law. The third started, which were two horse vehicles, were foolishly enough called Les Dames Blanches, but as the name gave rise to much low wit in équivoque, it was abandoned. The original omnibuses were called Shillibeers on the panels, from the name of their originator, and the name is still prevalent on those conveyances in New York, which affords us another proof that not in his own country is a benefactor honoured, until perhaps his death makes honour as little worth as an epitaph. The opposition omnibuses, however, continued to increase as more and more short stages were abandoned, and one oppositionist called his omnibuses Shillibeers, so that the real and the sham Shillibeers were known in the streets. The opposition became fiercer. The buses, as they came to be called in a year or two, crossed each other and raced or drove their poles recklessly into the back of one another, and accidents and squabbles and loitering grew so frequent, and the time of the police magistrates was so much occupied with omnibus business, that in 1832 the matter was mentioned in Parliament as a nuisance requiring a remedy, and in 1833 a bill was brought in by the government and passed for the regulation of omnibuses as well as other conveyances in and near the metropolis. Two sessions after, Mr. Alderman Wood brought in a bill for the better regulation of omnibuses, which was also passed, and one of the provisions of the bill was that the drivers and conductors of omnibuses should be licensed. The office of Registrar of Licenses was promised by a noble lord in office to Mr. Shillibeer, as I am informed on good authority but the appointment was given to the present Commissioner of the City Police, and the office next to the principal was offered to Mr. Shillibeer, 
which that gentleman declined to accept. The reason assigned for not appointing him to the registrarship was that he was connected with omnibuses. At the beginning of 1834, Mr. Shillibeer abandoned his metropolitan trade and began running omnibuses from London to Greenwich and Woolwich, employing 20 carriages and 120 horses. But the increase of steamers and the opening of the Greenwich Railway in 1835 affected his trade so materially that Mr. Shillibeer fell into arrear with his payments to the stamp office and seizures of his property and re-seizures after money was paid entailed such heavy expenses and such a hindrance to Mr. Shillibeer's business that his failure ensued. I have been thus somewhat full in my detail of Mr. Shillibeer's career as his procedures are in truth the history of the transit of the metropolis as regards omnibuses. I conclude this portion of the subject with the following extracts from a parliamentary paper, Supplement to the Votes and Proceedings, Veneris Settimo di Iuli, 1843, containing the petition of George Shillibeer. Quote, that in 1840, and after several years of incessant application, the Lords of the Treasury caused Mr. Gordon, their then financial secretary, to inquire into your petitioner's case, and so fully satisfied was that gentleman with the hardships and cruel wrongs which the Department of Stamps and Taxes had inflicted upon your petitioner, that he, Mr. Gordon, promised on behalf of the Lords of the Treasury early redress should be granted to your petitioner, either by a government appointment adequate to the loss he had sustained, or pecuniary compensation for the injustice which, upon a thorough investigation of the facts, Mr. Gordon assured your petitioner he had fully established to the satisfaction of the Lords of the Treasury. That in proof of the sincerity of Mr. Gordon, he, in his then official capacity of secretary to the said Lords of Her Majesty's Treasury, applied in April 1841 to the then heads of two government departments, namely the Marquis of Normanby and the Right Honourable Henry Labouchere, to appoint your petitioner Inspector General of Public Carriages, or some appointment in the Railway Department at the Board of Trade. But these applications being unsuccessful, Mr. Gordon applied and obtained for your petitioner the promise of one of the 25 appointments of Receiver General of County Courts, testimonials of your petitioner's fitness being at the Treasury, the bill for establishing which was then in progress through Parliament. That shortly after your petitioner's claims had been admitted, and redress promised by the Lords of the Treasury, Mr. Gordon resigned his situation of secretary, and on the 6th of May 1841, your petitioner again saw Mr. Gordon, who assured your petitioner that but for the fact of the miscellaneous estimates being made up and passed for that year, your petitioner's name should have been placed in them for a grant of £5,000. Further observing, that your petitioner's was a case of very great hardship and injustice, and assuring your petitioner that he, Mr. Gordon, would not quit the Treasury without stating to his successor that your petitioner's case was one of peculiar severity and deserved immediate attention and redress. End quote. And so the matter remains virtually at an end. End of section 70。section 71 of London Labour and the London Poor, volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. London Omnibus Drivers and Conductors, part 2. I will now give the regulations and statistics of the French omnibuses, which I am enabled to do through the kindness of a gentleman to whom I am indebted for much valuable information. As the regulations of the French public conveyances, des voitures visant le transport en commun, are generally considered to have worked admirably well, 
I present a digest of them. The earlier enactments provide for the numbering of the conveyances and for the licensing of all connected with them. The laws which provide the regulations are of the following dates. I enumerate them to show how closely the French government has attended to the management of hired vehicles. December 14th, 1789. August 14th, 1790. Neuf Vendemiaire en six, September 30th, 1797. Onze Frimaire en sept, December 1st, 1798. Douze Messidor en huit, July 1st, 1800. Trois Brumaire en neuf, October 29th, 1800. December 30th, 1818. July 22nd, 1829. August 1st, 1829. March 29th, 1836. September 15th, 1838. And January 5th, 1846. The 471st, 474th, 479th, and 484th articles of the Penal Code also relate to this subject. The principal regulations now in force are the following. The proprietors of all public conveyances for hire shall be numbered, licensed, and find such security as shall be satisfactory to the authorities. Every proprietor, before he can change the locality of his establishment, is bound to give 48 hours notice of his intention to remove. The sale of such establishments can only be effected by undertakers, entrepreneurs, duly authorised for the purpose, and the privilege of the undertaker is not transferable, either wholly or partially, without the sanction of the authorities. The proprietors cannot employ any conductors, drivers or porters, but such as have a licence or permit, permis de conduire, and so on. Neither can a master retain or transfer any such permit if the holder of it have left his service. It must be given up within 24 hours at the prefecture Note, chief office and note of police, and the date of a man's entering and leaving his employ must be inscribed by his late master on the back of the document. Proprietors must keep a register of the names and abodes of their drivers and conductors, and of their numbers as entered in the books of the prefecture. Also, a daily entry of the numbers of the vehicles in use as engraved on the plates affixed to them, and a record of the conduct of the men to whom they have been entrusted. No proprietor to be allowed to employ a driver or conductor whose permit, through ill conduct or any cause, has been withdrawn. In case of the contravention of this regulation by any one, the plying, la circulation, of his carriage is to be stopped either temporarily or definitely. No carriage shall be entrusted to either driver or conductor if either be in a state of evident uncleanliness, malpropriété. No horse known to be vicious, diseased or incapable of work is to be employed. The conductors are to maintain order in their vehicles and to observe that the passengers place themselves so as not to incommode one another. They are not to take more persons than they are authorised to convey, which number must be notified in the interior and on the exterior of the omnibus. They are also forbidden to admit individuals who may be drunk or clad in a manner to disgust or annoy the other passengers. Neither must they admit dogs, or suffer persons who may drink, sing, or smoke, to remain in the carriages. Neither must they carry parcels which, from their size or the nature of their contents, may incommode the passengers. Conductors must not give the coachman the word to go on until each passenger leaving the omnibus shall have quitted the footstep or until each passenger entering the omnibus shall have been seated. 
every person so entering is to be asked where he wishes to be set down. All property left in the omnibus to be conveyed to the prefecture of police. It is, moreover, the conductor's business to light the carriage lamps after nightfall. The drivers, before they can be allowed to exercise their profession, must produce testimonials as to their possessing the necessary skill. They are not to gallop their horses under any circumstances whatever. They are required, moreover, to drive slowly or at a walk, au pas, in the markets and in the narrow streets where only two carriages can pass abreast, at the descent of the bridges, and in all parts of the public ways where there may be a stoppage or a rapid slope. Wherever the width of the streets permits it, the omnibus must be driven at least three feet from the houses, where there is no footpath, trottoir, and where there is a footpath, two feet from it. They must, as much as possible, keep the wheels of their vehicle out of the gutters. No driver or conductor can exercise his profession under the age of 18, and before being authorised to do so, he must show that his morals and trustworthiness are such as to justify his appointment. The ordonnance then provides for the licensing at the cost of 70 centimes of these officers by the police, in the way I have already described. They are not permitted to smoke while at their work, nor to take off their coats, even during the sultriest weather. The omnibuses are to pull up on the right-hand side of the street, but if there be any hindrance, then on the left. The foregoing regulations, the infractions of which are punishable through the ordinary tribunals, do not materially differ from those of our own country, though they may be more stringently enforced. The other provisions, however, are materially different. The French government fixes the amount of fare prescribes the precise route to be observed and the time to be kept, and limits the number of omnibuses. On the 12th of August, 1846, there were 387 in number, running along 36 lines, which are classed under the head of 12 routes, entreprises, in the following order. Route 1. Omnibus or Lyonnaise and Diligente. Number of lines, 13. Number of carriages, 151. Numbers according to the licenses, 1 to 151. Route 2. Dame Réunie. Number of lines, 3. Number of carriages, 29. Numbers according to the licenses, 152 to 180. Route 3. Tricycle. Number of lines, 1. Number of carriages, 11. Numbers according to the licenses, 181 to 191. Route 4. Favorite. Number of lines, 4. Number of carriages, 47. Numbers according to the licenses, 192 to 238. Route 5. Bianes. Number of lines, 2. Number of carriages, 19. Numbers according to the licenses, 239 to 257. Route 6, Citadine. Number of lines, 2. Number of carriages, 13. Numbers according to the licenses, 258 to 270. Route 7, Batignol, Gazelles. Number of lines, 2. Number of carriages, 19. Numbers according to the licenses, 271 to 289. Route 8, Hirondelle. Number of lines, 2. Number of carriages, 30. Numbers according to the licenses, 290 to 319. Route 9, Parisienne. Number of lines, 3. Number of carriages, 33. Numbers according to the licenses, 320 to 352. Route 10. Constantine. Number of lines, 1. Number of carriages, 12. 
Numbers according to the licenses, 353 to 364. Route 11. Excellent. Number of lines, 2. Number of carriages, 15. Numbers according to the licenses, 365 to 379. Route 12. Gauloise. Number of lines, 1. Number of carriages, 8. Numbers according to the licenses, 380 to 387. Total number of lines, 36. Total number of carriages, 387. In order to prevent the inconvenience of two rigidly defined routes, a system of intercommunication has been established. At a given point, Bureau de Correspondance, a passenger may always be transferred to another omnibus, the conductor giving him a free ticket, and so may reach his destination, or the nearest point to it, from any of the starting places. This system now exists, but very partially, on some of the London lines. The number conveyed by a Parisian omnibus is fixed at 16. Each vehicle is to be drawn by two horses and is to unite, quote, all the conditions of solidity, commodiousness and elegance that may be desirable, end quote. In order to ensure these conditions, the French government directs in what manner every omnibus shall be built. Those built prior to the promulgation of the Ordinance, August 12, 1846, regulating the construction of these vehicles, are still allowed to be in circulation. But after the 1st of January, 1852, no omnibus not constructed in exact accordance with the details laid down will be allowed to circulate. The height of the omnibus is fixed, as well as the length and the width, the circumference of the wheels, the adjustment of the springs, the hanging of the body, the formation of the ventilators, the lining and cushioning of the interior, the dimensions of the footsteps, and the disposition of the lamps, which are three in number. The arrangements where a footpath is not known in the streets of Paris and a gutter is in existence are tolerably significant of distinctions between the streets of the French and English capitals. I shall now pass to the consideration of the English vehicles as they are at present conducted. Omnibus Proprietors The labourers immediately connected with the trade in omnibuses are the proprietors, drivers, conductors, and timekeepers. Those less immediately, but still in connection with the trade, are the odd men and the horse keepers. The earlier history of omnibus proprietors presents but a series of struggles and ruinous lawsuits, one proprietor with another, until many were ruined, and then several opposed companies or individuals coalesced or agreed and these proprietaries now present a united and, I believe, a prosperous body. They possess in reality a monopoly in omnibus conveyance, but I am assured it would not be easy under any other plan to serve the public better. All the proprietors of omnibuses may be said to be in union, as they act systematically and by arrangement, one proprietary with another. Their profits are, of course, apportioned, like those of other joint stock companies, according to the number of shares held by individual members. On each route, one member of the proprietary is appointed, directed, by his co-proprietors. The directory may be classed as the executive department of the body. The director can displace a driver on a week's notice but by some directors who pride themselves on dealing summarily, it seems that the week's notice is now and then dispensed with. The conductor he can displace at a day's notice. The odd men sometimes supply the places of the officials so discharged until a meeting of the proprietary, held monthly for the most part, when new officers are appointed, there being always an abundance of applicants who send or carry in testimonials of their fitness from persons known to the proprietors or known to reside on the line of the route. 
The director may indeed appoint either driver or conductor at his discretion, if he see good reason to do so. The driver, however, is generally appointed and paid by the proprietor, while the conductor is more particularly the servant of the association. The proprietaries have so far a monopoly of the road that they allow no new omnibuses to be started upon it. If a speculator should be bold enough to start new conveyances, the pre-existing proprietaries put a greater number of conveyances on the route, so that none are well filled, and one of the old proprietaries' vehicles immediately precedes the omnibus of the speculator, and another immediately follows it, and thus three vehicles are on the ground, which may yield only customers for one. Hence, as the whole number on the route has been largely increased, not one omnibus is well filled, and the speculator must in all probability be ruined, while the associated proprietors suffer but a temporary loss. So well is this now understood that no one seems to think of embarking his money in the omnibus trade unless he buys his times, that is to say, unless he arranges by purchase, and a new man will often pay £400 or £500 for his times to have the privilege of running his vehicles on a given route and at given periods, in other words, for the privilege of becoming a recognised proprietor. The proprietors pay their servants fairly as a general rule, while as a universal rule they rigidly exact sobriety, punctuality and cleanliness. Their great difficulty all of them concur in stating, is to ensure honesty. Each proprietor insists upon the excessive difficulty of trusting men with uncounted money, if the men feel there is no efficient check to ensure to their employers a knowledge of the exact amount of their daily receipts. Several plans have been resorted to in order to obtain the desired check. Mr. Shillibier's I have already given. One plan now in practice is to engage a well-dressed woman, sometimes accompanied by a child, and she travels by the omnibus, and immediately on leaving it folds up a paper for the proprietor showing the number of insides and outs of short and long fares. This method, however, does not ensure a thorough accuracy. It is difficult for a woman who must take such a place in the vehicle as she can get to ascertain the precise number of outsides and their respective fares. So difficult that I am assured such a person has returned a smaller number than was actually conveyed. One gentleman who was formerly an omnibus proprietor told me he employed a ladylike and, as he believed, trusty woman as a check. But by some means the conductors found out the calling of the ladylike woman, treated her and she made very favourable returns for the conductors. Another lady was observed by a conductor who bears an excellent character, and who mentioned the circumstance to me, to carry a small bag, from which, whenever a passenger got out, she drew, not very deftly it would seem, a bean, and placed it in one glove, as ladies carry their sixpences for the fare, or a pea, and placed it in the other. This process, the conductor felt assured, was a check, that the beans indicated the long uns and the peas the short uns. So when the unhappy woman desired to be put down at the bottom of Cheapside on a wintry evening, he contrived to land her in the very thickest of the mud, handing her out with great politeness. I may here observe, before I enter upon the subject, that the men who have maintained a character for integrity regard the checks with great bitterness, as they naturally feel more annoyed at being suspected than men who may be dishonestly inclined. Another conductor once found a memorandum book in his omnibus in which were regularly entered the longs and shorts. One proprietor told me he had once employed religious men as conductors, but, said he, they grew into thieves. A Methodist parson engaged one of his sons to me, it's a good while ago, and was quite indignant that I ever made any question about the young man's honesty, as he was strictly and religiously brought up, but he turned out one of the worst 
of the whole batch of them. One check resorted to, as a conductor informed me, was found out by them. A lady entered the omnibus carrying a brown paper parcel loosely tied, and making a tear on the edge of the paper for every short passenger, and a deeper tear for every long. This difficulty in finding a cheque where an indefinite amount of money passes through a man's hands, and I am by no means disposed to undervalue the difficulty, has led to a summary course of procedure not unattended by serious evils. It appears that men are now discharged suddenly, at a moment's notice, and with no reason assigned. If a reason be demanded, the answer is, you are not wanted any longer. Probably the discharge is on account of the man's honesty being suspected. But whether the suspicion be well founded or unfounded, the consequences are equally serious to the individual discharged, for it is a rule observed by the proprietors not to employ any man discharged from another line. He will not be employed, I am assured, if he can produce a good character, and even if the thus he worked had been discontinued as no longer required on that route. You men who are considered unconnected with all versed in omnibus tricks are appointed, and this course, it was intimated to me very strongly, was agreeable to the proprietors for two reasons, as widely extending their patronage, and, as always, placing at their command a large body of unemployed men whose services can at any time be called into requisition at reduced wages, should slop drivers be desirable. It is next to impossible, I was further assured, for a man discharged from an omnibus to obtain other employ. If the director goes so far as to admit that he has nothing to allege against the man's character, he will yet give no reason for his discharge, and an inquirer naturally imputes the withholding of a reason to the mercy of the director. End of section 71section 72 of london labour and the london poor volume 3 by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry london omnibus drivers and conductors part 3 omnibus drivers the driver is paid by the week his remuneration is 34 shillings a week on most of the lines on others he receives 21 shillings and his box that is, the allowance of a fare each journey for a seat outside, if a seat be so occupied. In fine weather, this box plan is more remunerative to the driver than the fixed payment of 34 shillings, but in wet weather, he may receive nothing from the box. The average, then, the year through, is only 34 shillings a week, or perhaps rather more, as on some days in sultry weather, the driver may make six shillings, if the bus do twelve journeys, from his box. The omnibus drivers have been butchers, farmers, horse-breakers, cheesemongers, old stage-coachmen, broken-down gentlemen, turfmen, gentlemen servants, grooms, and a very small sprinkling of mechanics. Nearly all can read and write, the exception being described to me as a singularity. But there are such exceptions, and all must have produced good characters before their appointment. The majority of them are married men with families, their residences being in all parts, and on both sides of the Thames. I did not hear of any of the wives of coachmen in regular employ working for the slop tailors. We can keep our wives too respectable for that, one of them said in answer to my inquiry. Their children, too, are generally sent to school, frequently to the national schools. Their work is exceedingly hard, their lives being almost literally spent on the coach box. The most of them must enter the yard at a quarter to eight in the morning, and must see that the horses and carriages are in a proper condition for work, and at half-past eight they start on their long day's labour. They perform, I speak of the most frequented lines, twelve journeys during the day, and are so engaged until a quarter past eleven at night. Some are on their box till past midnight. 
During these hours of labour, they have 12 stops, half of 10 and half of 15 minutes duration. They generally breakfast at home or at a coffee shop, if unmarried men, before they start, and dine at the inn, where the omnibus almost invariably stops, at one or other of its destinations. If the driver be distant from his home at his dinner hour, or be unmarried, he arranges to dine at the public house. If near, his wife or one of his children brings him his dinner in a covered basin, some of them being provided with hot water plates to keep the contents properly warm, and that is usually eaten at the public house with a pint of beer for the accompanying beverage. The relish with which a man who has been employed several hours in the open air enjoys his dinner can easily be understood, but if his dinner is brought to him on one of his shorter trips, he often hears the cry before he has completed his meal, Time's up! and he carries the remains of his repast to be consumed at his next resting place. His tea, if brought to him by his family, he often drinks within the omnibus, if there be an opportunity. Some carry their dinners with them and eat them cold. All these men live well, that is, they have sufficient dinners of animal food every day with beer. They are strong and healthy men, for their calling requires both strength and health. Each driver, as well as the timekeeper and conductor, is licensed at a yearly cost to him of five shillings. From a driver, I had the following statement. I have been a driver 14 years. I was brought up as a builder, but had friends that was using horses, and I sometimes assisted them in driving and grooming when I was out of work. I got to like that sort of work and thought it would be better than my own business if I could get to be connected with a bus. And I had friends and first got employed as a timekeeper, but I've been a driver for 14 years. I'm now paid by the week and not by the box. It's a fair payment, but we must live well. It's hard work is mine, for I never have any rest but a few minutes, except every other Sunday, and then only two hours. That's the time of a journey there and back. If I was to ask leave to go to church and then go to work again, I know what answer there would be. You can go to church as often as you like, and we can get a man who doesn't want to go there. The cattle I drive are equal to gentlemen's carriage horses. One I've driven five years, and I believe she was worked five years before I drove her. It's very hard work for the horses, but I don't know that they are overworked in buses. The starting after stopping is the hardest work for them. It's such a terrible strain. I felt for the poor things on a wet night, with a bus full of big people. I think that it's a pity that anybody uses a bearing rein. There's not many uses it now. It bears up a horse's head, and he can only go on pulling, pulling up a hill one way. Take off his bearing rein, and he'll relieve the strain on him by bearing down his head and flinging his weight on the collar to help him pull. If a man had to carry a weight up a hill on his back, how would he like to have his head tied back? Perhaps you may have noticed Mr. Blank's horses pull the bus up Holborn Hill. They're tightly borne up, but then they are very fine animals, fat and fine. There's no such cattle, perhaps, in a London bus. Leastways, there's none better, and they're borne up for show. Now, a jib horse won't go in a bearing rein, and will without it. I've seen that myself. So what can be the use of it? It's just teasing the poor things for a sort of fashion. I must keep exact time at every place where a timekeeper is stationed. Not a minute's excused. There's a fine for the least delay. I can't say that it's often levied, but still we are liable to it. If I've been blocked... I must make up for the block by galloping, and if I'm seen to gallop, and anybody tells our people, I'm called over the coals. I must drive as quick with a thunder rain pelting in my face, and the roads in a muddle, and the horses starting. I can't call it shying, I have them too well in hand. At every flash, 
just as quick as if it was a fine hard road and fine weather. It's not easy to drive a bus, but I can drive, and must drive, to an inch. Yes, sir, to half an inch. I know if I can get my horse's heads through a space, I can get my splinter bar through. I drive by my pole, making it my centre. If I keep it fair in the centre, a carriage must follow, unless it's slippery weather, and then there's no calculating. I saw the first bus start in 1829. I heard the first bus called a Punch and Judy carriage, cause you could see the people inside without a frame. The shape was about the same as it is now, but bigger and heavier. A bus changes horses four or five times a day, according to the distance. There's no cruelty to the horses, not a bit. It wouldn't be allowed. I fancy that buses now pay the proprietors well. The duty was tuppence halfpenny a mile, and now it's a penny halfpenny. Some companies save twelve guineas a week by the doing away of toll gates. The establishing the thrupneys, the shortens, has put money in their pockets. I'm an unmarried man. A bus driver never has time to look out for a wife. Every horse in our stables has one day's rest in every four, but it's no rest for the driver. Omnibus Conductors The conductor, who is vulgarly known as the cad, stands on a small projection at the end of the omnibus, and it is his office to admit and set down every passenger, and to receive the amount of fare, for which amount he is, of course, responsible to his employers. He is paid four shillings a day, which he is allowed to stop out of the monies he receives. He fills up a waybill each journey with the number of passengers. I find that nearly all classes have given a quota of their number to the list of conductors. Among them are grocers, drapers, shopmen, barmen, printers, tailors, shoemakers, clerks, joiners, saddlers, coach builders, porters, town travellers, carriers, and fishmongers. Unlike the drivers, the majority of the conductors are unmarried men, but perhaps only a mere majority. As a matter of necessity, every conductor must be able to read and write. They are discharged more frequently than the drivers, but they require good characters before their appointment. From one of them, a very intelligent man, I had the following statement. I am 35 or 36, and have been a conductor for six years. Before that, I was a lawyer's clerk, and then a picture dealer, but didn't get on, though I maintained a good character. I'm a conductor now, but wouldn't be long behind a bus if it wasn't from necessity. It's hard to get anything else to do that you can keep a wife and family on, for people won't have you from off a bus. The worst part of my business is its uncertainty. I may be discharged any day and not know for what. If I did, and I was accused unjustly, I might bring my action, but it's merely you're not wanted. I think I've done better as a conductor in hot weather or fine weather than in wet, though I've got a good journey when it's come on showery, as people was starting for or starting from the city. I had one master who, when his bus came in full in the wet, used to say, This is prime. Them's God Almighty's customers. He sent them. I've heard him say so many a time. We get far more ladies and children too on a fine day. They go more shopping then, and of an evening they go more to public places. I pay over my money every night. It runs from 40 shillings to 4 pounds 4 shillings or a little more on extraordinary occasions. I have taken more money since the shortens were established. One day before that, I took only 18 shillings. There's three riders and more now, where there was two formerly, at the higher rate. I never get to a public place, whether it's a chapel or a playhouse, unless indeed I get a holiday, and that is once in two years. I've asked for a day's holiday and been refused. I was told I might take a week's holiday if I liked, or as long as I lived. I'm quite ignorant of what's passing in the world, 
my time's so taken up. We only know what's going on from hearing people talk in the bus. I never care to read the paper now, though I used to like it. If I have two minutes to spare, I'd rather take a nap than anything else. We know no more politics than the backwoodsmen of America, because we haven't time to care about it. I've fallen asleep on my step as the bus was going on and almost fallen off. I have often to put up with insolence from vulgar fellows who think it fun to chaff a cad, as they call it. There's no help for it. Our masters won't listen to complaints. If we are not satisfied, we can go. Conductors are a sober set of men. We must be sober. It takes every farthing of our wages to live well enough and keep a wife and family. I never knew but one teetotaler on the road. He's gone off it now, and he looked as if he was going off altogether. The other day a teetotaler on the bus saw me take a drink of beer, and he began to talk to me about its being wrong. But I drove him mad with argument, and the passengers took part with me. I live one and a half mile off the place I start from. In summer I sometimes breakfast before I start. In winter I never see my three children, only as they're in bed, and I never hear their voices if they don't wake up early. If they cry at night, it don't disturb me. I sleep so heavy after fifteen hours' work out in the air. My wife doesn't do anything but mind the family, and there's plenty to do with young children. My business is so uncertain. Why, I knew a conductor who found he had paid sixpence short. He had left it in a corner of his pocket, and he handed it over next morning, and was discharged for that. He was reckoned a fool. They say the sharper the man, the better the busman. There's a great deal in understanding the business, in keeping a sharp lookout for people's hailing, and in working the time properly. If the conductor's slow, the driver can't get along, and if the driver isn't up to the mark, the conductor's bothered. I've always kept time, except once, and that was in such a fog that I had to walk by the horse's heads with a link, and could hardly see my hand that held the link. And after all, I lost my bus. But it was all safe and right in the end. We're licensed now in Scotland Yard. They're far civiler there than in Lancaster Place. I hope, too, they'll be more particular in granting licences. They used to grant them day after day, and, I believe, made no inquiry. It'll be better now. I've never been fined. If I had, I should have to pay it out of my own pocket. If you plead guilty, it's five shillings. If not, and it's very hard to prove that you did display your badge properly, if the city policeman, there's always one on the lookout for us, swears you didn't, and summons you for that. Or if you plead not guilty, because you weren't guilty, you may pay one pound. I don't know of the cheques now, but I know there are such people. A man was discharged the other day, because he was accused of having returned three out of thirteen short. He offered to make oath he was correct, but it was of no use. He went. Omnibus Timekeepers Another class employed in the omnibus trade are the timekeepers. On some routes there are five of these men, on others four. The timekeeper's duty is to start the omnibus at the exact moment appointed by the proprietors and to report any delay or irregularity in the arrival of the vehicle. His hours are the same as those of the drivers and conductors, but as he is stationary, his work is not so fatiguing. His remuneration is generally 21 shillings a week, but on some stations more. He must never leave the spot. A timekeeper on Kennington Common has 28 shillings a week. He is employed 16 hours daily and has a box to shelter him from the weather when it is foul. He has to keep time for 40 buses. The men who may be seen in the great thoroughfares noting every omnibus that passes are not timekeepers. They are employed by government so that no omnibus may run on the line without paying the duty. A timekeeper made the following statement to me. I was a grocer's assistant 
but was out of place and had a friend who got me a timekeeper's office. I have twenty-one shillings a week. Mine's not hard work, but it's very tiring. You hardly ever have a moment to call your own. If we only had our Sundays, like other working men, it would be a grand relief. It would be very easy to get an odd man to work every other Sunday. But masters care nothing about Sundays. Some buses do stop running from eleven to one, but plenty keep running. Sometimes I am so tired of a night that I dare hardly sit down for fear I should fall asleep and lose my own time, and that would be to lose my place. I think timekeepers continue longer in their places than the others. We have nothing to do with money-taking. I am a single man and get all my meals at the blank inn. I dress my own dinners in the tap room. I have my tea brought to me from a coffee shop. I can't be said to have any home, just a bed to sleep in, as I'm never ten minutes awake in the house where I lodge. The odd men are, as their name imports, the men who are employed occasionally, or, as they term it, get odd jobs. These form a considerable portion of the unemployed. If a driver be ill or absent to attend a summons, or on any temporary occasion, the odd man is called upon to do the work. For this, the odd man receives tenpence a journey to and fro. One of them gave me the following account. I was brought up to a stable life, and had to shift for myself when I was seventeen, as my parents died then. It's nine years ago. For two or three years, till this few months, I drove a bus. I was discharged with a week's notice, and don't know for what. It's no use asking for a reason. I wasn't wanted. I've been put to shifts since then, and almost everything's pledged that could be pledged. I had a decent stock of clothes, but they're all at my uncle's. Last week I earned three shillings and fourpence, the week before one shilling and eightpence. But this week I shall do better, say five shillings. I have to pay one shilling and sixpence a week for my garret. I'm a single man and have nothing but a bed left in it now. I did live in a better place. If I didn't get a bite and sup now and then with some of my old mates, I think I couldn't live at all. Mine's a wretched life and a very bad trade. End of section 72section seventy three of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry hackney coaches and cabs part one hackney coach and cabmen i have now described the earnings and conditions of the drivers and conductors of the london omnibuses and I proceed in due order to treat of the Metropolitan Hackney Coach and Cabmen. In official language, an omnibus is a Metropolitan Stage Carriage, and a cab, a Metropolitan Hackney one, the legal distinction being that the stage carriages pursue a given route, and the passengers are mixed, while the fare is fixed by the proprietor, whereas the Hackney carriage plies for hire at an appointed stand, carries no one but the party hiring it, and the fare for so doing is regulated by law. It is an offence for the omnibus to stand still and ply for hire, whereas the driver of the cab is liable to be punished if he ply for hire while his vehicle is moving. According to the Occupation Abstract of 1841, the number of Coachmen, coach guards, and post boys in Great Britain at that time was fourteen thousand four hundred and sixty nine, of whom thirteen thousand and thirteen were located in England, one thousand one hundred and twenty three in Scotland, two hundred and ninety five in Wales, and only one hundred and thirty eight in the whole of the British Isles. The returns for the metropolis were as follows. Coach, cab, and omnibus owners, 650. Coachmen, coach and omnibus guards, and postboys, 
5,428. Grooms and ostlers, 2,780. Horse dealers and trainers, 246. Total, 9,104. In 1831, the number of coach owners, drivers, grooms and so on was only 1,322, and the horse dealers, stable, hackney coach or fly keepers, 655, or 2,047 in all. So that, assuming these returns to be correct, it follows that this class must have increased 7,027, or more than quadrupled itself in 10 years. The returns since the above-mentioned periods, however, show a still more rapid extension of the class. For these, I am again indebted to the courtesy of the Commissioners of Police, for whose consideration and assistance I have again to tender my warmest thanks. A return of the number of persons licensed as hackney drivers, stage drivers, conductors and watermen from the years 1843 to 1850. 1843. Hackney drivers, 4,627. Stage drivers, 1,740. Conductors, 1,854. Watermen, 371. Total, 8,592. 1844. Hackney drivers, 4,927. Stage drivers, 1,833. Conductors, 1,961. Watermen, 390. Total, 9,111. 1845. Hackney drivers, 5,199. Stage drivers, 1,825. Conductors, 1,930. Watermen, 363. Total, 9,317. 1846. Hackney drivers, 5,356. Stage drivers, 1,865. Conductors, 2,051. Watermen, 354. Total, 9,626. 1847. Hackney drivers, 5,109. Stage drivers, 1,830. Conductors, 2,009. Waterman, 342. Total, 9,290. 1848. Hackney drivers, 5,231. Stage drivers, 1,736. Conductors, 2,017. Waterman, 352. Total, 9,836. 1849. Hackney drivers, 5,487. Stage drivers, 1,731. Conductors, 2,026. Watermen, 375. Total, 9,619. 1850. Note, from 1st of May to 4th of September, inclusive. End note. Hackney drivers, 5,114. Stage drivers, 1,463. Conductors, 1,484. Watermen, 352. Total, 8,413. Total number of hackney drivers, 41,050. Total number of stage drivers, 14,023. Total number of conductors, 17,332. Total number of watermen, 2,899. Grand total, 73,804. By this, it will be seen that the drivers and conductors of the Metropolitan Stage and Hackney Carriages were in 1849 no less than 9,619, whereas in 1841, including coachmen of all kinds, guards and postboys, there were only 5,428 in the metropolis, so that within the last 10 years, the class, at the very least, must have more than doubled itself. Hackney Coaches and Cabs I shall now proceed to give an account of the rise and progress of the London Hackney Cabs 
as well as the decline and fall of the London hackney coaches. Nearly all the writers on the subject state that hackney coaches were first established in London in 1625, that they were not then stationed in the streets, but at the principal inns, and that their number grew to be considerable after the restoration. There seems to be no doubt that these conveyances were first kept at the inns and sent out when required, as to post chaises were, and are still, in country towns. It may very well be doubted, however, whether the year 1625 has been correctly fixed upon as that in which hackney carriages were established in London. It is so asserted in Macpherson's Annals of Commerce, but it is thus loosely and vaguely stated. Quote, Our historiographers of the City of London relate that it was in this year, 1625, that hackney coaches first began to ply in London streets, or rather at the inns, to be called for as they are wanted, and they were at this time only twenty in number. End quote. One of the city historiographers, however, if so he may be called, makes a very different statement. John Taylor, the waterman and the water poet, says in 1623, two years before the era usually assigned, quote, I do not inveigh against any coaches that belong to persons of worth and quality, but only against the caterpillar swarm of hirelings. They have undone my poor trade, whereof I am a member, and though I look for no reformation, yet I expect the benefit of an old proverb, give the losers leave to speak. This infernal swarm of trade spellers, note hackney coachmen, end note, have so overrun the land that we can get no living upon the water, for I dare truly affirm that in every day in any term, especially if the court be at Whitehall, they do rob us of our livings, and carry five hundred fares daily from us. End quote. Of the establishment of Hackney Coach Stands, we have a more precise account. The Reverend Mr. Garrard, writing to Lord Stafford in 1638, says, quote, Here is one Captain Bailey. He hath been a sea captain, but now lives on land, about this city, where he tries experiments. He hath erected, according to his ability, some four hackney coaches, put his men in livery, and appointed them to stand at the maypole in the strand, giving them instructions at what rate to carry men into several parts of the town, where all day they may be had. Other hackney men, seeing this way, they flocked to the same place, and perform the same journeys at the same rate, so that sometimes there is twenty of them together, which disperse up and down, that they and others are to be had everywhere, as watermen are to be had at the waterside. Everybody is much pleased with it. End quote. The site of the maypole that once o'erlooked the strand is now occupied by St. Mary's Church. There were after this many regulations passed for the better management of hackney coaches. In 1652, their number was ordered to be limited to 200. In 1654, to 300. In 1661, to 400. In 1694, to 700. These limitations, however, seem to have been but little regarded. Garrard, writing in 1638, says, quote, here is a proclamation coming forth about the reformation of hackney coaches and ordering of other coaches about London. 1,900 was the number of hackney coaches of London, bare lean jades, unworthy to be seen in so brave a city or to stand about a king's court. End quote. As within the last 27 years, when cabs and omnibuses were unknown, the number of hackney carriages was strictly limited to 1,200. It seems little likely that nearly two centuries earlier there should have been so many as 1,900. It is probable that glass and hackney coaches had been confounded somehow in the enumeration. It was not until the ninth year of Queen Anne's reign that an act was passed appointing commissioners for the licensing and superintending of hackney coachmen. 
prior to that they seem to have been regulated and licensed by the magistracy the act of anne authorized the number of hackney coaches to be increased to eight hundred but not until the expiration of the existing licenses in 1715. In 1771, there was again an additional number of hackney coach licenses granted, 1,000, which was made 1,200 in 1799. In the last mentioned year, a duty was for the first time placed on hired carriages of all descriptions. It was at first five shillings a week. But that sum was not long after raised to ten shillings a week to be paid in advance, while the license was raised from two pounds ten shillings to five pounds. The duties upon all hackney carriages is still maintained at the advanced rate. The hackney carriages, when their number became considerable after the restoration, were necessarily small, though drawn by two horses. The narrowness of the streets before the great fire and the wretched condition of the pavement rendered the use of large and commodious vehicles impossible. Davenant says of hackney carriages, quote, They are unusually hung and so narrow that I took them for sedans on wheels. End quote. The hackney coachman then rode one of his horses postillion fashion, but when the streets were widened, he drove from his seat on the box. In the latter days of London hackney coaches, they were large enough without being commodious. They were nearly all noblemen's and gentlemen's disused family coaches, which had been handed over to the coachmaker when a new carriage was made. But it was not long that these coaches retained the comfort and cleanliness that might distinguish them when first introduced into the stand. The horses were, as in the Reverend Mr. Garrard's time, sorry jades, sometimes cripples, and the harness looked as frail as the carriages. The exceptions to this description were few, for the hackney coachmen possessed a monopoly and thought it unchangeable. They were of the same class of men, nearly all gentlemen's servants or their sons. The obtaining of a licence for a hackney coach was generally done through interest. It was one way in which many peers and members of parliament provided for any favourite servant or for the servant of a friend. These patrons, whether peers or commoners, were not uncommonly called lords. A man was said to be sure of a licence if he had a great lord for his friend. The takings of the London hackney coachmen, as I have ascertained from some who were members of the body, were ten pounds ten shillings a week the year through, the months of May, June and July being the best when their earnings were from £15 to £18 a week. Out of this, three horses had to be maintained. During the war times, the quality of oats, which are now 18 shillings a quarter, were 60 shillings, while hay and the other articles of the horse's consumption were proportionately dear. The expense of repair to the coach or harness was but trifling, as they were generally done by the hackney man himself or by some hanger-on at the public houses frequented by the fraternity. Of the personal expenditure of hackney coachmen, when out for the day, I had the following statement from one of them. Quote, we spent regular seven shillings a day when we was out. It was before coffee shops and new-fangled ways came in as the regular thing that I am speaking of. Breakfast one shilling, good tea and good bread and butter, as much as you liked always, with a glass of rum in the last cup for the lacing of it. Always rum. Gin weren't so much run after then. Dinner was one shilling and sixpence. A cut off some good joint. Beer was included at some places and not at others. Any extras to follow was extras to pay. Two glasses of rum and water after dinner, one shilling. Pipes found, and most of us carried our own backy boxes. Tea, the same as breakfast, and laced ditto. Supper, the same as dinner, or sixpence less. And the rest, to make up the seven shillings, went for odd glasses of ale, or stout, or short. But short, note, neat spirits, end note, was far less drunk then than now, when we was waiting, or to treat a friend, or such like. We did some good in those days, sir. 
take day and night and one thousand two hundred of us was out and perhaps every man spent his seven shillings and that's one thousand two hundred times seven shillings end quote following out this calculation we have four hundred and twenty pounds per day and night two thousand nine hundred and forty pounds a week and one hundred and fifty two thousand eight hundred and eighty pounds a year for hackney coachmen's personal expenses merely as regards their board the old hackney coachman seem to have been a self-indulgent improvident rather than a vicious class neither do they seem to have been a drunken class they acted as ignorant men would naturally act who found themselves in the enjoyment of a good income with the protection of a legal monopoly they had the sole right of conveyance within the bills of mortality and as that important district comprised all the places of public resort and contained the great mass of the population they may be said to have had a monopoly of the metropolis even when the cabs were first established these men exhibited no fear of their earnings being affected but said an intelligent man who had been a hackney coachman in his younger days and who managed to avoid the general ruin of his brethren but when the cabs got to the one hundred then they found it out the cabs was all in gentlemen's hands at first i know that some of them was government clerks too they had their foreman to be sure but they was the real proprietors the gentlemen was they got the licenses well it's easy to understand how one hundred cabs was earning money fast and people couldn't get them fast enough and how some hundreds of hackney coachmen was waiting and starving till the trade was thrown open and then the hackney coachman was clean beat down they fell off by degrees i'm sure i hardly know what became of most of them but i do know that a many of them died in the workhouses they hadn't nothing aforehand they dropped away gradual you see they weren't allowed to transfer their plates and licenses to a cab or they'd have done it plenty would they were a far better set of men than there's on the cabs now there was none of your fancy men that's in with women of the town among the old hackney coachmen if you remember what they was sir you'll say they hadn't the cut of it the hackney coachman drove very deliberately rarely exceeding five and still more rarely achieving six miles an hour unless incited by the hope or the promise of an extra fare these men resided very commonly in mews and many of them i am assured had comfortable homes and were hospitable fellows in their way smoking their pipes with one another when off the stones treating their poorer neighbours to a glass and talking over the price of oats hay and horses as well as the product of the past season or the promise of the next the majority of them could neither read nor write or very imperfectly and as is not uncommon with uninformed men who had thriven tolerably well without education they cared little about providing education for their children politics they cared nothing about but they prided themselves on being john bull englishmen for public amusements they seem to have cared nothing our business said one of them was with the outside of playhouses i never saw a play in my life as my informant said they dropped away gradual eight or ten years ago a few old men with old horses and old coaches might be seen at street stands but each year saw their numbers reduced and now there is not one that is to say not one in the streets though there are four hackney coaches at the railway stations one of the old fraternity of hackney coachmen who had since the decline of his class prospered by devoting his exertions to another department of business gave me the following account my father said he was a hackney coachman before me and gave me what was then reckoned a good education i could write middling and could read the newspaper i've driven my father's coach for him when i was fourteen when i was old enough seventeen i think i was i had a hackney coach and horses of my own provided for me by my father and so was started in the world the first time i applied with my own coach was when sir francis burdett was sent to the tower from his house in piccadilly 
Sir Francis was all the go then. I heard a hackney coachman say he would be glad to drive him for nothing. The hackney coachman didn't like Pitt. I've heard my father and his mates say many a time, D blank N Pitt. That was for doubling of the duty on hackney carriages. Ah, the old times was their rackety times. I've often laughed and said that I could say what perhaps nobody, or almost nobody in England can say now, that I had been driven by a king. He grew to be a king afterwards, George the Fourth. One night, you see, sir, I was called off the stand and told to take up at the British Coffee House in Coxpur Street. I was a lad then, and when I pulled up at the door, the waiter ran out and said, You jump down and get inside. The prince is a-going to drive hisself. I didn't much like the notion on it, but I didn't exactly know what to do, and was getting off my seat to see if the waiter had put anything inside, for he let down the glass. And just as I was getting down, and had my foot on the wheel, out came the Prince of Wales, and four or five rattle-brained fellows like himself. I think Major Hanger was one, but I had hardly time to see them, for the Prince gripped me by the ankle and the waistband of my breeches, and lifted me off the wheel, and flung me right into the coach, through the window, and it was opened, as it happened, luckily. I was little then, but he must have been a strong man. He didn't seem so very drunk, either. The prince wasn't such a bad driver. Indeed, he drove very well for a prince. But he didn't take the corners or the crossings careful enough for a regular jarvey. Well, sir, the prince drove that night to a house in King Street, St. James's. There was another gentleman on the box with him. It was a gaming house he went to that night. But I have driven him to other sorts of houses in that there neighbourhood. He hadn't no pride to such as me, hadn't the Prince of Wales. Then one season I used to drive Lord Barrymore in his rounds to the brothels, twice or thrice a week sometimes. He used always to take his own wine with him. After waiting till near daylight, or till daylight, I've carried my lords, girls and all, fine dressed up madams, to Billingsgate, and there I've left them to breakfast at some queer place, or to slang with the fishwives. What times them was, to be sure. One night I drove Lord Barrymore to Mother Cummins in Lyle Street, and when she saw who it was, she swore out of the window that she wouldn't let him in. He and some such rackety fellows had broken so many things the last time they were there, and had disgraced her, as she called it, to the neighbourhood. So my lord said, Knock at the door, tiger, and knock till they open it. He knocked and knocked till every drop of water in the house was emptied over us, out of the windows. But my lord didn't like to be beaten, so he stayed and stayed. But Mother Cummins wouldn't give way, and at last he went home. A wet opera night was the chance for us when Madame, I forget her name, Catalini? Yes, I think that was it, was performing. Many a time I've heard it sung out, A guinea to Portman Square, and I've had it myself. At the time I'm speaking of, Hackney Coachman took thirty shillings a day, all the year round. Why, I myself have taken sixteen pounds and eighteen pounds a week through May, June and July. But then, you see, sir, we had a monopoly. It was in the old Tory times. Our number was limited to one thousand two hundred, and no stage carriage could then take up or set down on the stones, not within the bills, as it was called. That's the bills of mortality, three miles round the Royal Exchange, if I remember right. It's a monopoly that shouldn't have been allowed, I know that, but there was grand earnings under it. No glass coaches could take people to the play then. Glass coaches is what's now called flies. They couldn't set down on the mortality. It was fine and imprisonment to do it. We hadn't such good horses in our coaches then, as is now in the streets, certainly not. It was wartime, and horses was bought up for the cavalry, and it's the want of horses for the army, and for the mails and stages afterwards. That's the reason of such good horses being in the buses and cabs. We drove always noblemen or gentlemen's old carriages, family coaches, they were sometimes called. There was mostly arms and coronets on them. We got them off the coachmakers in Longacre, who took the noblemen's old carriages when they made new. The Duke of Blank complained once that his old carriage, with his arms painted beautiful on the panels, 
was plying in the streets at a shilling a mile. His arms ought not to be degraded that way, he said. So the coachmaker had the coach new painted. When the cabs first came in, we didn't think much about it. We thought, that is, most of us did, that things was to go on in the old way forever. But it was found out in time that it was not. When the Clarences, the cabs that carry four, come in, they cooked the hackney coachman in no time. End of section 73section seventy four of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry hackney coaches and cabs part two introduction of cabs for the introduction of hackney cabriolets a word which it now seems almost pedantic to use we are indebted as for the introduction of the omnibuses to the example of the Parisians. In 1813, there were 1,150 cabriolets de place upon the hackney stands of Paris. In 1823, ten years later, there were 12 upon the hackney stands of London. But the vested right of the hackney coachman was an obstacle. Messrs Bradshaw and Roch, however, did manage in 1823 to obtain licenses for 12 cabriolets starting them at eightpence a mile. The number was subsequently increased to 50 and then to 100, and in less than nine years after the first cab plied in the streets of London, all restriction as to their number was abolished. The form of cab first in use was that of a hooded chaise, the leather head or hood being raised or lowered at pleasure. In wet windy weather, however, it was found when raised to present so great a resistance to the progress of the horse that the head was abandoned. In these cabs, the driver sat inside, the vehicle being made large enough to hold two persons and the cabman. The next kind had a detached seat for the driver alongside his fare. On the third sort, the driver occupied the roof, the door opening at the back. These were called back door cabs. The covered cab, carrying two inside with the driver on a box in front, was next introduced, and it was a safer conveyance, having four wheels. The preceding cabs had but two. The Clarences, carrying four inside, came next, and almost at the same time with them, the Hansoms, which are always called chauffeurs by the cabmen. Chauffeur in slang means counterfeit, and the chauffeur cabs are an infringement on Hansom's patent. There are now no cabs in use but the two last mentioned. A Clarence built in the best manner costs from £40 to £50. A good horse to draw it is worth £18 to £20, and the harness £4.10 10 shillings to £5. This is the fair price of the carriage and harness when new, and from a good shop. But second-hand cabs and harness are sold and resold and are repaired or fitted up by jobbing coachmakers. Nearly all the greater cab proprietors employ a coach builder on their premises. A cab horse has been purchased in Smithfield for 40 shillings. Some of the cabmen have their own horse and vehicle, while others, and the great majority, rent a cab and horse from the proprietor and pay him so much a day or night having for their remuneration all they can obtain for the amount of rent. The rent required by the most respectable masters is 14 shillings in the season. Out of the season, the best masters expect the drivers to bring home about 9 shillings a day. For this sum, two good horses are found to each cab. Some of the cab proprietors, especially a class known as contractors or Westminster masters, of whom a large number are Jews, make the men hiring their cabs sign for 16 shillings a day in the season and 12 shillings out of it. This system is called signing instead of agreeing or any similar term because the 6th and 7th Victoria provides that no sum shall be recovered from drivers on account of the earnings of any hackney carriage unless under an agreement in writing signed in presence of a competent witness. The steadiest and most trusty men in the cab-driving trade, however, refuse to sign for a stipulated sum, 
as in case of their not earning so much they may be compelled summarily and with the penalties of fine and imprisonment to pay that stipulated sum i was informed by a highly respectable cab proprietor that in the season twelve shillings and sixpence a day would be a fair sum to sign for and nine shillings or even less out of the season in this my informant cannot be mistaken for he has practical experience of cab driving he himself often driving on an emergency there are plenty however who will sign for sixteen shillings and the consequence of this branch of the contract system is that the men so contracting resort to any means to make their guinea they drive swell mobsmen they are connected with women of the town they pick up and prey upon drunken fellows in collusion with these women and resort to any knavery to make up the necessary sum on this subject i give below the statement of an experienced proprietor character of cab drivers among the present cab drivers are to be found as i learned from trustworthy persons quondam greengrocers costermongers jewellers clerks broken-down gentlemen especially turf gentlemen carpenters joiners saddlers coach-builders grooms stable helpers footmen shopkeepers pickpockets swell mobsmen housebreakers innkeepers musicians musical instrument makers ostlers some good scholars a good number of broken-down pawnbrokers several ex-policemen draper's assistants barmen scene shifters one baronet and as my informant expressed it such an uncommon sight of folks that it would be uncommon hard to say what they was of the truthfulness of the list of callings said to have contributed to swell the numbers of the cabmen there can be no doubt but i am not so sure of the baronet i was told his name but i met with no one who could positively say that he knew sir v c as a cab driver this baronet seems a tradition among them others tell me that the party alluded to is merely nicknamed the baron owing to his being a person of good birth and having had a college education the flashiest cabman as he is termed is the son of a fashionable master tailor he is known among cab drivers as the numparay and drives one of the handsome cabs i am informed on excellent authority a tenth or to speak beyond the possibility of cavil a twelfth of the whole number of cab drivers are fancy men these fellows are known in the cab trade by a very gross appellation they are the men who live with women of the town and are supported wholly or partially on the wages of the women's prostitution these are the fellows who for the most part are ready to pay the highest price for the hire of their cabs one swell mobsman i was told had risen from signing for cabs to become a cab proprietor but was now a prisoner in france for picking pockets the worst class of cabmen which as i have before said are but a twelfth of the whole live in granby street st andrew's place and similar localities of the waterloo road in union street pearl row and so on of the borough road in princes street and others of the london road in some unpaved streets that stretch from the new kent road to lock's fields in the worst parts of westminster in the vicinity of drury lane whitechapel and of lisson grove and wherever low depravity flourishes to get on a cab i was told and that is the regular phrase is the ambition of more loose fellows than for anything else as it's reckoned both an idle life and an exciting one whetstone park is full of cabmen but not wholly of the fancy man class the better sort of cabmen usually reside in the neighbourhood of the cab proprietors yards which are in all directions some of the best of these men are or rather have been mechanics and have left a sedentary employment which affected their health for the open air of the cab business others of the best description have been connected with country inns but the majority of them are london men they are most of them married and bringing up families decently on earnings of from fifteen shillings to twenty-five shillings a week some few of their wives work with their needles for the tailors 
Some of the cab yards are situated in what were old inn yards, or the stable yards attached to great houses, when great houses flourished in parts of the town that are now accounted vulgar. One of those I saw in a very curious place. I was informed that the yard was once Oliver Cromwell's stable yard. It is now a receptacle for cabs. There are now two long ranges of wooden erections, black with age, each carriage house opening with large folding doors, fastened in front with padlocks, bolts and hasps. In the old carriage house are the modern cabs, and mixed with them are superannuated cabs, and the disjointed or worn-out bodies and wheels of cabs. Above one range of the buildings, the red-tiled roofs of which project a yard and more beyond the exterior, are apartments occupied by the stable keepers and others. Nasturtiums, with their light green leaves and bright orange flowers, were trained along light trellis work in front of the windows, and presented a striking contrast to the dinginess around. Of the cab drivers there are several classes, according to the times at which they are employed. They are known in the trade by the names of the long day men, the morning men, the long night men, and the short night men, and the bucks. The long day man is the driver who is supposed to be driving his cab the whole day. He usually fetches his cab out between nine and ten in the morning, and returns at four or five, or even seven or eight the next morning. Indeed, it is no matter at what hour he comes in, so long as he brings the money that he signs for. The long day men are mostly employed for the contractors, though some of the respectable masters work their cabs with long day men, but then they leave the yard between eight and nine, and are expected to return between twelve and one. These drivers, when working for the contractors, sign for sixteen shillings a day in the season, as before stated, and twelve shillings out of the season and when employed by the respectable masters, they are expected to bring home 14 shillings or 9 shillings, according to the season of the year. The long day men are the parties who mostly employ the bucks, or unlicensed drivers. They are mostly out with their cabs from 16 to 20 hours, so that their work becomes more than they can constantly endure, and they are consequently glad to avail themselves of the services of a buck for some hours at the end of the day, or rather night. The morning man generally goes out about seven in the morning, and returns to the yard at six in the evening. Those who contract sign to bring home from ten shillings to eleven shillings per day in the season, and seven shillings for the rest of the year, while those working for the better class of masters are expected to give the proprietor eight shillings a day, and five shillings or six shillings, according to the time of the year. The morning man has only one horse found him, whereas the long day man has two, and returns to the yard to change horses between three and six in the afternoon. The long night man goes out at six in the evening, and returns at ten in the morning. He signs, when working for contractors, for seven shillings or eight shillings per night, at the best time of the year, and five shillings or six shillings at the bad. The rent required by the good masters differs scarcely from these sums. He has only one horse found him. The short night man fetches his cab out at six in the evening and returns at six in the morning, bringing with him six shillings in the season and four or five shillings out of it. The contractors employ scarcely any short night men, while the better masters have but few long day or long night men working for them. It is only such persons as the Westminster masters who like the horses or the men to be out so many hours together, and they, as my informant said, don't care what becomes of either, so long as the day's money is brought to them. The bucks are unlicensed cab drivers who are employed by those who have a license to take charge of the cab while the regular drivers are at their meals or enjoying themselves. These bucks are generally cabmen who have been deprived of their licence through bad conduct, and who now pick up a living by rubbing up, that is, polishing the brass of the cabs, on the rank, and giving out buck, as it is called amongst the men. They usually loiter about the watering houses, the public houses, of the cab stands, and pass most of their time in the tap rooms. They are mostly of intemperate habits, being generally confirmed sots. Very few of them are married men. They have been fancy men in their prime, but, to use the words of one of the craft, 
got turned up. They seldom sleep in a bed. Some few have a bedroom in some obscure part of the town, but the most of them loll about and doze in the tap rooms by day and sleep in the cabs by night. When the watering houses close, they resort to the night coffee shops and pass the time there till they are wanted as bucks. When they take a job for a man, they have no regular agreement with the driver, but the rule is that they shall do the best they can. If they take two shillings, they give the driver one and keep the other for themselves. If one shilling and sixpence, they usually keep only sixpence. The Westminster men have generally got their regular bucks, and these mostly take to the cab with the second horse and do all the night work. At three or four in the morning, they meet the driver at some appointed stand or watering place. Burley Street in the Strand, or Palace Yard, are the favourite places of rendezvous of the Westminster men, and then they hand over to the long day man, the stuff, as they call it. The regular driver has no check upon these men, but unless they do well, they never employ them again. For rubbing up the cabs on the stand, these bucks generally get sixpence in the season, and for this they are expected to dish clout the whole of the panels, clean the glasses, and polish the harness and brasses, the cab driver having to do these things himself, or having to pay for it. Some of the bucks, in the season, will make from two shillings to two shillings and sixpence a day by rubbing up alone, and it is difficult to say what they make by driving. They are the most extortionate of all cab drivers. For a shilling fare they will generally demand two shillings, and for a three shilling fare they will get five shillings or six shillings, according to the character of the party driven. Having no licences, they do not care what they charge. If the number of the cab is taken, and the regular driver of it summoned, the party overcharged is unable to swear that the regular driver was the individual who defrauded him, and so the case is dismissed. It is supposed that the bucks make quite as much money as the drivers, for they are not at all particular as to how they get their money. The great majority, indeed 99 out of 100, have been in prison, and many more than once, and they consequently do not care about revisiting jail. It is calculated that there are at least 800 or 1,000 bucks hanging about the London cab stands, and these are mostly regular thieves. If they catch any person asleep or drunk in a cab, they are sure to have a dive into his pockets nor are they particular if the party belong to their own class, for I am assured that they steal from one another while dozing in the cabs or tap rooms. Very few of the respectable masters work their cabs at night, except those who do so merely because they have not stable room for the whole of their horses and vehicles at the same time. Some of the cab drivers are the owners of the vehicles they drive, it is supposed that, out of the 5,000 drivers in London, at least 2,000, or very nearly half, are small masters, and they are amongst the most respectable men of the ranks. Of the other half of the cab drivers, about 1,500 are long-day men, and about 150 long-night men. There are only a few yards, and they are principally at Islington, that employ long-night men. Of the morning men and the short night men, there are, as near as I can learn, about 500 belonging to each class, in addition to the small masters. The Waterman The Waterman is an important officer at the cab stand. He is indeed the master of the rank. At some of the larger stands, such as that at the London and Birmingham railway terminus, there are four watermen, two being always on duty day and night. 15 hours by day and 9 by night, the day waterman becoming the night waterman the following week. On the smaller stands, two men do this work, changing their day and night labour in the same way. The waterman must see that there is no fouling in the rank, that there is no straggling or crowding, but that each cab maintains its proper place. He is also bound to keep the best order he can among the cabmen and to restrain any ill usage of the horses. The waterman's remuneration consists in the receipt of a penny from every cabman who joins his rank, for which the cabman is supplied with water for his horse and a halfpenny for every cabman who is hired off the rank. 
there are now three hundred and fifty odd watermen and they must be known as trusty men a rigid inquiry being instituted and unexceptional references demanded before an appointment to the office takes place at some stands the supply of water costs these officers four pounds a year at others the trustees of the waterworks or the parishes supply it gratuitously all the watermen i am informed on good authority have been connected with the working part of it they must all be able to read and write for as one of them said to me we are expected to understand acts of parliament they are generally strong big-boned red-faced men civil and honest married with very few exceptions and bringing up families they are great readers of newspapers, and in these they devote themselves, first of all, to the police reports. One of the body said, I have been a good many years a waterman, but was brought up a coach builder in a London firm. I then got into the cab trade, and am now a waterman. I make my twenty-four shillings a week the year through. But there stands, to my knowledge, where the waterman doesn't make more than half as much, and that for a man that's expected to be respectable. He can give his children a good schooling, can't he, sir, on twelve shillings a week, and the best of keep, to be sure. Why, my comings in, it's a hard fight for me to do as much. I have eight children, sir. I pay sixteen pounds a year for three tidy rooms in a mews. That's rather more than six shillings a week. But I have the carriage place below, and that brings me in a little. Six of my children don't earn a halfpenny now. My eldest daughter, she's seventeen, earns sixpence a day from a slop tailor. I hate to see her work, work, work away, poor lass, but it's a help, and it gets them bits of clothes. Another boy earns sixpence a day from a coach builder, and lives with me. Another daughter would try her hand at shirt making, and got work from a shirt maker near Tabernacle Square, and in four days and a half she made five bodies, and they came to one shilling and ten pence halfpenny and out of that she had to pay sevenpence halfpenny for her thread and that, and so there was one shilling and threepence for her hard work. But they gave satisfaction, her employer said, as if that was a grand comfort to her mother and me. But I soon put a stop to that. I said, come, come, I'll keep you at home, and manage somehow or anyhow, rather than you shall pull your eyes out of your head, for threepence halfpenny a day and less, so it's no more shirts. Why, sir, the last time bread was dear. 1847, was it? I paid 19 shillings and 20 shillings a week for bread. It's now about half what it was then. Rather more, though. But there's one thing's a grand thing for poor men, and that's such prime and such cheap fish. The railways have done that. In Tottenham Court Road, my wife can buy good soles, as many pairs for sixpence of a night, as would have been three shillings and sixpence before railways. That's a great luxury for a poor man like me, that's fonder of fish than meat. They are a queer set we have to do with in the ranks. The pounces, note the class I have alluded to as fancy men, called pounces by my present informant, end note, are far the worst. They sometimes try to bilk me, and it's always hard to get your dues from contractors. That's the men what sign for heavy figures. Credit them once, and you're never paid, never. None signs for so much as the Pounces. They'd sign for eighteen shillings. Why, if a Pounces girl, or a girl he knows, seems in luck, as they call it, that is, if she picks up a gentleman, particular if he's drunk, the Pouncey, I've seen it many a time, jumps out of the ranks, for he keeps a lookout for the spoil, and he drives to her. It's the Pounces, too, that mostly go gagging where the girls walk. It's such a set we have to deal with. Only yesterday, an out-and-out pouncy called me such names about nothing. Why, it's shocking for any female that may be passing. Aye, and off a busy night in the market, note, haymarket, end note, when it's an opera night and a play night, the gentleman's coachman's as bad for bad language as the cabman. And some gentlemen's very clever at that sort of language, too. It's not as it was in Lord Blank's days. Swells now think as much of one shilling as they did of twenty then. But there's some swells left still. One young swell brings four quarts of gin out of a public house in a pail, and the cabman must drink it out of pint pots. 
he's quite master of bad language if they don't drink fairly another swell gets a gallon of gin always from carters and cabmen must drink it out of quart pots no other way it makes some of them mad drunk and makes them drive like mad for they might be half drunk to begin with thank god no man can say he's seen me incapable from liquor for four-and-twenty years there's no racketeer place in the world than the market houses open all night and people going there after vauxhall and them places after a masquerade at vauxhall i've seen cabmen drinking with lords and gentlemen but such lords get fewer every day and cockney tars that was handy with their fists wanting to fight highlanders that wasn't and the girls in all sorts of dresses here and there and everywhere among them the paint off and their dresses torn sometimes cabmen assaults us my mates have been twice whipped lately i haven't because i know how to humour their liquor i give them fair play and more than that perhaps as i get my living out of them any customer can pick his own cab but if i'm told to call one or none's picked the first on the rank that's the rule gets the fare i take my meals at a coffee shop and my mate takes a turn for me when i'm at dinner and so do i for him my coffee shop cuts up one hundred and fifty pounds a meat a day chiefly for cabmen a dinner is sixpence halfpenny without beer meat fourpence bread a penny vegetables a penny and waiter a halfpenny at least i give him a halfpenny at blank's public house i can dine capitally for eightpence halfpenny and that includes a pint of beer on sundays there's a dessert of puddings and then it's one shilling a waterman's berth when it's one of the best isn't so good i fancy as a privileged cabman's end of section seventy four Section 75 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Hackney Coaches and Cabs, Part 3. Suggestions for Regulating the Trade. I shall now conclude with some statements of sundry evils connected with the cab business, under the old and also under the new system and shall then offer suggestions for their rectification one cab proprietor after expressing his opinion that the new police arrangements for the regulation of the trade would be a decided improvement suggested it would be an excellent plan to make policemen of the watermen for then he said the cabmen thieves would be reluctant to approach the ranks he also gave me the following statement of what he considered would be greater improvements i think he said it would do well for those in the cab trade if licenses were made ten pounds instead of five pounds with a regulation that five pounds should be returned to any one on bringing his plates in previous to leaving the trade and so not wanting his license any longer this would i believe be a check to any illegal transfer as men wouldn't be so ready to hand over their plates to other parties when they disposed of their cabs if they were sure of five pounds in a regular and legal way i would also he said reduce the duty from ten shillings a week to five shillings and that would allow cabs to ply for sixpence a mile as everything is cheaper i wonder people don't want cheaper cabs Buses don't at all answer the purpose, for if it's a wet day, almost everyone has to walk some way to his bus, and some way to the house he's going to, Sunday visitors particularly, and they like the wet least of all. Now, if cabs ran at sixpence, they could take a man and his wife and two children, and more, two miles for one shilling, or four miles for two shillings, about what the buses would charge four persons for those distances and the persons could go from door to door as cheap or if not quite so cheap they'd save it in not having their clothes spoiled by the weather and go far more comfortably than in a bus full of wet people and dripping umbrellas i know most cabmen don't like to hear of this plan and why because by the present system they reckon upon getting a shilling a mile and they almost always do get it for an eightpence fare and for longer distances oft enough 
but it wouldn't be so easy to overcharge when there's a fixed coin a mile for the fare. It would be one, two, three, four, five, or as many sixpences as miles. Now it's one shilling and fourpence for two miles, and that's one shilling and sixpence to one shilling and eightpence for over two miles, and that means two shillings. Of course, cabmen don't carry change unless for an even sum. Two shillings and fourpence for over three miles and a half, and that's two shillings and sixpence, if not three shillings, and so on. The odd coppers make cabmen like the present way. I now give a statement concerning foul plates and informers. It may, however, be necessary to state first that every cab proprietor must be licensed at a cost to him of five pounds, and that he must affix a plate with his number and so on to his cab to show that he is duly licensed, while every driver and waterman is licensed at a cost to each of five shillings a year and is bound to wear a metal ticket showing his number. The law then provides that in case of unavoidable necessity, which must be proved to the satisfaction of the magistrate, a proprietor may be allowed to employ an unlicensed person for 24 hours. With this exception, every unlicensed person acting as driver and every licensed person lending his license or permitting any other person to use or wear his ticket is to be fined five pounds. The same provision applies to any proprietor lending his license, but with a penalty of ten pounds. I now give the statement. You see, sir, if a man wants to dispose of his cab, why, he must dispose of it as a cab. Well, if it ain't answered for him, he'll get somebody or other willing to try it on. And the new hand will say, I'll give you so much and work your plates for you. And so he does when a bargain's made. Well, this thing's gone on till there's 1,000 or 1,200 foul plates in the trade. And then government says, what a lot of foul plates. There must be a check to this. And a nice check they found. Mr. Blank, continued my informant, laying a peculiar emphasis on the Mr. The informer was set to work, and he soon ferreted out the foul plates, and there was a few summonses about them at first, but it's managed different now. Suppose I had a foul plate in my place here, though in course I wouldn't, but suppose I had. Mr. Blank would drop in some day and look about him, and say little or nothing, but it's known what he's up to. In a day or two comes Mr. Blank number two. He's Mr. Blank number one's friend. And he'll look about and say, Oh, Mr. Blank, I see you've got so-and-so. It's a foul plate. I'll call on you for two shillings in a day or two. He calls, sure enough. And he calls for the same money, perhaps, every three months. Some pays him five shillings a year regular. And if he only gets that on 1,000 plates, he makes a good living off it. Only 250 pounds a year. Five pounds a week, that's all. In course, Mr. Blank number one has nothing to do with Mr. Blank number two, not he. It's always Mr. Blank number two what's paid, and never Mr. Blank number one. But if Mr. Blank number two ain't paid, then Mr. Blank number one looks in and lets you know there may be a hearing about the foul plate. And so he goes on. This same Mr. Blank number one, I'm informed by another cab proprietor, is employed by the excise to see after the duty which has to be paid every month. Should the proprietor be behind with the ten shillings a week, the informer is furnished with a warrant for the month's money, and this he requires a fee of from ten shillings to one pound, according to the circumstances of the proprietor, to hold over for a short time. It is difficult to estimate how many fees are obtained in this way every month, but I am assured that they must amount to something considerable in the course of the year. It is proper that I should add that my informants in this and other matters refer to the systems with which they had been long familiar. The new regulations, when I was engaged in this inquiry, had been so recently in force that the cab proprietors said they could not yet judge of their effect, but it was believed that they would be beneficial. 
an experienced man complained to me that the clashing of the magistrate's decisions especially when the police were mixed up with the complaints against cabmen was an evil my informant also pointed out a clause in the 2d and 3d victoria cap 71 enacting that magistrates should meet once a quarter each furnishing a report of his proceedings as respects the act for regulating the police courts in the metropolis such a meeting and a comparison of the reports might tend to a uniformity in decisions but the clause i am told is a dead letter no such meeting taking place another cab proprietor said it would be a great improvement if an authorised officer of the police or a government officer had the fixing of plates on carriages together with the inspection and superintendence of them afterwards these plates it was further suggested to me should be metallic seals and easily perceptible inside or out some of the cab proprietors complain of the stands in oxford street the best in all london they say being removed to out-of-the-way places among the matters i heard complained of that of privileged cabs was much dwelt upon these are the cabs which are privileged to stand within a railway terminus waiting to be hired on the arrival of the trains for this privilege two shillings a week is paid by the cabmen to some of the railway companies and as much as five shillings a week to others the cabmen complain of this as a monopoly established to their disadvantage and with no benefit to the public but merely to the railway companies for there are cab stands adjacent to all the railway stations at which the public would be supplied with conveyances in the ordinary way the horses in the cabs at the railway stations are, I am informed, amongst the hardest worked of any in London, the following case being put to me. Quote, Suppose a man takes a fare of four persons and heavy luggage from the Great Western Terminus to Mile End, which is near upon seven miles. He must then hurry back again all the way, because he plies only at the railway. Now, if he didn't, he would go to the nighest cab stand and his horse would be far sooner relieved. Then, perhaps, he gets another fare to Finsbury, and must hurry back again, and then another below Brompton, and he may live at Whitechapel, and have to go home, after all, so that his poor horse gets bashed to bits. Another cab proprietor furnished me with the following statement, in writing, of his personal experience and observation concerning the working of the 23D clause in the Hackney Carriage Act or that concerning the signing before alluded to. Quote, a master is in want of drivers. A, B and C apply. The only questions asked are, are you a driver? Where is your license? Well, here, sign this paper. My money is so much. In very few large establishments is more caution used as to real character of the driver than this the effect of which is that a man with a really good character has no better claim to employment than one of the worst. Then, as to the feeling of a man who has placed himself under such a contract, I must get my money, he says, I will do anything to obtain it, and as a jail hangs over my head, what matters about my breaking the law? And so every unfair trick is resorted to, and the means used are gagging, that is to say, driving about and loitering in the thoroughfares for jobs. It is known that some men very seldom put on the ranks at all. Some masters have told their drivers not to go on the stand, as they well know that the money is not to be obtained by what is termed ranking it. Now, the effect of this is that the thoroughfares are troubled with empty cabs. It has also this effect. It causes great cruelty and overdriving to the horses and drivers under such circumstances frequently agree to go for very much less than the fare, and then, as they term it, take it out by insulting and bullying their customers. It may be said that the law in force is sufficient to counteract this, but it may not be known that a great many protection clubs exist by contributions from cabmen, and which clubs are, in fact, premiums for breaking the law for by them a man is born harmless of the consequences of being fined. Now these clubs exist sometimes at public houses, 
but in many cases in the proprietor's yards, the proprietors themselves being treasurers, and so becoming agents to induce their servants to infringe the law for the purpose of obtaining for themselves a large return. The moral consequence of all this is that men being dealt with and made to suffer as criminals, that is to say, being sent to jail to experience the same treatment, save indignity, as convicted felons, and all this for what they after all believe to be a debt, a simple contract between man and man. The consequence, I repeat, is that the driver, having served his time, as it is called, in prison, returns to the trade a degraded character and a far worse man. Be it observed also that the fact of a driver having been imprisoned is no barrier to his being employed again, if he will but sign. That's the test. End quote. Account of Crime Amongst Cabmen I have now but to add a comparative statement of the criminality of the London coach and cabmen in relation to that of other callings. The Metropolitan Criminal Returns show us that crime among this class has been on the decline since 1840. In that year, the number taken into custody by the London police was 1,319, from which time until 1843 there was a gradual decrease when the number of coach and cabmen taken into custody was 820. After this, the numbers fluctuated slightly, till in 1848 there were 972 individuals arrested for various infractions of the law. For the chief offences given in the police returns, I find, upon taking the average for the last ten years, that the criminality of the London coach and cabmen stands as follows. For murder, there has been annually one individual in every 29,710 of this body taken into custody. For manslaughter, one in every 2,829. For rape, one in 8,488. For common assaults, one in 40. For simple larceny, one in 92. For willful damage, one in 285. For uttering counterfeit coin, one in 612. For drunkenness, one in 46. For vagrancy, one in 278. For the whole of the offences mentioned in the returns, one in every five of their number. On comparing these results with the criminality of other classes, we arrive at the following conclusions. The tendency of the metropolitan coach and cabmen for murder is less than that of the weavers, who appear to have the greatest propensity of all classes to commit this crime, as well as sailors, who are the next criminal in this respect, and labourers, sawyers and carpenters. On the other hand, however, the coach and cabmen would seem to be more inclined to this species of atrocity than the turners, coachmakers, shoemakers and tailors. The latter, according to the Metropolitan Police Returns for the last 10 years, being the least murderous of all classes. For manslaughter, the coach and cabmen have a stronger predisposition than any other class that I have yet estimated. The average crime in this respect for 10 years is 1 in 20,000 individuals of the entire population of London, whereas the average for the same period among the London coach and cabmen has been as high as one in every 2,800 of their trade. In rape, they rank less criminal than the labourers, carpenters and weavers, but still much higher than the general average, and considerably above the tailors, sawyers, turners, shoemakers or coachmakers. In the matter of common assaults, they stand the highest of all, even the labourers being less pugnacious than they. Their honesty seems, nevertheless, to be greater than common report gives them credit for, they being, according to the same returns, less disposed to commit simple larceny than either labourers, sailors or weavers, though far more dishonest than the generality of the London population. Nor are they so intemperate as, from the nature of their calling, we should be led to imagine. 
The sailors, who seem to form the most drunken of all trades, there being one in every thirteen of that body arrested for this offence, and the labourers, who come next, are both much more addicted to intoxication than the coach and cabmen, although the latter class appear to be nearly twice as intemperate as the rest of the people, the general average being one drunkard in every eighty-one of the entire residents of the metropolis, and one in every forty-six of the London coach and cabmen. Hence it may be said that the great vices of the class at present under consideration are a tendency to manslaughter and assault. The cause of this predisposition to violence against the person on the part of the London coach and cabmen I leave others to explain. End of section 75section seventy six of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry carmen and porters part one having dealt with the social condition of the conductors and drivers of the london omnibuses and cabs i now in due order proceed to treat of the number state and income of the men connected with the job and glass coaches as well as the flies for the conveyance of persons and the wagons carts vans drays and so on for the conveyance of goods from one part of the metropolis to another also of the porters engaged in conveyance by hand the metropolitan carriages engaged in the conveyance of passengers are of two classes ticketed and unticketed that is to say those who ply for passengers in the public streets carry a plate inscribed with a certain number by which the drivers and owners of them may be readily known whereas those who do not ply in public but are let out at certain yards or stables have no badge affixed to them and are in many cases scarcely distinguishable from private vehicles the ticketed carriages include the stage and hackney coaches or in modern parlance the buses and cabs of London. The unticketed carriages, on the other hand, comprise the glass coaches and flies that, for a small premium, may be converted into one's own carriage for the time being. But besides these, there is another large class of hired conveyances, such as the job carriages, which differ from the glass coaches principally in the length of time for which they are engaged. The term of lease for the glass coach rarely exceeds a day, while the fly is often taken by the hour. The job carriage, however, is more commonly engaged by the month, and not unfrequently by the year. Hence the latter class of conveyances may be said to partake of the attributes of both public and private carriages. They are public in so far as they are let to hire for a certain term and private inasmuch as they are often used by the same party and by them only for several years the tradesmen who supply carriage horses and occasionally carriages by the day week month or year to all requiring such temporary or continuous accommodation are termed job masters of whom according to the post office directory there are one hundred and fifty four located in london 51 being also cab proprietors, and 28 the owners of omnibuses. They boast, and doubtlessly with perfect truth, that in their stables are the major part of the finest carriage horses in the world. The powerful animals which are seen to dash proudly along the streets, a pair of them drawing a large carriage with the most manifest ease, are, in nine cases out of ten, not the property of the nobleman whose silver crest may adorn the glittering harness, but of the job master. One of those masters has now four hundred horses, some of which are worth one hundred and twenty guineas, and the value is not less than sixty pounds per horse, or twenty-four thousand pounds in all. The premises of some of the job masters are remarkable for their extent, their ventilation, and their scrupulous cleanliness. All those in a large way of business have establishments in the country as well as in town, and at the latter are received the horses that are lame, that require rest, or that are turned out to grass. 
The young horses that are brought up from the country fairs or have been purchased of the country breeders, for job masters or their agents attend at Horncastle, Northallerton, and all the great horse fairs in Yorkshire and Lincolnshire, are generally conducted in the first instance to the country establishment of the town master, which may be at Barnet or any place of a like distance. These agents have what is called the pick of the market, not unfrequently visiting the premises of the country horse dealer and there completing purchases without subjecting the farmer, for country horse breeders and dealers are nearly all farmers, to the trouble and expense of sending his cattle to the fair. And it is thus that the London dealers secure the best stock in the kingdom. Until within twenty or thirty years ago, some of the wealthier of the nobility or gentry, as I have previously intimated, would vie with each other during the London season in the display of their most perfect Cleveland bays or other description of carriage horses. The animals were at that period walked to London under the care of the coachman and his subordinates, the family travelling post to town. Such a procedure is now never resorted to. Very few noblemen at present bring their carriage horses to town, even if within a short railway distance. They nearly all job, as it is invariably called. That is, they hire carriage horses by the month at from 20 to 30 guineas a pair, the job master keeping the animals by sending the quantity of provender to his customer's premises, and they are groomed by his own servants. Why, sir, said a job master to me, everybody jobs now. A few bishops do, and lords, and dukes, and judges. Lord D. Blank jobs, and lots of parsons and physicians. Yes, lots, sir. The royal family job, all but the queen herself. The Duchess of Kent jobs. The late Duke of C. Blank jobbed. And no doubt the present Duke will. The Queen Dowager jobbed regularly. It's a cheaper and better plan for those that must have good horses and handsome carriages. I dare say all the gentlemen in the Albany job, for I know a many that do. By jobbing, rich people can always secure the best horses in the world. I may add that any of the masters of whom I have spoken will job a carriage duly emblazoned, if ordered to provide one. He will job harness too, with the proper armorial bearings about it, and job coachmen and grooms as well. For the use of a first-class carriage, 80 guineas a year is paid. A broom, with one horse and a driver, is jobbed at 16 shillings a day, but these vehicles are usually supplied by jobbing coachmasters, but the jobbing in carriages is not so common as in horses, gentlemen preferring to have their own chariots or broughams, while the jobbing in servants is confined principally to bachelors or gentlemen keeping no establishments. The job trade, I am assured, has increased fivefold since the general establishment of railways. In this trade there is no slop supply. Even the smaller masters supply horses worth the money, for to furnish bad horses would be at once to lose custom. Gentlemen are too good judges of horse flesh, a small job master said to me, to put up with poor cattle, even though they may wear slop coats themselves and rig their servants out in slop liveries. Nothing shows a gentleman more than his horse, and they can't get first-rate horses in the country as they can in London, because they're brought up for the metropolis. The men employed in the job master's yards do not live in the yards, except a few of the higher servants, to whom can be entrusted the care of the premises and of the costly animals kept there. Nearly all the men in these yards have been brought up as grooms, and must, in stable phraseology, know a horse well. None of them in the better yards receive less than 20 shillings a week in wages, nor will any master permit his horses to be abused in any manner. Cruelty to a horse is certain dismissal, if detected, and is now, I am glad to be informed on good authority, very rare. I may here mention the rather amusing reply of a rough old groom out of place to my remark that Mr. Blank would not allow any of his horses to be in any way abused. Abused? said my respondent. 
confining the meaning of the word to one signification. Abused? You mayn't so much as swear at them. Another rough-spoken person, who was for a time a foreman to a job master, told me that he had never, or rarely, any difficulty in making a bargain with gentlemen who were judges of horses. But, said he, ladies who set up for judges are dreadful hard to please, and talk dreadful nonsense. What do they know about the points of a horse? But, of all of them, a blank is the worst to please in a horse or a carriage. She is the very devil, sir. The people employed by the job masters are strong, healthy-looking men, with no lack of grey hairs, always a good sign among them. Their amusements, I am told, are confined to an odd visit to the play, more especially to Astley's, and to skittle-playing. These enjoyments, however, are rare, as the groom cannot leave his labours for a day, and then return to it, as a mechanic may. Horses must be tended day and night, Sunday and workday, so that it is only by leave that they can enjoy any recreation. Nearly all of them, however, take great interest in horse races, steeplechases, and trotting matches. Many of them dabble in the Derby and St. Ledger lotteries, and some make a book, risking from two or three half-crowns to five pounds, and sometimes more than they can pay. These parties, however, belong as much to the class of servants as they do to the labourers engaged in connection with the transit of the metropolis. I am informed that each of the 150 job masters resident in London may be said to employ six or seven men in their yards or stables, some having at least double that number in their service, and others again only two or three. The latter, however, is the exception rather than the rule. According to this estimate, there must be from 900 to 1,000 individuals engaged in the job business of London. Their number is made up of stablemen, washers, ostlers, job coachmen and glass coachmen or flymen, besides a few grooms for the job cabriolets. The stableman attends only to the horses in the stables and gets two shillings and sixpence a day or 17 shillings and sixpence a week standing wages. The washer has from 18 shillings to one pound a week and is employed to clean the carriages only in the best yards. For those of a second-rate character, the stableman washes the carriages himself. The ostler attends to the yard and seldom or never works in the stables. He answers all the rings at the yard bell and takes the horses and gigs and so on round to the door. He is, as it were, the foreman or superintendent of the establishment. He usually receives one pound one shilling a week, standing wages, at the best yards, while at those of a lower character only fifteen shillings is given. The job coachman is distinct from the glass coachman or flyman. He often goes away from the yard on a job, to use the words of my informant, for three or six months at a stretch. He is paid by the job master and gets 30 shillings a week standing wages. He has to drive and attend to his horses in the stable. The glass coachman or flyman goes out merely by the day or by the hour. He gets nine shillings a week from the job master and whatever the customers think proper to give him. Some persons give sixpence an hour to the glass coachman and others five shillings a day for a pair of horses and from three shillings to three shillings and sixpence a day for one horse. A glass coach, it may be as well to observe, is a carriage and pair hired by the day, and a fly, a one-horse carriage hired in a similar manner. The job coachman and the glass coachman have, for the most part, been gentlemen's servants, and have come to the yard while seeking for another situation. They are mostly married men, having generally wedded either the housemaid, nurse, or cook, in some family in which they have lived. The lady's maid, to quote from my informant, is a touch above them. The cooks are in general the coachman's favourite in regard of getting a little bit of lunch out of her. The job coachman's is usually a much better berth than that of the glass coachman or flyman. The gentlefolks who engage the glass coaches and flies 
are, I am told, very near, and the flies still nearer than the glass coaches. The fly people, as the customers were termed to me, generally live about Gower Street and Burton Crescent, Woburn Place, Tavistock Square, Upper Baker Street and other shabby genteel districts. The great majority of the persons using flies, however, live in the suburbs and are mostly citizens and lawyers. The chief occasions for the engagement of a fly are visits to the theatre, opera or parties at night, or else when the wives of the above-named gentry are going out a-shopping, and then the directions, I am told, are generally to draw two or three doors away from the shops, so that the shopmen may not see them drive up in a carriage and charge accordingly. A number of flies are engaged to carry the religious gentry in the suburbs to Exeter Hall during the May meetings, and it is they, I am assured, who are celebrated for overcrowding the vehicles. Bless you! said one man whom I saw. Them folks never think there can be too many behind a horse. Six is nothing for them, and it is them who is the meanest of all to the coachman, for he never by no chance receives a glass at their door. The great treat of the glass coachman or flyman, however, is a wedding. Then they mostly look for five shillings. But, said my informant, Brides and bridegrooms is getting so stingy that now they seldom gets more than three. Formerly, I am assured, they used to get a glass of wine to drink the health of the happy pair, but now the wine has declined to gin. And even this, said one man to me, we has to bow and scrape for before we gets it out of them. There is but little call for glass coaches compared with flies now. Since the introduction of the Brooms and Clarences, the glass coaches have been almost all put on the side, and they are now seldom used for anything but taking a party with a quantity of luggage from the suburbs to the railway. They were continued at weddings till a short time back, but now the people don't like them. They have got out of date, said a flyman. Besides, a Clarence or Brougham, even with a pair of horses, is one-third cheaper. There are no glass coaches now kept in the yards. If they are wanted, they are hired at the coachmakers. Take one job master with another. I am informed that they keep, on an average, six flies each, so that the total number of hack clarences and brooms in the metropolis may be said to be near upon 1,000. Postboys are almost entirely discontinued. The majority of them, I am told, have become cabmen. The number of job horses kept for chance work in the metropolis may be estimated at about 1,000, in addition to the cab and omnibus horses, many of which frequently go out in flies. One lady omnibus proprietor at Islington keeps, I am told, a large number of flies, and so do many of the large cab proprietors. According to the government returns, the total number of carriages throughout Great Britain in 1848 was 149,000 and odd, which is in the proportion of one carriage to every 33 males of the entire population above 20 years of age. Of these carriages, upwards of 97,000 were charged with duty and yielded a revenue of more than £434,000 while 52,000 were exempt from taxation. Those charged with duty consisted of 67,000 four-wheeled carriages, of which 26,000 were private conveyances and 41,000 let to hire, and 30,000 two-wheeled carriages, of which 24,500 were for private use and 5,500 for the use of the public. The 41,000 four-wheeled carriages let to hire were subdivided in round numbers as follows. Four-wheeled carriages let to hire without horses, 500. Pony phaetons and so on drawn by a pair, 2,000. Broms, flies and so on drawn by one horse, 30,000. Hearses, 1,700. Post chaises, 5,550. Carriers' conveyances, 1,250. Total, 41,000.
Of the 52,000 carriages exempt from taxation, there was the following distribution. Private pony fetons, 7,000. Ditto pony chases, 4,500. Chase carts, 39,000. Conveyances for paupers and criminals, 1,500. Total, 52,000. The owners of four-wheeled private carriages were, it appears from the same returns, 20,739, of whom 16,349 persons kept one carriage, 3,685 persons kept two carriages, 495 persons kept three carriages, 116 persons kept four carriages, 58 persons kept five carriages, 19 persons kept six carriages, six persons kept seven carriages, 11 persons kept eight carriages and upwards. Now the total number of persons returned as of independent means at the time of taking the last census was 500,000 and odd. Of these very nearly 490,000 were 20 years of age and upwards. Hence it would appear that only one person in every 23 of those who are independent keep their carriage. Such are the statistics of carriages, both public and private, of Great Britain. What proportion of the vehicles above enumerated belong to the metropolis, I have no means of ascertaining with any accuracy. The number of horses throughout the country is equally curious. In 1847, there were no less than 800,000 horses in Great Britain, which is in the proportion of five horses to each carriage and of one horse to every six males of the entire population of 20 years of age and upwards. Of these 800,000 horses, upwards of 320,000 were charged with duty, while nearly 500,000 were exempt from it. Among the 320,000 horses charged with duty were comprised private riding and carriage horses, 143,000, draft horses used in trade, 147,000, ponies, 22,000, butcher's horses, 4,750, job horses, 1,750, race horses, 1,500, total 320,000. The horses not charged with duty were in round numbers as under. Horses used in husbandry, 330,500, horses belonging to small farmers, 61,000, Horses belonging to poor clergymen, 1,250. Horses belonging to poor traders, 10,500. Horses belonging to volunteers, 13,000. Horses used in untaxed carriages, 15,000. Horses used by wagoners for their own riding, 2,000. Horses used by bailiffs, shepherds, and so on, 1,060. Horses used by masters, ditto, 3,700. Horses used by market gardeners, 2,000. Horses in conveying paupers and criminals, 250. Horses kept for sale, 7,000. Horses kept for breeding, 4,500. Colts not used, 16,000. Post horses, 8,500. Stagecoach horses, 9,600. London Hackney Coach Horses, 3,600. Total, 496,000. The owners of the 140,000 private riding and carriage horses were 100,000 in number, and of these, 78,335 persons kept one, 17,358 persons kept two, 4,080 persons kept three, 1,624 persons kept four, 622 persons kept five, 380 persons kept six, 328 persons kept seven to eight, 81 persons kept nine, 107 persons kept 10 to 12, 54 persons kept 13 to 16, six persons kept 17, eight persons kept 18, Six persons kept 19, 67 persons kept 20 and upwards.
From this, it will appear that two persons in every seven of those who are of independent means keep a riding or carriage horse. The increase and decrease in the number of carriages and horses within the last ten years is a remarkable sign of the times. Since 1840, the number of all kinds of horses throughout Great Britain has decreased 43,000. But while some have declined, others have increased in number. Of private riding and carriage horses, where only one is kept, there has been a decrease of 12,000, and of ponies, 700. Stagecoach horses have declined 4,000, post horses, 2,500, horses used in husbandry, 57,000, breeding mares, 1,300, colts, 7,000, and horses kept for sale, 500. The London Hackney coach horses, on the other hand, have increased in the same space of time no less than 2,000, and so have the draft horses used in trade, to the extent of 17,000, while those kept by small farmers are 13,000 more and the race horses 400 more than they were in 1840. Of carriages, those having two wheels and drawn by one horse, gigs and so on, have decreased 15,000, and the post chaises 700, whereas the four-wheel carriages drawn by one horse and let to hire, broughams, clarences and so on, have increased 6,000, the pony phaetons 3,000, pony chaises 2,000, and the chaise carts, 19,000. The total revenue derived from the transit of this country by means of carriages and horses amounted in 1848 to upwards of £1,190,000. This sum is made up of the following items. Duty on carriages, £434,334. Duty on horses, £395,041. Duty on horses let to hire, £155,721. Duty on stage carriages, £96,218. Duty on hackney coaches, £28,926. Licences to let horses to hire, £6,968. Licences, stagecoaches, £9,606. Licences, hackney carriages, £435. Total, £1,127,249. From the foregoing accounts, then, it would appear that the number of carriages and horses for the use of the public throughout Great Britain two years ago was as follows. Job carriages, 500 Brooms, clarences, flies and so on, drawn by one horse, 30,000. Pony phaetons and pair, 2,000. Post chaises, 5,500. Total carriages let to hire, 38,000. Job horses, 1,750. Post horses, 8,500. Stagecoach horses, 9,600. London hackney coach horses, 3,600. Total horses for public carriages, 23,450. End of section 76. Section 77 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Carmen and Porters, Part 2. The Carrying Trade. The next part of the subject that presents itself is the conveyance of goods from one part of the metropolis to another. This, as I have before said, is chiefly effected by vans, wagons, carts, drays, and so on. It has already been shown that the number of carriers' wagons throughout Great Britain in 1848 was 1,250, while the carrier's carts were no less than 1,700-odd, or very nearly 3,000 in all. This was 800 more than they were in 1840. 
of the number of horses engaged in the carrying trade or rather that particular branch of it which concerns the removal of goods there are no returns unless it be that there were two thousand horses under thirteen hands high ridden by the wagoners of this kingdom the number of carriers carters and wagoners throughout great britain at the time of taking the last census was thirty four thousand two hundred and ninety six of whom twenty five thousand four hundred and eleven were located in england seven thousand eight hundred and two in scotland nine hundred and forty in wales and one hundred and forty three in the british isles of the thirty four thousand two hundred and ninety six carriers carters and wagoners throughout great britain in eighteen forty one thirty thousand nine hundred and seventy two were males of twenty years of age and upwards while in eighteen thirty one the number was only eighteen thousand eight hundred and fifty nine or upwards of ten thousand less so that between these two periods the trade must have increased at the rate of one thousand per annum at least i am informed however that the next returns will show quite as large a decrease in the trade owing to the conveyance of goods having been mainly transferred from the road to the rail since the last mentioned period the number of carriers carters and wagoners engaged in the metropolis in eighteen forty one was three thousand eight hundred and ninety nine of whom three thousand six hundred and sixty seven were males of twenty years of age and upwards in eighteen thirty one there were but eight hundred and seventy one individuals of the same age pursuing the same occupation and i am assured that owing to the increased facilities for the conveyance of goods from the country to london the trade has increased at even a greater rate since the last enumeration of the people the london carriers carters and wagoners may safely be said to be now nearer eight thousand than four thousand in number the london carmen are of two kinds public and private the private carmen approximate so closely to the character of servants that i propose dealing at present more particularly with the public conveyors of goods from one part of the metropolis to another the metropolitan public master carmen are two hundred and seven in number of whom fifteen are licensed to ply on the stands in the city the carmen here enumerated must be considered more in the light of the owners of vans and other vehicles for the removing of goods than working men it is true that some drive their own vehicles but many are large proprietors and belong to the class of employers rather than operatives i shall begin my account of the london carmen with those appertaining to the unlicensed class or those not resident in the city the modern spring van is as it were the landau or travelling carriage of the working classes these carriages came into general use between twenty and thirty years ago but were then chiefly employed by the great carriers for the more rapid delivery of the lighter bales of goods especially of drapery and glass goods and of parcels they came into more general use for the removal of furniture in eighteen thirty or thereabouts and a year or two after were fitted up for the conveyance of pleasure parties the van is usually painted yellow but some are a light brown or a dark blue picked out with red they are fourteen feet in length on the average and four and a half feet in breadth and usually made so as by the adjustment of the shafts to be suitable for the employment of one two three or four horses the third horse when three are used being yoked in advance of the pair in the shafts the seats are generally removable and are ranged along the sides of the vehicle across the top and at the two corners at the end as the extremity of the van from the horses is called the entrance being at the end usually by means of iron steps and through a kind of gate which is secured by a strong latch the driver sits on a box in front and on some vans seems perched fearfully high a wooden framework surmounts the body of the carriage and over it is spread an awning sometimes of strong chintz patterned sometimes of plain whitey brown calico 
the side portions being made to draw like curtains, so as to admit the air and exclude the sun and rain at pleasure. If there be a man in attendance besides the driver, he usually sits at the end of the vehicle close to the gate, or rides on the step or on a projection fixed behind. A new van costs from £50 to £80. The average price of a good van horse is from £16 to £18. The harness, new and good, costs from £5 to £5.10 shillings for two horses. The furniture van of the latter end of the week is the pleasure van of the Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, those being the days devoted to excursions, unless in the case of a club or society making their annual excursion and then any day of the week is selected except Sunday. But Sunday, on the whole, is the principal day. The removal of the seats and of the apparatus for the awning converts the pleasure into the furniture van. The uses to which the same vehicle is put are thus many a time sadly in contrast. On the Saturday, the van may have been used to convey to the brokers or the auctioneers the furniture seized in some wretched man's dwelling leaving behind bare walls and a wailing family. And on the Sunday it rings with the merriment of pleasure-seekers, who loudly proclaim that they have left their cares behind them. The owners usually, perhaps I might say always, unite some other calling, along with the business of van proprietorship. They are for the most part greengrocers, hay and corn dealers, brokers, beer shopkeepers, chandlers, rag and bottle shopkeepers or dairymen. Five sixths of them, however, are greengrocers or connected with that trade. It is not unusual for these persons to announce that, besides their immediate calling of a greengrocer, they keep a furniture van, go pleasure excursions, beat carpets, if in the suburbs, and attend evening parties. Many of them have been gentlemen servants. They are nearly all married men or widowers with families, and are, as a body, not unprosperous. Their tastes are inexpensive, though some drink pretty freely, and their early rising necessitates early going to bed, so there is little evening expenditure. I am told their chief enjoyments are a visit to Astley's and to the neighbouring horse races. Their enjoyment of the turf, however, is generally made conducive to their profits, as they convey vans full to Hampton, Egham and Epsom races. A few van men, however, go rather further in turf business and bet a little, but these, I am assured, are the exceptions. The excursions are more frequently to Hampton Court than to any other place. The other favourite resorts are High Beach, Epping Forest and Rye House, Hertfordshire. Windsor is but occasionally visited, and the shorter distances, such as Richmond, are hardly ever visited in pleasure vans. Indeed, the superior cheapness of the railway or the steamboat has confined the pleasure excursions I am speaking of to the longer distances and to places not so easily accessible by other means. The van will hold from twenty to thirty grown persons. Twenty, you see, sir, I was told, is a very comfortable number, not reckoning a few little ones over. But thirty, oh, thirty's quite the other way. The usual charge per head for a comfortable conveyance to Hampton Court and back, including all charges connected with the conveyance, is two shillings, children going for nothing, unless they are too big for knees, and then sometimes half price. Instead of two shillings, perhaps the weekly payment speculator receives two shillings and sixpence, or two shillings and threepence, and if he can engage a low-priced van, he may clear ninepence, or one shilling per head, or about one pound in all. On this subject, and on that of underselling, as it was described to me, I give the statement of a very intelligent man a prosperous van proprietor, who had the excellent characteristic of being proud of the kindly treatment, good feeding, and continued care of his horses, which are among the best employed in vans. The behaviour of these excursionists is, from the concurrent testimony 
of the many van proprietors and drivers whom I saw, most exemplary, and perhaps I shall best show this by at once giving the following statement from a very trustworthy man. I have been in the van trade for twenty years, and have gone excursions for sixteen years. Hampton Court has the call for excursions and vans because of free trade in the palace. There's nothing to pay for admission. A party makes up an excursion, and one of them bargains with me, say for two pounds. It shouldn't be a farthing less with such cattle as mine, and everything in agreement with it. Since I've known the trade, vans have increased greatly. I should say there's five now where there was one sixteen years ago, and more. There's a recommendable and a respectable behaviour amongst those that goes excursions. But now, on an excursion, there's hardly any drunkenness, or if there is, it's through the accident of a bad stomach, or something that way. The excursionists generally carry a fiddler with them, sometimes a trumpeter, or else some of them is master of an instrument as goes down. They generally sings, too, such songs as There's a Good Time Coming and The Brave Old Oak. Sometimes a nigger thing, but not so often. They carry always, I think, their own eatables and drinkables, and they take them on the grass very often. Last Whit Monday, I counted fifty vans at Hampton and didn't see anybody drunk there. I reckoned them earlyish, and perhaps ten came after, at least, and every van would have twenty and more. Sixty vans would, at this moderate computation, convey one thousand two hundred persons. They walk through the palace at Hampton, and sometimes dance on the grass after that, but not for long. It soon tires dancing on the grass. A school often goes, or a club, or a society or any party. I generally do Hampton Court in three hours with two horses. I reckon it's fourteen miles, or near that, from my place. If I go to High Beach, there's the swings for the young ones, and the other merry-makings. At Rye House, it's country enjoyment, mere looking about the real country. The Derby Day's a great van day. I'm sure I couldn't guess to one hundred, not perhaps to twice that, how many pleasure vans go to the Derby? It's extra charge, three pounds ten shillings, for the van to Epsom and back. It's a long distance. But the Derby has a wonderful draw. I've taken all sorts of excursions, but it's working people that's our great support. They often smoke as they come back, though it's against my rules. They often takes a barrel of beer with them. It is not easy to ascertain the number of vans used for pleasure excursions, but the following is the best information to be obtained on the subject. There is not more than one-sixth of the greengrocers who have their own vans. Some keep two vans and carts, besides two or three trucks. Others, three vans and carts and trucks. These vans, carts and trucks are principally used in the private transactions of their business. Sometimes they are employed in the removal of furniture. The number of vans employed in the metropolis is as follows. Those kept by greengrocers, about 450. By others, for excursions, 1,000. Total, 1,450. The season for the excursion trips commences on Whit Monday and continues till the latter end of September. Table showing the average number of pleasure vans hired each week throughout the season and the decrease since railway excursions. Hampton Court, Sunday. Before the railway, 50 excursion trips. Since the railway, 10 excursion trips. Hampton Court, Monday. Before the railway, 80. Since the railway, 30. Hampton Court, Tuesday. Before the railway, 20. Since the railway, 10. Rye House, weekly. Before the railway, 35. Since the railway, 12. High Beach, weekly. Before the railway, 40. Since the railway, 20. Total excursion trips before the railway, 225. Total excursion trips since the railway, 82. 
From this, it appears that before the railway trips, there were 225 pleasure excursions by vans every week during five months of the year, or 4,500 such excursions in the course of the 12 months, and only 1,640 since that time. This is exclusive of those two Epsom races, at which there were nearly 200 more. When employed in the removal of furniture, the average weight carried by these vans is about two tons, and they usually obtain about two loads, on an average, per week. The party engaged to take charge of the van is generally a man employed by the owner in the capacity of a servant. The average weekly salary of these servants is about 18 shillings. Some van proprietors will employ one man, and some as many as nine or ten. These men look after the horses and stables of their employers. A van proprietor takes out a post-horse licence, which is seven shillings and sixpence a year, and for excursions he is also obliged to take out a stage carriage licence for each van that goes out with pleasure parties. Such licence costs three pounds three shillings per year. And besides this, they have to pay to the excise a penny halfpenny per mile for each excursion they take. The van horses number about three to each van, so that for the whole 1,450 vans, as many as 4,350 horses are kept. Calculating the pleasure excursions by van in the course of the year at from 1,500 to 2,000, and that 20 persons is the complement carried on each occasion, we have a pleasure excursion party of between 30,000 and 40,000 persons annually. And supposing that each excursionist spends three shillings and sixpence, the sum spent every year by the working classes in pleasure excursions by spring vans alone will amount to very nearly £7,000. The above account relates only to the conveyance of persons by means of the London vans. Concerning the removal of goods by the same means, I obtained the following information from the most trustworthy and experienced members of the trade. Quote, the charge for the use of spring vans for the conveyance of furniture and other damageable commodities is one shilling and sixpence an hour, when one man is employed, assisting in packing, unpacking, conveying the furniture into its place of destination, and sometimes helping to fix it. If two men are employed in this labour, two shillings an hour is the charge. If the furniture is conveyed a considerable distance, the carman's employer may, at his option, pay sixpence a mile, instead of one shilling and sixpence an hour. But the engagement by the hour ensues in nine cases out of ten. End quote. The conveyance of people on pleasure excursions and the removal of furniture constitute the principal business of the West End and suburb carmen. The city carmen, however, constitute a distinct class. They are the licensed carmen, and none others are allowed by the city authorities to take up in the precincts of the City of London, though anyone can put down therein. That is to say, the unlicensed carman may convey a house full of furniture from the Strand to Fleet Street, but he may not legally carry an empty box from Fleet Street to the Strand. The city carmen, as I have said, must be licensed, and the law sanctions the following rates of payment for carriage. Quote, By order of quarter sessions held at Guildhall, Midsummer, 49th George III, all goods, wares, and merchandise whatsoever, weighing 14 hundredweight or under, shall be deemed half a load and from 14 hundredweight to 26 hundredweight shall be deemed a load. From any part of the City of London, the rates for carrying thereof shall be as follow. For any place within and to the extension of half a mile, for half a load and under, two shillings and sevenpence. Above half a load, and not exceeding a load, four shillings and twopence. From half a mile to a mile, for half a load or under, three shillings and fourpence. For above half a load and not exceeding a load, five shillings and twopence. 
a mile to one mile and a half, for half a load or under, four shillings and tuppence, for above half a load and not exceeding a load, five shillings and eleven pence, and so on according to distance. End quote. The other distances and weights are in relative proportion. These regulations, however, are altogether disregarded, as are those which limit the cartage for hire within the city to the carmen licensed by the city, who must be freemen of the carmen's company, the only company in London whose members are all of the trade incorporated. Instead of the prices I have cited, the matter is now one of bargain. Average charges are one shilling and sixpence an hour for vans, and one shilling for carts, or four shillings and four shillings and sixpence per tonne from the West India docks to any part of the city, and in like proportion from the other docks and localities. The infringers of the city carmen's privileges are sometimes called pirates, but within these three or four years no strenuous attempts have been made to check them. One carman told me that he had complained to the city chamberlain, who told him to punish the offenders, but as it was left to individual efforts, nothing was done, and the privileges, except as regards standings, are almost or altogether a dead letter. Fourteen years ago it cost one hundred pounds to become free of the carman's company. Ten years ago it cost thirty-two pound odd, and within these five years the cost has been reduced to eleven pounds. The carmen who resort to the stands pay five shillings yearly for that privilege. The others are not required to do so, but every year they have to register the names of their servants with a bond of security, who are employed on goods under bond, and it is customary on these occasions to give the toll-keeper five shillings, which is equal to a renewal of the licence. Until ten years ago, there were only 400 of these conveyances licensed in the city. The figures called caroons ran from one to 400 and were sold by their possessors on a disposal of their property and privilege, as if freehold property, being worth about £100 a caroon. No compensation was accorded when the restriction as to numbers was abolished. The principal standings are in Coleman Street, Bread Street, Bishopsgate Street, Dowgate Hill, Thames Street, and St. Mary Axe. The charges do not differ from those I have given, but some of the employers of these carmen drive very hard bargains. A car of the best build costs from £60 to £70. The best horses cost £40, the average price being £20 at the least. The wages of the carmen's servants vary from 16 shillings to 21 shillings a week under the best masters and from 12 shillings to 14 shillings under the inferior. These men are for the most part from the country. The porters and so on. I now approach the only remaining part of this subject, namely the conveyance of goods and communications by means of the porters, messengers and errand boys of the metropolis. The number of individuals belonging to this class throughout Great Britain in 1841 amounted to 27,552, of whom 24,092 were located in England, 3,296 in Scotland, 113 in Wales, and 51 in the British Isles. Of the 27,500 porters, messengers and errand boys in Great Britain, very nearly one-fifth, or 4,965, were lads under 20 years of age. The number of individuals engaged in the same occupation in the metropolis was in 1841 no less than 13,103, or very nearly half the number of porters and so on throughout Great Britain. Of this number, 2,726, or more than a fifth of the class, may be considered to represent the errand boys, these being lads under 20 years of age. At present, however, I propose dealing solely with the public porters of the metropolis. Those belonging to private individuals appear to partake, as I said of the carmen's assistants, more of the character of servants, 
paid out of the profits of the trade than labourers whose wages form an integral portion of the prime cost of a commodity. The metropolitan porters are, like the carmen, of two classes, the ticketed and unticketed. I shall begin with the former. The privileged porters of the City of London were at one period, and until within these twenty years, a numerous, important, and tolerably prosperous class. Prescriptive right and the laws and bylaws of the Corporation of the City of London have given to them the sole privilege of porterage of every description, provided it be carried on in the precincts of the city. The only exception to this exclusive right is that any freeman may employ his own servants in the porterage of his own goods, and even that has been disputed. The first mention of the privileged porters is in the early part of the 16th century. It is almost impossible to classify the especial functions of the different classes of porters, for they seem to have become especial functions through custom and prescriptive right, and they are not defined precisely in any legitimate or municipal enactment. Even at the present time, what constitutes the business of a fellowship porter, what of a ticket porter, and on what an unprivileged porter, known as a foreigner because a non-freeman, may be employed, are matters of dispute. A reference to city enactments and the aid of a highly intelligent member of the fraternity of ticket porters enables me to give the following account, which is the more interesting as it relates to a class of labourers whose numbers, with the exception of the fellowship porters, have been limited since 1838 and who must necessarily die out from want of renewal. In the earliest Common Council enactments, June 27th, 1606, on the subject of porterage, the distinctions given, or rather intimated incidentally, are, quote, tackle house porter, porter packer of the goods of English merchants, street porter, or porter to the packer for the said city for strangers goods, end quote. As regards the term ticket porter, not mentioned in this enumeration, I have to observe that all porters are necessarily ticket porters, which means that they can produce a ticket or a document showing that they are duly qualified and have been, quote, admitted and allowed to use the feet of a porter, end quote, by being freemen of the city and members of a porter's company or fellowship. In some of the older city documents, tackle and ticket porters are mentioned as if constituting one class. And they did constitute one class when their labour was identical, as to a great extent it was. In 1712, they are mentioned or indicated as one body, although the first clause of the Common Council enactment sets out that several controversies and quarrels have lately arisen between the tackle house porters and the ticket porters, touching the labour or work to them respectively belonging, notwithstanding the several acts of this court heretofore made. As these acts were vague and contradictory, the controversies were a natural consequence. The tackle porters were employed in the weighing of goods for any purpose of shipping, duty or sale, which was formerly carried on in public in the city. But there was a city officer known as the Master Weigher, styled Mr. Weigher, in the old acts, and the profits of the weighing thus carried on publicly in the city went to the hospitals. In 1607 it was enacted, note, I give the old orthography with its many contractions. End note. Quote, that no person or persons using the feet of a porter or being a foreigner, inholder, orfinger, or key keeper, where any merchants goods are to be landed or laid or such like, shall at any time after the making and publishing of this act have use keep or use within the said city or liberties thereof any manner triangle with beams scales and weights or any other balance in any sort to weigh any the goods wares or merchandise of any merchant or merchants prison or prisons whatsoever 
within the said city or liberties thereof whereby the prophet coming and going to the hospitals of the said city by weighing at the iron beams or at the great beam at the weighhouse or the prophets of the mr ware and porters of the same weighhouse may in any wise be impeached hindered or diminished End quote. the privilege of weighing fell gradually into desuetude but there is no record of the precise periods however a vestige of it still remains as i shall show in my account of the markets as it properly comes under that head there were twenty-four tackle porters appointed each of the twelve great city companies appointing two these twelve companies are the mercers grocers drapers fishmongers goldsmiths skinners ironmongers vintners and cloth workers the twenty-four appointed porters were known it appears as maister porters but as it was impossible that they could do all the work required they called to them the aid of fellows freemen of the city and members of their society who in time seem to have been known simply as ticket porters if a sufficiency of these fellows or ticket porters could not be made available on any emergency the maesters could employ any quote, foreign porter not free of this city using the feet of a porter packer of the goods of english merchants or the feet of a street porter at the time of the making of this act sixteen o seven and which at this present is commemorant in the same city or suburbs thereof charged with family or being a single man bringing a good certificate in the writing under the hands of the church wardens of the parish where he is resident or other substantial neighbours to the number of flower of his good conversation and demeanour this employment however was not to be to the prejudice of the privileged porters and that the employment of foreigners was resorted to jealously and only through actual necessity is sufficiently shown by the whole tenor of the enactments on the subject the very act which i have just cited as permitting the employment of foreigners contains a complaint in its preamble that the toleration of these men caused many quote, of bad and lewd condition daily to resort from the most part of this realm to the said city suburbs and places adjoining procuring themselves small habitations namely one chamber room for a poor foreigner and his family in a small cottage with some other as poor as himself to the great increase and pestering of this city with poor people many of them proving shifters living by cozening stealing and embezzling men's goods as opportunity may serve them a somewhat curious precedent as regards the character of the dwellings being in one chamber room and so on for the abodes of the workmen for the slop tailors and others in our day as i have shown in my previous letters the ticket porters in eighteen forty six are described as three thousand persons and upwards which sufficiently shows their importance and in seventeen twelve a common council enactment provides that they shall have and enjoy the work or labour of unshipping landing carrying and housing of pitch tar soap ashes clapboards wainscot fur poles masts deals oars chests tables flats and hemp brought hither from danzig melvin or any other part or place of the countries commonly called the east countries also of the imports from ireland quote, from any of the plantations belonging to great britain and of all manner of coast goods except lead end quote. the tackle house porters were by the same enactment to quote, have and enjoy the work and labour of the shipping and all goods imported and belonging to the south sea company or to the company of merchants trading to the east indies and of all other goods and merchandises coming from other ports not before mentioned end quote. the functions of the tackle house and ticket porters are by this regulation in seventeen twelve made identical as to labour 
with merely the distinction as to the place from which the goods were received. And as the number of tackle house porters was properly 24, with them must be included, I presume, all such ticket porters, but not to the full number, nor is it likely that they will be renewed in case of death. The tackle house porters that are still in existence, I was told, are gentlemen. One is a wharfinger and claims and enjoys the monopoly of labour on his own wharf. Quote, the tackle house porters, or most of them, were labourers within these twenty years. End quote. The tackle house and ticket porters still enjoy by law the right to man the work, wherever porterage is required, or in other words, to execute the labour themselves, or to engage men to do it, no matter whether the work relate to shipping, to the markets, or to mere street porterage, such as the conveyance of parcels for hire by men's labour. The number of the ticket porters was, twenty years ago, about six hundred. At that time, to become free of the company, which has no hall but assemblies at Guildhall, cost upwards of forty pounds. But soon afterwards, the expense was reduced to six pounds, three shillings and fourpence. By a resolution of the Common Council, no new ticket porters have been appointed since 1838. Previously to becoming a ticket porter, a man must have taken up his freedom, no matter in what character, and must produce certificates of good character and security of two freemen, householders of good credit, each in £100, so that the owner of any articles entrusted to the ticket porter may be indemnified in case of loss. The ticket porters are not the mere labourers people generally imagine they are, but are, or were, for their number does now not exceed 100, decayed tradesmen, who resorted to this means of livelihood when others had failed. They are also the sons of ticket porters. Any freeman of the city, by becoming a member of the Tackle House and Ticket Porters Company, was entitled to act as a ticket porter. They are still recognised at the markets and the wharfs, but their privileges are constantly, and more and more, infringed. From a highly intelligent member of their body, I had the following statement. It may be true, or it may not, that ticket porters are not wanted now. But fifteen or sixteen years ago, a committee of the Common Council, the Market Committee I believe it was, resolved that the ticket porters ought to be upheld, and that fifty pounds should be awarded to us. But we never got it. It was stopped by some after resolution. Put it this way, sir. To get bread for myself and my children, I became a ticket porter, having incurred great expense in taking up my freedom and all that. Well, for this expense, I enjoyed certain privileges, and enjoy them still to some extent. But that's only because I'm well known, and have had great experience in porterage and quickness, as it is as much art as strength. But supposing that railways have changed the whole business of the times, are the privileges I have secured with my own money, and under the sanction of all the old laws of the city, to be taken from me? If the privileges, though they may not be many, of the rich city companies are not to be touched, why are mine? Every day they are infringed. A railway wagon, for instance, carries a load of meat to Newgate Market. Ticket porters have the undoubted right to unload the meat and carry it to its place of sale. But the railway servants do that, though only free men employ their own servants in porterage, and that only with their own goods, or goods they are concerned in. I fancy that railway companies are not free men, and don't carry their own property to market for sale. If we complain to the authorities, we are recommended to take the law of the offenders, and we can only take it of the person committing the actual offence. And so we may sue a beggar, whom his employers may send down their line an hour after to Hull or Halifax, as the saying is. If we are of no further use, don't sacrifice, but compensate us, and let us make the best of it, though we are none of us so young as we were. 
some are very old and none are under forty because no new members have been made for some years if a man's house be a hindrance to public business he must be paid a proper price for it before it can be removed and so ought we the palace court people were compensated and ought not we who work hard for an honest living and have bought the right to work in our portering according to the laws of the city that secure the goldsmiths in their right of a saying and all the rich companies in possession of their lands and possessions and so it ought to be with our labour the porter packers have been unknown in the business of the city for some years their avocation in the packing and shipping of strangers goods having barely survived the expiring of the east india company's charter in eighteen thirty four the street porters or men who occupy or rather did occupy for they are not now always to be found there the principal business parts of the city are of course ticket porters and by the law have exclusive right of all porterage by hire from aliens or foreigners in the streets note a freeman may employ his own servant end note even to the carrying of a parcel of the burden of which any one may wish to relieve himself they usually but not always wear white aprons and display their tickets as badges they do not confine themselves to the streets but resort to the wharfs in the fruit or any busy season and to the meat and fish markets whenever they think there is a chance of a job and the preference as is not unfrequently the case likely to fall to them for they are known to be trusty and experienced men this shifting of labour from one place to another renders it impossible to give the number of ticket porters working in any particular locality the fellowship porters seem to have sprung into existence in consequence of the misunderstandings of the tackle and ticket porters and in this way fellowships or gangs of porters were confined or confined themselves to the porterage of coal corn malt and indeed all grain salt fruit and wet fish conceded to them after many disputes by the ticket porters of billingsgate and their privileges are not infringed to any such extent as those of the ticket porters the payments of ticket porters were settled in seventeen ninety nine to or from any of the quays wharfs stairs lanes or alleys at the waterside between the tower and london bridge to any part of lower thames street beer lane water lane harp lane st dunstan's hill st mary hill love lane bottoff lane pudding lane and fish street hill for any load or parcel by knot or hand not exceeding half a hundredweight fourpence not exceeding one hundredweight sixpence not exceeding one and a half hundredweight ninepence not exceeding two hundredweight one shilling for the like weights and not exceeding poplar bowchurch bishop bonner's farm kingsland turnpike highbury place old pancras church portman square grosvenor square hyde park corner buckingham gate westminster infirmary tothill fields bridewell strutton ground horse ferry vauxhall walworth turnpike and places of the like distance not exceeding half a hundredweight two shillings and ninepence not exceeding one hundredweight three shillings and threepence not exceeding one and a half hundredweight three shillings and ninepence not exceeding two hundredweight five shillings i cite these regulations to show the distances to which porters were sent half a century ago and the charges these charges however were not always paid as the persons employing parties often made bargains with them and some twenty years ago the legalised charges were reduced a penny in every threepence the street porters complain that any one may now or at all events does now ply for hire in the city and get higher prices than then all ticket porters pay eight shillings yearly towards the funds of their society which is called quarterage out of this a few small pensions are granted to old women the widows of ticket porters 
The difference of the functions of the ticket and fellowship porters seems to be this, that the ticket porters carry dry goods or those classed by weight or bulk. The fellowship porters carry measured goods. End of section 77「Section 78 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. London Vagrants, Part 1. The evils consequent upon the uncertainty of labour I have already been at considerable pains to point out. There is still one other mischief attendant upon it that remains to be exposed, and which, if possible, is greater than any other yet adduced. Many classes of labour are necessarily uncertain or fitful in their character. Some work can be pursued only at certain seasons. Some depends upon the winds, as, for instance, dock labour. Some on fashion, and nearly all on the general prosperity of the country. Now, the labourer who is deprived of his usual employment by any of the above causes must, unless he has laid by a portion of his earnings while engaged, become a burden to his parish or the state, or else he must seek work either of another kind or in another place. The mere fact of a man's seeking work in different parts of the country may be taken as evidence that he is indisposed to live on the charity or labour of others, and this feeling should be encouraged in every rational manner. Hence, the greatest facility should be afforded to all labourers who may be unable to obtain work in one locality to pass to another part of the country where there may be a demand for their labour. In fine, it is expedient that every means should be given for extending the labour market for the working classes, that is to say, for allowing them as wide a field for the exercise of their calling as possible. To do this involves the establishment of what are called the casual wards of the different unions throughout the country. These are, strictly speaking, the free hostelries of the unemployed work people, where they may be lodged and fed on their way to find work in some more active district. But the establishment of these gratuitous hotels has called into existence a large class of wayfarers, for whom they were never contemplated. They have been the means of affording great encouragement to those vagabond or erratic spirits who find continuity of application to any task specially irksome to them, and who are physically unable or mentally unwilling to remain for any length of time in the same place or at the same work, creatures who are vagrants in disposition and principle, the wandering tribe of this country, the nomads of the present day. Quote, the right which every person apparently destitute possesses to demand food and shelter affords, says Mr. Pigott in the report on vagrancy, great facilities and encouragement to idle and dissolute persons to avoid labour and pass their lives in idleness and pillage. There can be no doubt that of the wayfarers who in summer especially demand admission into workhouses the number of those whom the law contemplates under the titles of idle and disorderly and rogues and vagabonds greatly exceeds that of those who are honestly and bona fide travelling in search of employment, and that it is the former class whose numbers have recently so increased as to require a remedy. End quote. It becomes almost a necessary result of any system which seeks to give shelter and food to the industrious operative in his way to look for work, that it should be the means of harbouring and fostering the idle and the vagabond. To refuse an asylum to the vagrant is to shut out the traveller, so hard is it to tell the one from the other. The prime cause of vagabondism is essentially the non-inculcation of a habit of industry, that is to say, the faculty of continuous application at a particular form of work, has not been engendered in the individual's mind, and he has naturally an aversion to any regular occupation, 
and becomes erratic, wandering from this thing to that without any settled or determined object. Hence we find that the vagrant disposition begins to exhibit itself precisely at that age when the first attempts are made to inculcate the habit of continuous labour among youths. This will be seen by the table in the opposite page, taken from the returns of the houseless poor, which shows the greatest number of inmates to be between the ages of 15 and 25. The cause of the greater amount of vagrancy being found among individuals between the ages of 15 and 25, and it is not by the table alone that this fact is borne out, appears to be the irksomeness of any kind of sustained labour when first performed. This is especially the case with youth, and hence a certain kind of compulsion is necessary in order that the habit of doing the particular work may be engendered. Unfortunately, however, at this age, the self-will of the individual begins also to be developed, and any compulsion or restraint becomes doubly irksome. Hence, without judicious treatment, the restraint may be entirely thrown off by the youth, and the labour be discarded by him, before any steadiness of application has been produced by constancy of practice. The cause of vagrancy then resolves itself, to a great extent, into the harshness of either parents or employers, and this which will be found is generally the account given by the vagrants themselves. They have been treated with severity, and being generally remarkable for their self-will, have run away from their home or master, to live, while yet mere lads, in some of the low lodging houses. Here they find companions of the same age and character as themselves, with whom they ultimately set out on a vagabond excursion through the country, begging or plundering on their way. Another class of vagrants consists of those who, having been thrown out of employment, have travelled through the country seeking work without avail, and who consequently have lived on charity so long that the habits of wandering and mendicancy have eradicated their former habits of industry, and the industrious workman has become changed into the habitual beggar. The ages of applicants for shelter at the Central Asylum, Playhouse Yard, White Cross Street, in the year 1849. Children under one month, number of applicants, 17. Children of one month, 4. Children of two months, 42. Children of three months, 21. Children of four months, 14. Children of five months, 14. Children of six months, 26. Children of seven months, 30. Children of eight months, 7. Children of nine months, 14. Children of ten months, 7. Children of eleven months, 5. Total, 201. One year old, 28 applicants. Two years old, 22. Three years old, 28. Four years old, 30. Five years old, 36. Six years old, 39. Seven years old, 56. Eight years old, 38. Nine years old, 92. Ten years old, 108. Eleven years old, 104. Twelve years old, 107. 13 years old, 177. 14 years old, 102. 15 years old, 268. 16 years old, 259. 17 years old, 380. 18 years old, 336. 19 years old, 385. 20 years old, 296. 21 years old, 335. 22 years old, 386. 23 years old, 295. 24 years old, 399. 25 years old, 122. 26 years old, 238. 27 years old, 219. 28 years old, 238. 29 years old, 84. 30 years old, 294. 
31 years old, 56. 32 years old, 91. 33 years old, 105. 34 years old, 98. 35 years old, 186. 36 years old, 98. 37 years old, 63. 38 years old, 56. 39 years old, 42. 40 years old, 117. 41 years old, 63. 42 years old, 91. 43 years old, 49. 44 years old, 42. 45 years old, 91. 46 years old, 28. 47 years old, 35. 48 years old, 56. 49 years old, 84. 50 years old, 108. 51 years old, 28. 52 years old, 46. 53 years old, 44. 54 years old, 21. 55 years old, 49. 56 years old, 35. 57 years old, 27. 58 years old, 35. 59 years old, 27. 60 years old, 35. 61 years old, 7. 62 years old, 14. 63 years old, 7. 64 years old, 14. 65 years old, 12. 66 years old, 6. 67 years old, 10. 68 years old, 7. 69 years old, 4. 70 years old, 7. 71 years old, 4. 72 years old, 6. 73 years old, 7. 74 years old, 6. 75 years old, 7. 76 years old, 6. 77 years old, 2. 78 years old, 4. 79 years old, 0. 80 years old, 2. Quote, Having investigated the general causes of depredation, of vagrancy and mendicancy, says the Constabulary Commissioners in the Government Report of 1839, page 181, as developed by examinations of the previous lives of criminals or vagrants in the jails, we find that, scarcely in any cases, is it ascribable to the pressure of unavoidable want or destitution, and that in the great mass of cases it arises from the temptation of obtaining property with a less degree of labour than by regular industry. End quote. Again, in page 63 of the same report, we are told that, quote, the inquiries made by the most experienced officers into the causes of vagrancy manifest that in all but three or four per cent, the prevalent cause was the impatience of steady labour, end quote. My investigations into this most important subject lead me, I may add, to the same conclusions. In order to understand the question of vagrancy thoroughly, however, we must not stop here. We must find out what, in its turn, is the cause of this impatience of steady labour. Or in other words, we must ascertain whence comes the desire to obtain property with a less degree of labour than by regular industry. Now, all steady labour, that is to say, the continuance of any labour for any length of time, is naturally irksome to us. We are all innately erratic, prone to wander both in thought and action, and it is only by a vigorous effort, which is more or less painful to us at first, that we can keep ourselves to the steady prosecution of the same object, to the repeated performance of the same acts, or even to continuous attention to the same subject. Labour and effort are more or less irksome to us all. There are, however, two means by which this irksomeness may be not only removed, but transformed into a positive pleasure. One is by the excitement of some impulse or purpose in the mind of the workman, and the other by the inculcation of a habit of working. Purpose and habit are the only two modes by which labour can be rendered easy to us, and it is precisely because the vagrant is deficient in both that he has an aversion to work for his living, and wanders through the country without an object, or indeed a destination. 
a love of industry is not a gift but a habit it is an accomplishment rather than an endowment and our purposes and principles do not arise spontaneously from the promptings of our own instincts and affections but are the mature result of education example and deliberation a vagrant therefore is an individual applying himself continuously to no one thing nor pursuing any one aim for any length of time but wandering from this subject to that as well as from one place to another because in him no industrial habits have been formed nor any principle or purpose impressed upon his nature pursuing the subject still further we shall find that the cause of the vagrants wandering through the country and indeed through life purposeless objectless and unprincipled in the literal and strict meaning of the term lies mainly in the defective state of our educational institutions for the vagrants as a class it should be remembered are not educated we teach a lad reading writing and arithmetic and believe that in so doing we are developing the moral functions of his nature whereas it is often this ability to read merely that is to say to read without the least moral perception which becomes the instrument of the youth's moral depravity the jack shepherd of mr harrison ainsworth is borrowed from the circulating library and read aloud in the low lodging houses in the evening by those who have a little education to their companions who have none and because the thief is there furbished up into the hero because the author has tricked him out with a sort of brute insensibility to danger made noble blood flow in his veins and tinselled him over with all kinds of showy sentimentality the poor boys who listen unable to see through the trumpery deception are led to look up to the paltry thief as an object of admiration and to make his conduct the beau ideal of their lives of all books perhaps none has ever had so baneful an effect upon the young mind taste and principles as this none has ever done more to degrade literature to the level of the lowest licentiousness or to stamp the author and the teacher as guilty of pandering to the most depraved propensities had mr ainsworth been with me and seen how he had vitiated the thoughts and pursuits of hundreds of mere boys had he heard the names of the creatures of his morbid fancy given to youths at an age when they needed the best and truest counsellors had he seen these poor little wretches as i have seen them grin with delight at receiving the degrading titles of blueskin dick turpin and jack shepherd he would i am sure ever rue the day which led him to paint the most degraded and abandoned of our race as the most noble of human beings what wonder then that taught either in no school at all or else in that meretricious one which makes crime a glory and dresses up vice as virtue these poor lads should be unprincipled in every act they do that they should be either literally actuated by no principles at all or else fired with the basest motives and purposes gathered from books which distort highway robbery into an act of noble enterprise and dignify murder as justifiable homicide nor are the habits of the young vagrant less cultivated than his motives the formation of that particular habit which we term industry and by which the youth is fitted to obtain his living as a man is perhaps the most difficult part of all education it commences at an age when the will of the individual is beginning to develop itself and when the docile boy is changed into the impatient young man too great lenity or too strict severity of government therefore becomes at this period of life dangerous if the rule be too lax the restless youth disgusted with the monotony of pursuing the same task or performing the same acts day by day neglects his work till habits of indolence rather than industry are formed and he is ultimately thrust upon the world without either the means or the disposition of labouring for his living if on the other hand the authority of the parent or master be too rigidly exercised 
and the lad's power of endurance be taxed too severely, then the self-will of the youth is called into action, and, growing restless and rebellious under the tyranny of his teachers, he throws off their restraint and leaves them, with a hatred instead of a love of labour engendered within him. That these are two of the primary causes of vagrancy all my inquiries have tended to show. The proximate cause certainly lies in the impatience of steady labour, but the cause of this impatience is referable to the non-formation of any habit of industry in the vagrant, and the absence of this habit of industry is usually due to the neglect or the tyranny of the lad's parent or master. This is no theory, be it remembered. Whether it be the master of the workhouse, where the vagrants congregate every night, whether it be the young vagrant himself, or the more experienced tramp that speaks upon the subject, all agree in ascribing the vagabondism of youth to the same cause. There is, however, another phase of vagrancy still to be explained, namely the transition of the working man into the regular tramp and beggar. This is the result of a habit of dependence, produced in the operative by repeated visits to the casual wards of the unions. A labouring man, or mechanic, deprived of employment in a particular town, sets out on a journey to seek work in some other part of the country. The mere fact of his sojourning to seek work shows that he has a natural aversion to become a burden to the parish. He is no sooner, however, become an inmate of the casual wards and breakfasts and sups of the bounty of the workhouse than he learns a most dangerous lesson. He learns how to live by the labour of others. His sense of independence may be shocked at first, but repeated visits to the same places soon deaden his feelings on this score, and he gradually, from continual disuse, loses his habit of labouring, and ultimately, by long custom, acquires a habit of tramping through the country, and putting up at the casual wards of the unions by the way. Thus, what was originally designed as a means of enabling the labouring man to obtain work becomes the instrument of depriving him of employment by rendering it no longer a necessity for him to seek it, and the independent workman is transformed after a time into the habitual tramper, and finally into the professional beggar and petty thief. Such characters, however, form but a small proportion of the great body of vagabonds continually traversing the country. The vagrants are essentially the non-working, as distinguished from the hard-working, men of England. They are the very opposite to the industrious classes, with whom they are too often confounded. Of the really destitute working men, among the vagrants seeking relief at the casual wards, the proportion is very small the respectable mechanics being deterred by disgust from herding with the filth, infamy, disease and vermin congregated in the tramp wards of the unions, and preferring the endurance of the greatest privations before subjecting themselves to it. Quote, I have had this view confirmed by several unfortunate persons, says Mr. Boas in the Poor Law Report on Vagrancy. They were apparently mechanics out of employment who spoke of the horrors passed in a tramp ward and of their utter repugnance at visiting such places again. End quote. Quote, the poor mechanic, says the porter at the Holborn workhouse, will sit in the casual wards like a lost man, scared. It's shocking to think a decent mechanic's houseless, he adds, when he's beat out. He's like a bird out of a cage. He doesn't know where to go or how to get a bit. End quote. But the highest tribute ever paid to the sterling honesty and worth of the working men of this country is to be found in the testimony of the master of the Wandsworth and Clapham Union. Quote, the destitute mechanics, he says, are entirely a different class from the regular vagrant. They have different habits, and indeed different features. They are strictly honest. During the whole of my experience, I never knew a distressed artisan who applied for a night's shelter commit an act of theft. 
and I have seen them, he adds, in the last stage of destitution. Occasionally they have sold the shirt and waistcoat off their backs before they applied for admittance into the workhouse, while some of them have been so weak from long starvation that they could scarcely reach the gate, and indeed had to be kept for several days in the infirmary before their strength was recruited sufficiently to continue their journey. End quote. For myself, I can safely say that my own experience fully bears out this honourable declaration of the virtues of our working men. Their extreme patience under the keenest privations is a thing that the wisest philosophers might envy. Their sympathy and charity for their poorer brethren far exceeds, in its humble way, the benevolence and bounty of the rich. While their intelligence, considering the little time they have for study and reflection, is almost marvellous. In a word, their virtues are the spontaneous expressions of their simple natures, and their vices are the comparatively pardonable excesses consequent upon the intensity of their toil. I say thus much in this place, because I am anxious that the public should no longer confound the honest, independent working men with the vagrant beggars and pilferers of the country, and that they should see that the one class is as respectable and worthy as the other is degraded and vicious. End of section 78section seventy nine of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry london vagrants part two characteristics of the various classes of vagrants i now come to the characteristics of vagrant life as seen in the casual wards of the metropolitan unions the subject is one of the most important with which I have yet had to deal, and the facts I have collected are sufficiently startling to give the public an idea of the great social bearings of the question, for the young vagrant is the budding criminal. Previously to entering upon my inquiry into this subject, I consulted with a gentleman who had long paid considerable attention to the question, and who was, moreover, in a position peculiarly fitted for gaining the greatest experience and arriving at the correctest notions upon the matter. I consulted, I say, with the gentleman referred to, as to the poor law officers, from whom I should be likely to obtain the best information, and I was referred by him to Mr. Knapp, the master of the Wandsworth and Clapham Union, as one of the most intelligent and best informed upon the subject of vagrancy. I found that gentleman all that he had been represented to me as being, and obtained from him the following statement, which, as an analysis of the vagrant character and a description of the habits and propensities of the young vagabond, has perhaps never been surpassed. He had filled the office of Master of the Wandsworth and Clapham Union for three years, and immediately before that he was the relieving officer for the same union for upwards of two years. He was guardian of Clapham Parish for four years previously to his being elected relieving officer. He was a member of the first board of guardians that was formed under the new Poor Law Act, and he has long given much attention to the habits of the vagrants that have come under his notice or care. He told me that he considered a casual ward necessary in every union, because there is always a migratory population, consisting of labourers seeking employment in other localities, and destitute women travelling to their husbands or friends. He thinks a casual ward is necessary for the shelter and relief of such parties, since the law will not permit them to beg. These, however, are by far the smaller proportion of those who demand admittance into the casual ward. Formerly, they were not 5% of the total number of casuals. The remainder consisted of youths, prostitutes, Irish families, and a few professional beggars. The youths formed more than one half of the entire number, and their ages were from 12 to 20. 
the largest number were seventeen years old indeed he adds just that age when youth becomes disengaged from parental control these lads had generally run away either from their parents or masters and many had been reared to a life of vagrancy they were mostly shrewd and acute youths some had been very well educated ignorance to use the gentleman's own words is certainly not the prevailing characteristic of the class indeed with a few exceptions he would say it is the reverse these lads are mostly distinguished by their aversion to continuous labour of any kind he never knew them to work they are indeed essentially the idle and the vagabond their great inclination is to be on the move and wandering from place to place and they appear he says to receive a great deal of pleasure from the assembly and conversation of the casual ward. They are physically stout, healthy lads, and certainly not emaciated or sickly. They belong especially to the able-bodied class, being, as he says, full of health and mischief. When in London, they live in the daytime by holding horses and carrying parcels from the steam piers and railway termini. Some loiter about the markets in the hope of a job, and others may be seen in the streets picking up bones and rags, or along the waterside searching for pieces of old metal or anything that may be sold at the marine store shops. They have nearly all been in prison more than once, and several a greater number of times than they are years old. They are the most dishonest of all thieves, having not the least respect for the property of even the members of their own class. He tells me he has frequently known them to rob one another. They are very stubborn and self-willed. They have often broken every window in the oakum room rather than do the required work. They are a most difficult class to govern and are especially restive under the least restraint. They can ill brook control and they find great delight in thwarting the authorities of the workhouse. They are particularly fond of amusements of all kinds. My informant has often heard them discuss the merits of the different actors at the minor theatres and saloons. Sometimes they will elect a chairman and get up a regular debate and make speeches from one end of the ward to the other. Many of them will make very clever comic orations. Others delight in singing comic songs, especially those upon the workhouse and jails. He never knew them love reading. They mostly pass under fictitious names. Some will give the name of John Russell, or Robert Peel, or Richard Cobden. They often come down to the casual wards in large bodies of twenty or thirty, with sticks hidden down the legs of their trousers, and with these they rob and beat those who do not belong to their own gang. The gang will often consist of a hundred lads, all under twenty, one-fourth of whom regularly come together in a body, and in the casual ward they generally arrange where to meet again on the following night. In the winter of 1846, the guardians of Wandsworth and Clapham, sympathising with their ragged and wretched appearance, and desirous of affording them the means of obtaining an honest livelihood, gave my informant instructions to offer an asylum to any who might choose to remain in the workhouse. Under this arrangement, about fifty were admitted. The majority were under seventeen years of age. Some of them remained a few days, others a few weeks. None stopped longer than three months, and the generality of them decamped over the wall, taking with them the clothes of the Union. The confinement, restraint, and orders of the workhouse were especially irksome to them. This is the character of the true vagrant, for whom my informant considers no provision whatsoever should be made at the unions, believing, as he does, that most of them have settlements in and around London. The casual wards, he tells me, he knows to have been a great encouragement to the increase of these characters. Several of the lads that have come under his care had sought shelter and concealment in the casual wards after having absconded from their parents. In one instance, the father and mother of a lad had unavailingly sought their son in every direction. 
he discovered that the youth had run away, and he sent him home in the custody of one of the inmates. But when the boy got to within two or three doors of his father's residence, he turned round and scampered off. The mother afterwards came to the union in a state of frantic grief, and said that he had disappeared two years before. My informant believes that the boy has never been heard of by his parents since. Others he has restored to their parents, and some of the young vagrants who have died in the Union have on their deathbeds disclosed the names and particulars of their families, who have been always of a highly respectable character. To these he has sent, and on their visits to their children, scenes of indescribable grief and anguish have taken place. He tells me he is convinced that it is the low lodging houses and the casual wards of the unions that offer a ready means for youths absconding from their homes immediately on the least disagreement or restraint. In most of the cases that he has investigated, he has found that the boys have left home after some rebuke or quarrel with their parents. On restoring one boy to his father, the latter said that, though the lad was not ten years old, he had been in almost every workhouse in London, and the father bitterly complained of the casual wards for offering shelter to a youth of such tender years. But my informant is convinced that, even if the casual wards throughout the country were entirely closed, the low lodging houses being allowed to remain in their present condition, the evil would not be remedied, if at all abated. A boy, after running away from home, generally seeks shelter in one of the cheap lodging houses, and there he makes acquaintance with the most depraved of both sexes. The boys at the house become his regular companions, and he is soon a confirmed vagrant and thief, like the rest. The youths of the vagrant class are particularly distinguished for their libidinous propensities. They frequently come to the gate with a young prostitute, and with her they go off in the morning. With this girl they will tramp through the whole of the country. They are not remarkable for a love of drink. Indeed, my informant never saw a regular vagrant in a state of intoxication, nor has he known them to exhibit any craving for liquor. He has had many drunkards under his charge, but the vagrant is totally distinct, having propensities not less vicious, but of a very different kind. He considers the young tramps to be generally a class of lads possessing the keenest intellect and of a highly enterprising character. They seem to have no sense of danger and to be especially delighted with such acts as involve any peril. They are likewise characterised by their exceeding love of mischief. The property destroyed in the union of which my informant is the master has been of considerable value consisting of windows broken, sash frames demolished, beds and bedding torn to pieces, and rags burnt. They will frequently come down in large gangs, on purpose to destroy the property in the Union. They generally are of a most restless and volatile disposition. They have great quickness of perception, but little power of continuous attention or perseverance. They have a keen sense of the ridiculous and are not devoid of deep feeling. He has often known them to be dissolved to tears on his remonstrating with them on the course they were following, and then they promise amendment. But in a few days, and sometimes hours, they would forget all and return to their old habits. In the summer, they make regular tours through the country, visiting all places that they have not seen, so that there is scarcely one that is not acquainted with every part within one hundred miles of London, and many with all England. They are perfectly organised, so that any regulation affecting their comforts or interests becomes known among the whole body in a remarkably short space of time. As an instance, he informs me that, on putting out a notice that no able-bodied man or youth would be received in the casual ward after a certain day, there was not a single application made by any such party, the regular vagrants having doubtless informed each other that it was useless seeking admission at this union. In the winter, the young vagrants come to London 
and find shelter in the asylums for the houseless poor. At this season of the year, the number of vagrants in the casual wards would generally be diminished one half. The juvenile vagrants constitute one of the main sources from which the criminals of the country are continually recruited and augmented. Being repeatedly committed to prison for disorderly conduct and misdemeanour, the jail soon loses all terrors for them, and indeed they will frequently destroy their own clothes or the property of the union in order to be sent there. Hence they soon become practised and dexterous thieves, and my informant has detected several burglaries by the property found upon them. The number of this class is stated in the Poor Law Report on Vagrancy to have been in 1848 no less than 16,086, and they form one of the most restless, discontented, vicious and dangerous elements of society. At the period of any social commotion, they are sure to be drawn towards the scene of excitement in a vast concourse. During the Chartist agitation, in the June quarter of the year 1848, the number of male casuals admitted into the Wandsworth and Clapham Union rose from 2,501 to 3,968, while the females, their companions, increased from 579 to 1,388. Of the other classes of persons admitted into the casual wards, the Irish generally form a large proportion. At the time when juvenile vagrancy prevailed to an alarming extent, the Irish hardly dared to show themselves in the casual wards, for the lads would beat them and plunder them of whatever they might have, either the produce of their begging or the ragged kit they carried with them. Often my informant has had to quell violent disturbances in the night among these characters. The Irish tramp generally makes his appearance with a large family, and frequently with three or four generations together, grandfather, grandmother, father and mother, and children, all coming at the same time. In the year ending June 1848, the Irish vagrants increased to so great an extent that, of the entire number of casuals relieved, more than one-third in the first three quarters, and more than two-thirds in the last quarter, were from the sister island. Of the Irish vagrants, the worst class, that is, the poorest and most abject, came over to this country by way of Newport in Wales. The expense of the passage to that port was only two shillings and sixpence, whereas the cost of the voyage to Liverpool and London was considerably more, and consequently the class brought over by that way were less destitute. The Irish vagrants were far more orderly than the English. Out of the vast number received into the casual ward of this union during the distress in Ireland, it is remarkable that not one ever committed an act of insubordination. They were generally very grateful for the relief afforded, and appeared to subsist entirely by begging. Some of them were not particularly fond of work, but they were invariably honest, says my informant, at least so far as his knowledge went. They were exceedingly filthy in their habits, and many diseased. These constitute the two large and principal classes of vagrants. The remainder generally consist of persons temporarily destitute, whereas the others are habitually so. The temporarily destitute are chiefly railway and agricultural labourers, and a few mechanics travelling in search of employment. These are easily distinguishable from the regular vagrant. Indeed, a glance is sufficient to the practised eye. They are the better class of casuals, and those for whom the wards are expressly designed. But they only form a very small proportion of the vagrants applying for shelter. In the height of vagrancy, they formed not one per cent of the entire number admitted. Indeed, such was the state of the casual wards that the destitute mechanics and labourers preferred walking through the night to availing themselves of the accommodation. Lately, the artisans and labourers have increased greatly in proportion, owing to the system adopted for the exclusion of the habitual vagrant, and the consequent decline of their number. 
the working man travelling in search of employment is now generally admitted into what are called the receiving wards of the workhouse instead of the tramp room and he is usually exceedingly grateful for the accommodation my informant tells me that persons of this class seldom return to the workhouse after one night's shelter and this is a conclusive proof that the regular working man seldom passes into an habitual beggar they are an entirely distinct class having different habits and indeed different features and i am assured that they are strictly honest during the whole experience of my informant he never knew one who applied for a night's shelter commit one act of dishonesty and he has seen them in the last stage of destitution occasionally they have sold the shirt and waistcoat off their backs before they applied for admittance into the workhouse while some of them have been so weak from long starvation that they could scarcely reach the gate such persons are always allowed to remain several days to recruit their strength it is for such as these that my informant considers the casual wards indispensable to every well-conducted union whereas it is his opinion that the habitual vagrant, as contradistinguished from the casual vagrant or wayfaring poor, should be placed under the management of the police at the charge of the union. Let me, however, first run over, as briefly as possible, the several classes of vagrants falling under the notice of the parish authorities. The different kinds of vagrants or tramps to be found in the casual wards of the unions throughout the country may be described as follows Quote, the more important class from its increasing numbers says mr boaz in the poor law report upon vagrancy is that of the regular young english vagabond generally the native of a large town he is either a runaway apprentice or he has been driven from home by the cruelty of his parents or allowed by them to go wild in the streets in some cases he is an orphan and has lost his father and mother in early life having no ties to bind him he travels about the country being sure of a meal and a roof to shelter him at night the youths of this class are principally of from fifteen to twenty-five years of age they often travel in parties of two or three frequently in large bodies with young women as abandoned as themselves in company End quote. approaching these in character are the young countrymen who have absconded perhaps for some petty poaching offence and to whom the facility for leading an idle vagabond life has proved too great a temptation the next class of vagrants is the sturdy english mendicant he though not a constant occupant of the tramp ward in the workhouse frequently makes his appearance there to partake of the shelter when he has spent his last shilling in dissipation besides these there are a few calling themselves agricultural labourers who are really such and who are to be readily distinguished there are also a few mechanics chiefly tailors shoemakers and masons who are occasionally destitute the amount of those really destitute however is very small in proportion to the numbers relieved of the age and sex of tramps the general proportion seems to be four-fifths male and one-fifth female of the female english tramps little can be said but that they are in great part prostitutes of the lowest class the proportion of really destitute women in the tramp wards generally widows with young children is greater than that of men probably from the ability to brave the cold night wind being less in the female and the love of the children getting the shelter above dread of vile association girls of thirteen or fourteen years old who run away from masters or factory employment often find shelter in the tramp ward the irish who till very recently formed the majority of the applicants for casual relief remain to be described these can scarcely be classified in any other way than as those who come to england to labour and those who come to beg the former class however yield readily to their disposition to idleness 
the difficulties of providing supper, breakfast and lodging for themselves being removed by the workhouse. This class are physically superior to the mass of Irish vagrants. It appears that, for very many years, considerable numbers of these have annually come to England in the spring to work at hay harvest, remaining for corn harvest and hop picking, and then have carried home their earnings in the autumn, seldom resorting to begging. Since the failure of the potato crop, greater numbers have come to England, and the tramp ward has been their principal refuge, and an inducement to many to remain in the country. A great many harvest men land at Newport and the Welsh ports, but by far the greater proportion of the Irish in Wales are, or were, women with small children, old men apparently feeble, pregnant women, and boys about ten years old. They are brought over by coal vessels as a return cargo, living ballast, at very low fares, two shillings and sixpence is the highest sum, huddled together like pigs, and communicating disease and vermin on their passage. Harriet Huxtable, the manager of the tramp house at Newport, says, quote, There is hardly an Irish family that came over and applied to me, but we have found a member or two of it ill, some in a shocking, filthy state. They don't live long, diseased as they are, they are very remarkable. They will eat salt by basins full and drink a great quantity of water after. I have frequently known those who could not have been hungry eat cabbage leaves and other refuse from the ash heap. I really believe they would eat almost anything. End quote. Quote, A remarkable fact is that all the Irish whom I met on my route between Wales and London, says Mr. Boas, said they came from Cork County. Mr. John, the relieving officer at Cardiff, on his examination, says that not one out of every 100 of the Irish come from any other county than Cork. End quote. In the township of Warrington, the number of tramps relieved between the 25th of March 1847 and the 25th of March 1848 was Irish 12,038. English, 4,701. Scotch, 427. Natives of other places, 156. Making a total of 17,322. Of the original occupations or trades of the vagrants applying for relief at the different unions throughout the country, there are no returns. As, however, a considerable portion of these were attracted to London on the opening of the Metropolitan Asylums for the Houseless Poor, we may, by consulting the Society's yearly reports, where an account of the callings of those receiving shelter in such establishments is always given, be enabled to arrive at some rough estimate as to the state of destitution and vagrancy existing among the several classes of labourers and artisans for several years. The following table, being an average drawn from the returns for 17 years of the occupation of the persons admitted into the asylums for the houseless poor, which I have been at considerable trouble in forming, exhibits the only available information upon this subject, synoptically arranged. Reader's Note The following table gives the proportion of persons in each of the listed occupations admitted into these asylums. After the first entry, the words one in every are omitted, but are to be understood. End reader's note. Factory employment, one in every three. Hawkers, four. Labourers, agricultural, twelve. Seamen, twelve. Charwomen and washerwomen, thirteen. Labourers general, seventeen. Wadding makers, thirty-five. Smiths and iron founders, 36. Weavers, 38. Brickmakers, 39. Rope makers, 41. Braziers, 55. Paper makers and stainers, 58. Skin dressers, 58. Basket makers, 62. Bricklayers, plasterers and slaters, 62. Gardeners, 67. File cutters, 70. Sawyers, 73. Turners, 74. 
wire workers 75, cutlers 77, harness makers and saddlers 80, stone masons 88, dyers 94, chimney sweeps 97, errand boys 99, porters 99, painters, plumbers and glaziers 119, cabinet makers and upholsterers 128, shoemakers 130, compositors and printers 142, brush makers 145, carpenters, joiners and wheelwrights 150, bakers 167, brass founders 177, tailors 177, comb makers 178, coopers 178, surveyors 198, fellmongers 203, glass cutters 229, bedstead makers 235, average for all London 219, butchers 248, bookbinders 255, mendicants 256, engineers 265, miners 267, lace makers 273, poulterers 273, furriers 274, straw bonnet makers 277, trimming and button makers 277, ostlers and grooms 286, drovers 297, hairdressers 329, pipe makers 340, clerks and shopmen 346, hatters 350, tin men 354, tallow chandlers 364, servants 377, cork cutters 380, jewellers and watchmakers 411, Umbrella makers 415, sail makers 455, carvers and gilders 500, gunsmiths 554, trunk makers 569, chair makers 586, fishmongers 643, tanners 643, musicians 730. Leather dressers and couriers, 802. Coachmakers, 989. Engravers, 1,133. Shipwrights, 1,358. Artists, 1,374. Drapers, 2,047. Milliners and dressmakers, 10,390. Of the disease and fever which mark the course of the vagrants wheresoever they go, I have before spoken. The tramp fever, as the most dangerous infection of the casual wards, is significantly termed, is of a typhoid character, and seems to be communicated particularly to those who wash the clothes of the parties suffering from it. This was likewise one of the characteristics of cholera, that the habitual vagrants should be the means of spreading a pestilence over the country in their wanderings will not be wondered at when we find it stated in the poor law report on vagrancy that quote, in very few workhouses do means exist of drying the clothes of these paupers when they come in wet and it often happens that a considerable number are of necessity placed together wet filthy infested with vermin and diseased in a small unventilated space. End quote. Quote, the majority of tramps again, we are told, have a great aversion to being washed and cleaned. A regular tramper cannot bear it, but a distressed man would be thankful for it. End quote. The cost incurred for the cure of the vagrant sick in 1848 was considerably more than the expense of the food dispensed to them. Out of 13,406 vagrants relieved at the Wandsworth and Clapham Union in 1848, there were 332 diseased, or ill with the fever. The number of vagrants relieved throughout England and Wales in the same year was 
nine hundred and seventy five and supposing that the sickness among these prevailed to the same extent as it did among the casuals at wandsworth according to the vagrancy report it appears to have been much more severe in many places there would have been as many as forty thousand eight hundred and twelve sick in the several unions throughout the country in eighteen forty eight the cost of relieving the three hundred and thirty two sick at wandsworth was three hundred pounds at the same rate the expense of the forty thousand eight hundred and twelve sick throughout the country unions would amount to thirty six thousand eight hundred and seventy eight pounds according to the above proportion the number of sick relieved in the metropolitan unions would have been seven thousand six hundred and seventy eight and the cost for their relief would amount to six thousand nine hundred and thirty one pounds of the tide of crime which like that of pestilence accompanies the stream of vagrants there are equally strong and conclusive proofs Quote, the most prominent body of delinquents in the rural districts says the report of the constabulary commissioners are vagrants and these vagrants appear to consist of two classes first the habitual depredators housebreakers horse stealers and common thieves secondly of vagrants properly so called who seek alms as mendicants besides those classes who travel from fair to fair and from town to town in quest of dishonest gains there are numerous classes who make incursions from the provincial towns upon the adjacent rural districts end quote. Quote, the classes of depredators who perambulate the country says the same report are the vagrants properly so called upwards of eighteen thousand commitments per annum of persons for the offence of vagrancy mark the extent of the body from which they are taken it will be seen that vagrancy or the habit of wandering abroad under colour either of distress or of some ostensible though illegal occupation having claims on the sympathies of the uninformed constitutes one great source of delinquency and especially of juvenile delinquency the returns show that the vagrant classes pervade every part of the country rendering property insecure propagating pernicious habits and afflicting the minds of the sensitive with false pictures of suffering and levying upon them an offensive impost for the relief of that destitution for which a heavy tax is legally levied in the shape of poor's rates mr thomas harrell a sergeant of the bristol police was asked what proportion of the vagrants do you think are thieves that make it a point to take anything for which they find a convenient opportunity we have found it so invariably have you ever seen the children who go about as vagrants turn afterwards from vagrancy to common thieving thieving wholly or chiefly we have found it several times therefore the suppression of vagrancy or mendicity would be to that extent the suppression of juvenile delinquency yes of course mr j perry another witness states quote, i believe vagrancy to be the first step towards the committal of felony and i am supported in that belief by the number of juvenile vagrants who are brought before the magistrates as thieves end quote. an officer appointed specially to take measures against vagrancy in manchester was asked does your experience enable you to state that the larger proportion of vagrants are thieves too whenever they come in the way of thieving yes and i should call the larger proportion their thieves then from what you have observed of them would you say that the suppression of vagrancy would go a great way to the suppression of a great quantity of depredation i am sure of it the same valuable report furnishes us with a table of the numbers and character of the known depredators and suspected persons frequenting five of the principal towns from which it appears that in these towns alone there are twenty eight thousand seven hundred and six persons of known bad character according to the average proportion of these to the population there will be in the other large towns 
nearly 32,000 persons of a similar character, and upwards of 69,000 of such persons dispersed throughout the rest of the country. Adding these together, we shall have as many as 130,000 persons of known bad character living in England and Wales, without the walls of the prisons. To form an accurate notion of the total number of the criminal population, we must add to the above amount the number of persons resident within the walls of the prisons. These, according to the last census, are 19,888, which, added to the 130,000 above enumerated, gives within a fraction of 150,000 individuals for the entire criminal population of the country. In order to arrive at an estimate of the number of known depredators or suspected persons continually tramping through the country, we must deduct from the number of persons of bad character without the walls of the prisons such as are not of migratory habits, and it will be seen on reference to the table above given that a large proportion of the classes there specified have usually some fixed residence. Those with an asterisk set before them may be said to be non-migratory. Reader's note. No asterisks appear in the above table. End. Reader's note. As many as 10,000 individuals out of the 20,000 and odd above given certainly do not belong to the tramping tribe, and we may safely say that there must be as many as 35,000 more in the country who, though of known bad character, are not tramps like the rest. Hence, in order to ascertain the number of depredators and suspected persons belonging to the tramping or vagrant class, we must deduct 10,000 plus 35,000 from 85,000, which gives us 40,000 for the number of known bad characters continually traversing the country. This sum, though arrived at in a very different manner from the estimate given in my last letter, agrees very nearly with the amount there stated. We may therefore, I think, without fear of erring greatly upon the matter, assert that our criminal population within and without the walls of the prisons consists of 150,000 individuals, of whom nearly one-third belong to the vagrant class, while of those without the prison walls, upwards of one-half are persons who are continually tramping throughout the country. The number of commitments for vagrancy throughout the country is stated in the constabulary report at upwards of 18,000 per annum. This amount, large as it is, will not surprise when we learn from Mr. Piggott's report on vagrancy to the poor law commissioners that, quote, it is becoming a system with the vagrants to pass away the cold months by fortnightly halts in different jails. As soon as their 14 days have expired, they make their way to some other union house and commit the same depredation there, in order to be sent to jail again. End quote. Quote, there are some characters, say the officers of the Derby Union in the same report, who come on purpose to be committed, avowedly. These have generally itch, venereal disease, and lice altogether. Then there are some who tear their clothes for the purpose of being committed. End quote. I shall now give as full an account as lies in my power of the character and consequences of vagrancy, that it spreads a moral pestilence through the country as terrible and as devastating as the physical pest which accompanies it wherever it is found, all the evidence goes to prove. Nevertheless, the facts which I have still to adduce in connection with that class of vagrancy which does not necessarily come under the notice of the parish authorities are of so overpowering a character that I hope and trust they may be the means of rousing every earnest man in the kingdom to a sense of the enormous evils that are daily going on around him. The number of vagrants taken into custody by the police, according to the Metropolitan Criminal Returns for 1848, was 5,598. They belonged to the trades cited in the subjoined table where I have calculated the proportionate number of vagrants furnished by each of the occupations, 
according to the total number of individuals belonging to the class. Toolmakers, one in every 33.9. Labourers, 45.9. Weavers, 75.6. Cutlers, 82.1. French polishers, 109.7. Glovers, and so on, 112.8. Cork cutters 114.2, brass founders 119.1, smiths 129.1, bricklayers 143.4, paper makers, stainers and so on 188.1, fishmongers 207.3, carriers 211.6, masons 231.4, tinkers and tin men 236.3 Sawyers 248.1 Carvers and Gilders 250.3 Hatters and Trimmers 250.4 Musicians 292.0 Turners and so on 308.8 .8. Shoemakers 310.5 Surveyors 326.5 Average for all London, 334.7. Gardeners, 341.8. Tobacconists, 344.6. Painters, 359.5. Bakers, 364.4. Tailors, 373.2. Milliners, 451.7. Clerks, 453.7. Printers 461.6, sweeps 516.5, opticians 536.0, saddlers 542.7, coach and cabmen 542.8, glassmakers and so on 580.5, butchers 608.0, laundresses 623.8. Coachmakers 709.3, grocers 712.2, general and marine store dealers 721.2, jewellers 922.7, artificial flower makers 1025.0, brush makers 1077.5, ironmongers 1177.0, Watchmakers 1430.0, Engineers 1433.3, Dyers 1930.0, Servants 2444.9, Drapers 2456.5, Bookbinders 2749.5. The causes and encouragements of vagrancy are twofold, direct and indirect. The roving disposition to which, as I have shown, vagrancy is directly ascribable, proceeds, as I have said, partly from a certain physical conformation or temperament, but mainly from a non-inculcation of industrial habits and moral purposes in youth. The causes from which the vagabondism of the young indirectly proceeds are 1. The neglect or tyranny of parents or masters. This appears to be a most prolific source. 2. Bad companions. 3. Bad books, which act like the bad companions in depraving the taste and teaching the youth to consider that approvable which to all rightly constituted minds is morally loathsome. 4. Bad amusements as penny theatres, where the scenes and characters described in the bad books are represented in a still more attractive form. Mr. Ainsworth's Rookwood, with Dick Turpin in his habit as he lived in, is now in the course of being performed nightly at one of the East End saloons. 5. Bad institutions, as for instance, the different refuges scattered throughout the country, and which, enabling persons to live without labour, are the means of attracting large numbers of the most idle and dissolute classes to the several cities where the charities are dispensed. Captain Carroll, C.B., R.N., 
chief of police, speaking of the refugees for the destitute in Bath, and of a kindred institution which distributes bread and soup, says, quote, I consider those institutions an attraction to this city for vagrants, end quote. At Liverpool, Mr. Henry Simpson said of a night asylum supported by voluntary contributions and established for several years in this town, quote, This charity was used by quite a different class of persons from those for whom it was designed. A vast number of abandoned characters, known thieves and prostitutes, found nightly shelter there, end quote. The chief inducement to vagrancy in the town says another report, speaking of a certain part of the North Riding of York, is the relief given by mistaken but benevolent individuals, more particularly by the poorer class. Instances have occurred where the names of such benevolent persons have been found in the possession of vagrants, obtained, no doubt, from their fellow travellers. 6. Vagrancy is largely due to, and indeed chiefly maintained by, the low lodging houses. End of section 79 Section 80 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry London Vagrants, Part 3 Statements of Vagrants the first vagrant was one who had the thorough look of a professional. He was literally a mass of rags and filth. He was indeed exactly what, in the act of Henry the Eighth, is denominated a valiant beggar. He stood near upon six feet high, was not more than twenty-five, and had altogether the frame and constitution of a stalwart labouring man. His clothes, which were of fustian and corduroy, tied close to his body with pieces of string, were black and shiny with filth, which looked more like pitch than grease. He had no shirt, as was plain from the fact that, where his clothes were torn, his bare skin was seen. The ragged sleeves of his fustian jacket were tied, like the other parts of his dress, close to his wrists with string. This was clearly to keep the bleak air from his body. His cap was an old brimless wide awake, and, when on his head, gave the man a most unprepossessing appearance. His story was as follows. I am a carpet weaver by trade. I served my time to it. My father was a clerk in a shoe thread manufactory at Blank. He got thirty-five shillings a week and his house, coals, and candles found him. He lived very comfortably. Indeed, I was very happy. Before I left home, I knew none of the cares of the world that I have known since I left him. My father and mother are living still. He is still as well off as when I was at home. I know this because I have heard from him twice, and seen him once. He won't do anything to assist me. I have transgressed so many times that he won't take me in hand any more. I will tell you the truth. You may depend upon it. Yes, indeed, I would, even if it were to injure myself. He has tried me many times, but now he has given me up. At the age of twenty-one, he told me to go from home and seek a living for myself. He said he had given me a home ever since I was a child, but now I had come to manhood, I was able to provide for myself. He gave me a good education and I might have been a better scholar at the present time had I not neglected my studies. He put me to a day school in the town when I was eight years old, and I continued there till I was between twelve and thirteen. I learnt reading, writing, and ciphering. I was taught the catechism, the history of England, geography, and drawing. My father was a very harsh man when he was put out of his way. He was a very violent temper when he was vexed, but kind to us all when he was pleased. I had five brothers and six sisters. He never beat me more than twice to my remembrance. The first time he thrashed me with a cane, and the last with a horsewhip. I had stopped out late at night. I was then just rising sixteen, and had left school. I am sure those thrashings did me no good. 
but made me rather worse than before. I was a self-willed lad, and determined if I couldn't get my will in one way, I would have it another. After the last thrashing, he told me he would give me some trade, and after that he would set me off and get rid of me. Then I was bound apprentice as a carpet weaver for three years. My master was a very kind one. I runned away once. The cause of my going off was a quarrel with one of the workmen that was put over me. He was very harsh, and I scarce could do anything to please him, so I made up my mind to leave. The first place I went when I bolted was to Crewcairn in Somersetshire. There I asked for employment at carpet weaving. I got some and remained there three days, when my father found out where I was and sent my brother and a special constable after me. They took me from the shop where I was at work and brought me back to blank, and would have sent me to prison had I not promised to behave myself and serve my time out as I ought. I went to work again, and when the expiration of my apprenticeship occurred, my father said to me, Sam, you have a trade at your fingers' ends. You are able to provide for yourself. So then I left home. I was twenty-one years of age. He gave me money, three pounds ten shillings, to take me into Wales, where I told him I should go. I was up for going about through the country. I made my father believe I was going into Wales to get work, but all I wanted was to go and see the place. After I had run away once from my apprenticeship, I found it very hard to stop at home. I couldn't bring myself to work somehow. While I sat at the work, I thought I should like to be away in the country. Work seemed a burden to me. I found it very difficult to stick to anything for a long time. So I made up my mind, when my time was out, that I'd be off roving and see a little of life. I went by the packet from Bristol to Newport. After being there three weeks, I had spent all the money that I had brought from home. I spent it in drinking, most of it, and idling about. After that, I was obliged to sell my clothes and so on. The first thing I sold was my watch. I got two pounds five shillings for that. Then I was obliged to part with my suit of clothes. For these I got one pound five shillings. With this I started from Newport to go farther up over the hills. I liked this kind of life much better than working, while the money lasted. I was in the public house three parts of my time out of four. I was a great slave to drink. I began to like drink when I was between thirteen and fourteen. At that time my uncle was keeping a public house, and I used to go there backwards and forward, more or less, every week. Whenever I went to see my uncle, he gave me some beer. I very soon got to like it so much that... While an apprentice, I would spend all I could get in liquor. This was the cause of my quarrels with my father. And when I went away to Newport, I did so to be my own master and drink as much as I pleased without anybody saying anything to me about it. I got up to Nantiglo, and there I sought for work at the Iron Foundry. But I could not get it. I stopped at this place three weeks, still drinking. The last day of the three weeks, I sold the boots off my feet to get food, for all my money and clothes were now gone. I was sorry then that I had ever left my father's house, but, alas, I found it too late. I didn't write home to tell them how I was off. My stubborn temper would not allow me. I then started off barefoot, begging my way from Nantiglo to Monmouth. I told the people that I was a carpet weaver by trade who could not get any employment, and that I was obliged to travel the country against my own wish. I didn't say a word about the drink. That would never have done. I only took Tuppence Hapney on the road, nineteen miles long, and I'm sure I must have asked assistance from more than a hundred people. They said, some of them, that they had nout for me, and others did give me a bit of barracause or baramini, that is, bread and cheese, or bread and butter. Money is very scarce among the Welsh, and what they have they are very fond of. They don't mind giving food. If you wanted a bagful, you might have it there, of the working people. I inquired for a night's lodging at the Union in Monmouth. 
That was the first time I ever asked for shelter in a workhouse in my life. I was admitted into the tramp room. Oh, I felt then that I would much rather be in prison than in such a place, though I never knew what the inside of a prison was. No, not then. I thought of the kindness of my father and mother. I would have been better, but I knew that, as I had been carrying on, I never could expect shelter under my father's roof any more. I knew he would not have taken me in had I gone back, or I would have returned. Oh, I was off from home, and I didn't much trouble my head about it after a few minutes. I plucked up my spirits and soon forgot where I was. I made no male friends in the Union. I was savage that I had so hard a bed to lie upon. It was nothing more than the bare boards and a rug to cover me. I knew very well it wasn't my bed, but still I thought I ought to have a better. I merely felt annoyed at its being so bad a place, and didn't think much about the rights of it. In the morning I was turned out, and after I had left I picked up with a young woman who had slept in the Union overnight. I said I was going on the road across country to Birmingham, and I asked her to go with me. I had never seen her before. She consented, and we went along together, begging our way. We passed as man and wife, and I was a carpet weaver out of employment. We slept in unions and lodging houses by the way. In the lodging houses we lived together as man and wife, and in the unions we were separated. I never stole anything during all this time. After I got to Birmingham, I made my way to Wolverhampton. My reason for going to Wolverhampton was that there was a good many weavers there, and I thought I should make a good bit of money by begging of them. Oh yes, I have found that I could always get more money out of my own trade than any other people. I did so well at Wolverhampton begging that I stopped there three weeks. I never troubled my head whether I was doing right or wrong by asking my brother weavers for a portion of their hard earnings to keep me in idleness. Many a time I have given part of my wages to others myself. I can't say that I would have given it to them if I had known they wouldn't work like me. I wouldn't have worked sometimes if I could have got it. I can't tell why, but somehow it was painful to me to stick long at anything. To tell the truth, I loved a roving, idle life. I would much rather have been on the road than at my home. I drank away all I got, and feared and cared for nothing. When I got drunk overnight, it would have been impossible for me to have gone to work in the morning, even if I could have got it. The drink seemed to take all the work out of me. This oftentimes led me to think of what my father used to tell me, that the bird that can sing and won't sing ought to be made to sing. During my stay in Wolverhampton, I lived at a tramper's house, and there I fell in with two men well acquainted with the town, and they asked me to join them in breaking open a shop. No, sir, no, I didn't give a thought whether I was doing right or wrong at it. I didn't think my father would ever know anything at all about it, so I didn't care. I liked my mother best, much the best. She had always been a kind, good soul to me, often kept me from my father's blows, and helped me to things unknown to my father. But when I was away on the road, I gave no heed to her. I didn't think of either father or mother till after I was taken into custody for that same job. Well, I agreed to go with the other two. They were old hands at the business, regular housebreakers. We went away between twelve and one at night. It was pitch dark. My two pals broke into the back part of the house and I stopped outside to keep watch. After watching for about a quarter of an hour, a policeman came up to me and asked what I was stopping there for. I told him I was waiting for a man that was in a public house at the corner. This led him to suspect me, it being so late at night. He went to the public house to see whether it was open and found it shut, and then came back to me. As he was returning, he saw my two comrades coming through the back window. 
that was the way they had got in. They took us all three in custody. Some of the passers-by assisted him in seizing us. The other two had six months' imprisonment each, and I, being a stranger, had only fourteen days. When I was sent to prison, I thought of my mother. I would have written to her, but couldn't get leave. Being the first time I ever was nailed, I was very downhearted at it. I didn't say I'd give it up. While I was locked up, I thought I'd go to work again and be a sober man when I got out. These thoughts used to come over me when I was on the stepper, that is, on the wheel. But I concealed all them thoughts in my breast. I said nothing to no one. My mother was the only one that I ever thought upon. When I got out of prison, all these thoughts went away from me, and I went again at my old tricks. From Wolverhampton I went to Manchester, and from Manchester I came to London, begging and stealing whenever I had a chance. This is not my first year in London. I tell you the truth because I am known here, and if I tell you a lie, you'll say, you spoke an untruth in one thing, and you'll do so in another. The first time I was in London, I was put in prison fourteen days for begging, and after I had a month at Westminster Bridewell for begging and abusing the policeman. Sometimes I think I'd rather go anywhere and do anything than continue as I was. But then I had no clothes, no friends, no house, no home, no means of doing better. I had made myself what I was. I had made my father and mother turn their backs upon me, and what could I do but go on? I was as bad off then as I am now, and I couldn't have got work then if I would. I should have spent all I got in drink then, I know. I wrote home twice. I told my mother I was hard up, had neither a shoe to my foot, a coat to my back, nor a roof over my head. I had no answer to my first letter because it fell into the hands of my brother, and he tore it up, fearing that my mother might see it. To the second letter that I sent home, my mother sent me an answer herself. She sent me a sovereign. She told me that my father was the same as when I first left home, and it was no use my coming back. She sent me the money, bidding me get some clothes and seek for work. I didn't do as she bade. I spent the money most part in drink. I didn't give any heed whether it was wrong or right. Soon got, soon gone. And I know they could have sent me much more than that, if they had pleased. It was last June, twelve month, when I first came to London, and I stopped till the 10th of last March. I lost the young woman when I was put in prison in Manchester. She never came to see me in Quad. She cared nothing for me. She only kept company with me to have someone on the road along with her. And I didn't care for her, not I. One half of my time last winter, I stopped at the straw yards, that is, in the asylums for the houseless poor here and at Glass House. When I could get money, I had a lodging. After March, I started off through Somersetshire. I went to my father's house then. I didn't go in. I saw my father at the door, and he wouldn't let me in. I was a little better dressed than I am now. He said he had enough children at home without me, and gave me ten shillings to go. He could not have been kind to me, or else he would not have turned me from his roof. My mother came out to the garden in front of the house, after my father had gone to his work, and spoke to me. She wished me to reform my character. I could not make any rash promises then. I had but very little to say to her. I felt myself at that same time, for the very first time in my life, that I was doing wrong. I thought, if I could hurt my mother so, it must be wrong to go on as I did. I had never had such thoughts before. My father's harsh words always drove such thoughts out of my head. But when I saw my mother's tears... It was more than I could stand. I was wanting to get away as fast as I could from the house. After that, I stopped knocking about the country, sleeping in unions, up to November. Then I came to London again and remained up to this time. 
Since I have been in town, I have sought for work at the floor cloth and carpet manufactory in the borough, and they wouldn't even look at me in my present state. I am heartily tired of my life now altogether, and would like to get out of it if I could. I hope at least I have given up my love of drink, and I am sure if I could once again lay my hand on some work, I should be quite a reformed character. Well, I am altogether tired of carrying on like this. I haven't made sixpence a day ever since I have been in London this time. I go tramping it across the country just to pass the time, and see a little of new places. When the summer comes, I want to be off. I am sure I have seen enough of this country now, and I should like to have a look at some foreign land. Old England has nothing new in it now for me. I think a beggar's life is the worst kind of life that a man can lead. A beggar is no more thought upon than a dog in the street, and there are too many at the trade. I wasn't brought up to a bad life. You can see that by little things, by my handwriting. And indeed, I should like to have a chance at something else. I have had the feelings of a vagabond for full ten years. I know, and now I am sure I am getting a different man. I begin to have thoughts and ideas I never had before. Once I never feared nor cared for anything, and I wouldn't have altered if I could. But now I am tired out, and if I haven't a chance of going right, why, I must go wrong. The next was a short, thick-set man, with a frequent grin on his countenance, which was rather expressive of humour. He wore a very dirty smock frock, dirtier trousers, shirt and neckerchief, and broken shoes. He answered readily, and as if he enjoyed his story. I never was at school, and was brought up as a farm labourer at Devizes, he said, where my parents were labourers. I worked that way three or four years, and then ran away. My master wouldn't give me money enough, only three shillings and sixpence a week, and my parents were very harsh, so I ran away rather than be licked forever. I'd heard people say, go to Bath, and I went there, and I was only about eleven then. I'm now twenty-three. I tried to get work on the railway there, and I did. I next got into prison for stealing three shovels. I was hard up, having lost my work and so I stole them. I was ten weeks in prison. I came out worse than I went in, for I mixed with the old hands, and they put me up to a few capers. When I got out, I thought I could live as well that way as by hard work, so I took to the country. I began to beg. At first I took no for an answer, when I asked for charity to a poor boy, but I found that wouldn't do, so I learned to stick to them. I was forced, or I must have starved, and that wouldn't do at all. I did middling, plenty to eat and sometimes a drop to drink, but not often. I was forced to be merry, because it's no good being downhearted. I begged for two years, that is, steal and beg together. I couldn't starve. I did best in country villages in Somersetshire. There's always odds and ends to be picked up there. I got into scrapes now and then. Once in Devonshire, me and another slopped at a farmhouse, and in the morning we went egg hunting. I must have stowed three dozen of eggs about me, when a dog barked, and we were alarmed and ran away, and in getting over a gate I fell, and there I lay among the smashed eggs. I can't help laughing at it still. But I got away. I was too sharp for them. I have been twenty or thirty times in prison. I have been in for stealing bread and a side of bacon and cheese and shovels and other things, generally provisions. I generally learn something new in prison. I shall do no good while I stop in England. It's not possible a man like me can get work, so I'm forced to go on this way. Sometimes I haven't a bit to eat all day. At night I may pick up something. An uncle of mine once told me he would like to see me transported, or come to the gallows. I told him I had no fear about the gallows, I should never come to that end. But if I were transported, 
I should be better off than I am now. I can't starve, and I won't. And I can't list, I'm too short. I came to London the other day, but could do no good. The London hands are quite a different set to us. We seldom do business together. My way's simple. If I see a thing and I'm hungry, I take it, if I can, in London or anywhere. I once had a turn with two Londoners, and we got two coats and two pair of trousers, but the police got them back again. I was only locked up one night for it. The country's the best place to get away with anything, because there's not so many policemen. There's lots live as I live, because there's no work. I can do a country policeman generally. I've had sprees at the country lodging houses, larking and drinking and carrying on and playing cards and dominoes all night for a farthing a game, sometimes fighting about it. I can play at dominoes, but I don't know the cards. They try to cheat one another. Honour among thieves, why, there's no such thing. They take from one another. Sometimes we dance all night, Christmas time and such times. Young women dance with us, and sometimes old women. We're all merry. Some's lying on the floor drunk. Some's jumping about, smoking. Some's dancing. And so we enjoy ourselves. That's the best part of the life. We are seldom stopped in our merry-makings in the country. It's no good the policemen coming among us. Give them beer, and you may knock the house down. We have good meat sometimes. Sometimes very rough. Some are very particular about their cookery, as nice as anybody is. They must have their pickles and their peppers and their fish sauces, I've had them myself, to their dishes. Chops in the country has the call, or ham and eggs, that's relished. Some's very particular about their drink too, won't touch bad beer. Same way with the gin. It's chiefly gin, I'm talking about the country, very little rum. No brandy. But sometimes, after a good day's work, a drop of wine. We help one another when we are sick, when we are knowed. Some's very good that way. Some lodging house keepers get rid of anybody that's sick by taking them to the relieving officer at once. A really fine-looking lad of eighteen gave me the following statement. He wore a sort of frock coat, very thin, buttoned about him, old cloth trousers and bad shoes. His shirt was tolerably good and clean, and altogether he had a tidy look and an air of quickness, but not of cunning. My father, he said, was a bricklayer in Shoreditch Parish, and my mother took in washing. They did pretty well, but they're dead and buried two years and a half ago. I used to work in brickfields at Balls Pond, living with my parents, and taking home every farthing I earned. I earned 18 shillings a week, working from five in the morning until sunset. They had only me. I can read and write middling. When my parents died, I had to look out for myself. I was off work, attending to my father and mother when they were sick. They died within about three weeks of each other, and I lost my work, and I had to part with my clothes. Before that, I tried to work in brickfields, and couldn't get it, and work grew slack. When my parents died, I was thirteen, and I sometimes got to sleep in the unions, but that was stopped, and then I took to the lodging houses, and there I met with lads who were enjoying themselves at push Hitney and cards, and they were thieves, and they tempted me to join them, and I did for once but only once. I then went begging about the streets and thieving, as I knew the others do. I used to pick pockets. I worked for myself, because I thought that would be best. I had no fence at all, no pals at first, nor anything. I worked by myself for a time. I sold the handkerchiefs I got to Jews in the streets, chiefly in Field Lane, for one shilling and sixpence but I have got as much as three shillings and sixpence for your real fancy ones. One of these buyers wanted to cheat me out of sixpence, so I would have no more dealings with him. The others paid me. The Kingsmen they call the best handkerchiefs, 
those that have the pretty-looking flowers on them. Some are only worth fourpence or fivepence. Some's not worth taking. Those I gave away to strangers, boys like myself, or wore them myself round my neck. I only threw one away, but it was all rags, though he looked quite like a gentleman that had it. Lord Mayor's Day in such times is the best for us. Last Lord Mayor's Day I got four handkerchiefs, and I made eleven shillings. There was a sixpence tied up in the corner of one handkerchief. Another was pinned to the pocket, but I got it out, and after that another chap had him, and cut his pocket clean away, but there was nothing in it. I generally picked my men, regular swells or good-humoured-looking men. I've often followed them a mile. I once got a purse with three shillings and sixpence in it from a lady, when the coal exchange was opened. I made eight shillings and sixpence that day, the purse and handkerchiefs. That's the only lady I ever robbed. I was in the crowd when Manning and his wife were hanged. I wanted to see if they died game, as I heard them talk so much about them at our house. I was there all night. I did four good handkerchiefs and a rotten one not worth picking up. I saw them hung. I was right under the drop. I was a bit startled when they brought him up and put the rope round his neck and the cap on, and then they brought her out. All said he was hung innocently. It was she that should have been hung by herself. They both dropped together, and I felt faintified, but I soon felt all right again. The police drove us away as soon as it was over, so that I couldn't do any more business. Besides, I was knocked down in the crowd and jumped upon, and I won't go to see another hung in a hurry. He didn't deserve it, but she did, every inch of her. I can't say I thought, while I was seeing the execution, that the life I was leading would ever bring me to the gallows. After I'd worked by myself a bit, I got to live in a house where lads like me, big and little, were accommodated. We paid threepence a night. It was always full. There was twenty or twenty-one of us. We enjoyed ourselves middling. I was happy enough. We drank sometimes, chiefly beer, and sometimes a drop of gin. One would say, I've done so much, and another, I've done so much, and stand a drop. The best I ever heard done was two pounds for two coats from a tailor's near Bow Church, Cheapside. That was by one of my pals. We used to share our money with those who did nothing for a day, and they shared with us when we rested. There never was any blabbing. We wouldn't do one another out of a farthing. Off a night, someone would now and then read hymns out of books they sold about the streets. I'm sure they were hymns. Or else we'd read stories about Jack Shepherd and Dick Turpin, and all through that set. They were large, thick books, borrowed from the library. They told how they used to break open the houses and get out of Newgate, and how Dick got away to York. We used to think Jack and them very fine fellows. I wished I could be like Jack, I did then, about the blankets and his escape and that old house in West Street. It is a ruin still. We played cards and dominoes sometimes at our house and at pushing a halfpenny over the table along five lines. We struck the halfpenny from the edge of the table and according to what line it settled on was the game, like as they play at the glass house. That's the model lodging house, they calls it. Cribbage was always played at cards. I can only play cribbage. We have played for a shilling a game, but oftener a penny. It was always a fair play. That was the way we passed the time when we were not out. We used to keep quiet, or the police would have been down upon us. They knew of the place. They took one boy there. I wondered what they wanted. They catched him at the very door. We lived pretty well, anything we liked to get when we'd money. We cooked it ourselves. The master of the house was always on the lookout to keep out those who had no business there. No girls were admitted. The master of the house had nothing to do with what we got. I don't know of any other such house in London. I don't think there are any. The master would sometimes drink with us, a larking like. He used us pretty kindly at times. I've been three times in prison, 
three months each time, the Compter, Brixton and Maidstone. I went down to Maidstone Fair and was caught by a London policeman down there. He was dressed as a bricklayer. Prison always made me worse, and as I had nothing given me when I came out, I had to look out again. I generally got hold of something before I had been an hour out of prison. I'm now heartily sick of this life. I wish I'd been transported with some others from Maidstone, where I was tried. End of section 80